Committee on State Affairs will now come to order. Clerk, call the roll. Hunter. Here. Hernandez. Here. Thompson. Smithy. Here. Raymond. Garen. Here. Guillen. Anchia. Here. Turner. Metcalf. Here. Dean. Slauson. Here. Spiller. Here. All right, a quorum is present. And for everybody, there is an overflow room, and it's available in the Reagan, which is called JHR 120. So the overflow is 120. And uh, let me just let everybody know that due to the number of witnesses registered to testify today, I'm going to limit the testimony to three minutes. And I want you to know that could change by hearing. So when you get three for today, that doesn't mean I'm going to do three again. So I'll announce it per committee hearing. And for everybody, we have a timer. And I'm going to be asking everybody to please follow the timer. And I'll assist you with that as we go. And as a reminder, to all that plan to testify, please ensure that you are registered through the electronic witness affirmation system that is located on the tablets in the hallway. Please note that Representative Anchi is here. If you're having trouble registering, please see our assistant clerk, Isabella Huerta, and she will assist you right here. Bella, raise your hand. And also remember that when you testify in front of our committees, you are testifying under oath and are required to testify fully and truthfully. Now, today's hearing is also being live streamed on the House website, and that's www.house.texas.gov slash video hyphen audio. And members of the public wishing to submit comments on today's hearing may do so through the public portal until the hearing is adjourned. And pursuant to House Rule 4, Section 20B, and the standard electronic public comment process established by the Committee on House Administration, all public comments submitted through the portal portal will be posted on TLIS, TLO, and the House website after the comment period is closed. Directions of how to submit public comments on the portal can be found on today's hearing notice. So we've got Kansas number. What's the number? All right, Chairman King, the chair lays out HB 821 and recognizes Chairman King to explain his bill. Go. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, how, uh, for the opportunity to lay out House Bill 821. House Bill 821 would allow state agencies to partner with private businesses to place charging stations for charging electric cars on state property, such as state parks. Um, the reason I got behind the bill last session, my former Committee of Cultural Recreation and Tourism, uh, we have a lot of beautiful state parks out in West Texas, but we don't have any charging stations. I like to tell my Austin friends, if you come to see me in your EV, it'll take you about seven hours. I want to see how long it takes you to go home because there's no place to charge it. But I think, I think allowing charging stations within state parks would be a tourism driver. And with that, Mr. Chairman, unless there's any question, I would respectfully reserve my right to close. Excellent presentation. Howdy, <laughs> one mm -hmm. Here's our first. First of all, uh, members, are there any questions for Chairman King? All right, thank you. 
and we'll call you back up. And please note for the record that Representative Dean is here. All right, we have one uh, witness, Mr. Cyrus Reed. Cyrus, please come to the microphone and uh, state your name, who you represent, your position on the bill, and watch the lights. I don't need three minutes. Cyrus Reed, Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club, very much support this bill. Customers need choices. This provides a choice in a way for people who are visiting um, state parks and other uh, state-owned uh, facilities, a way to make sure they can actually charge their vehicle. If you're going to Caprock Canyon or someone far away, uh, you need some charging. If you got an electric vehicle, this is a great bill. And with that, I close. Just so we're clear on the record, you're Cyrus Reed, Conservation Director, Lone Star Chapter, Sierra Club, for the bill. For the bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much, Cyrus. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on, for, or against the bill? Seeing none, hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman King to close. I close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions, members of the chairman? Thank you, Chairman King. Uh, the chair moves to leave HB 821 pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 821 is left pending. Thank you. This time, the chair lays out HB 1817 and recognizes Chairman Cabriglione to explain his bill. And he's got a substitute. No, no, Okay. And um, go right ahead, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. So last year, a development company sued the city of Hutto for a breach of contract. And the judge found that a required form, Form 1295, required to be kept on file at the Texas Ethics Commission was not submitted and on file, therefore not complying with the contracting transparency laws, and the judge found the contract void. With this ruling, the potential now exists that any government contract without a Form 1295 on file could be voided. HB 1817 updates statute to allow for a cure period if the Form 1295 is found not to be on file. The governmental entity is required to send written notice to the business of their failure to provide the form. Then the business ha entity has 10 business days to submit the form. Members, I think it is important that we do not allow hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of government contracts to hang in the limbo of potentially being void. So the passage of House Bill 1817 is very important. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Are there any questions for Chairman Capriglione? Thank you. Um, if there's no questions, we'll proceed with the testimony. Do we have any witness affirmation? All right. Is there anyone who wishes to speak on, for, or against this bill? Thank you. If not, the chair recognizes Chairman Briglione to close on his bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Thank you for considering House Bill 1817, and I close. Any other questions for the chairman? Thank you, uh, Chairman Capriglione. The chair moves to leave HB 1817 pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 1817 is left pending. Next, the chair lays out HB 584 and recognizes Chairman Capriglione to explain the bill, and the chair offers a committee substitute to HB 584. Do we have that here? It's distributed. Okay, it's been distributed. Members, are there uh, 
any questions regarding the substitute as we're getting ready to present it? All right. It's been offered. Uh, if you would explain your bill as substituted. Chairman Hunter, members, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Mr. Yeah, and thank you for laying out the committee substitute. Over the years, this committee in particular has worked tirelessly to ensure that Texans invest in cybersecurity and information technology systems to keep Texans data safe and our government operations free from cyber attacks. While these programs have been successful, the state's aging IT workforce has struggled to keep up. Simply put, the state cannot afford to compete for four-year graduates. Today, a four-year graduate in an IT-related field can expect to make today, on average, $108,000 upon graduation. To keep up, agencies have had to rely on either interagency transfers or moving more employees <clears throat> into supervisory roles. For example, 27% of the Department of Information Resources employees will be eligible for retirement between fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2024, and nearly a third are classified as supervisors. Many agencies have expressed interest in filling these positions with two-year graduates, but have been unable to do so as a state classification guideline requires a four-year degree for almost all IT-related positions. HB 584 would change that, and this bill allows the Department of Information Resources to enter into agreements with any community college or technical college to develop a state information technology credential that is tailored to address the shortages in the state information resources workforce. The credential would be offered in conjunction with the student's pursuit of an associate's degree in a relevant field and include a one-year apprenticeship uh, working on state IT projects. Once a student has completed this credentialing program, the bill directs the state auditor's office to consider the credential as a substitute for a four-year degree. Community colleges are already leveraging millions of dollars in state and federal grants to create similar workforce programs with private sector companies, meaning these programs could easily be paid for with existing funds or from grants and tuition. House Bill 584 would ensure that as the state continues to invest in IT modernization and cybersecurity, we're also investing in a resilient state IT workforce. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy uh, to take any questions. Okay. For, my right For the record, note that Representatives Turner and Raymond are present. Members, are there any questions for Chairman Capriglione? Representative Dean? We had him. He's him. All right. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, we'll call you back up. Members, we have registered one witness. Would Galen Scott come to the microphone? And would you please state your name, who you represent, and your position on the bill? Yes, my name is Galen Scott. I'm here representing the Texas Association of Community Colleges, and I am for this bill. Good morning, officially Chair Hunter and members of State Affairs. As I said, my name is Galen Scott. I serve as the Vice Chancellor of Instruction at Austin Community College, and I'm here today to speak in support of HB 584 by Chairman Capriglione. As of today, 46 of our 50 community colleges offer associate degrees in computer and information sciences and support services. However, currently, the state classification office guidelines recommend that all entry-level information technology jobs should require graduation from a four-year college or university. In fact, many agencies have existing programs that develop talent at the community college level but are unable to expand the program significantly due to the difficulties in waiving classification office guidelines. Last session, the legislature enacted Senate Bill 1102, better known as the Texas Reskilling and Upskilling Through Education, or TRUE Bill. This bill placed a needed emphasis on expanding career and technical education training to ensure better alignment with local and regional workforce needs. Using federal emergency relief funds provided by Governor Greg Abbott, Commissioner Harrison Keller has distributed through two different grant programs over $36 million to expand workforce education capacity across the state. Through initiatives like this one, our institutions have successfully demonstrated that tailored curriculum at the community college level, coupled with apprenticeships and on-the-job training, 
can sufficiently prepare students for positions in IT that traditionally require a four-year degree. HB 584 would not only address the state's need for qualified IT candidates, but it would establish a viable pathway through the already existing and successful programs at our community colleges. The Department of Information Resources would be able to enter into agreements with any community college district to develop a state information technology credential that is specifically tailored to address these workforce shortages. This bill will bolster our community colleges to continue the work we already do so well, serving the needs of our local communities. Austin Community College and all Texas community colleges remain committed to offering affordable, high quality education so that our state continues to lead the nation in economic prosperity. Thank you for your support and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Any questions of this witness? Thank you again. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on, for, or against this bill? Seeing and hearing none, the chair recognizes Chairman Capriglione to close on the bill. So again, thank you. What House Bill 584 will do will not only help address some of our workforce shortages here at the state, but also allow uh, folks all over Texas to be able to reskill and upskill into IT careers. With that, I close. Thank you. Any other questions for the chairman? Thank you, Chairman Capriglione. The chair moves to withdraw the committee substitute to HB 584 and leave the bill pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 584 is left pending. Thank you. At this time, the chair lays out HB 390 and recognizes Representative Howard to explain her bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, One thing, yes, note for the record that Chairman Guillen is here. Go right ahead, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for the opportunity to lay out House Bill 390. Um, having served on this committee last session and knowing what you've had ahead of you, I thank you for your work. I know you've got a lot on your plate to deal with. This should be pretty simple, I hope. Uh, many of you have heard this bill or versions of it in previous sessions. In fact, Representative Smithy, this will be your third time. So thank you for bearing with me here. Uh, we have been working for years now on trying to ensure that the public has access to our open meetings by ensuring that we webcast those meetings and archive uh, the webcasts. Uh, we started in 2009 with the State Board of Education and that has served our constituents well to be able to access the information that comes out of those hearings. Uh, 2014, in the interim, I was able to to make an agreement with LCRA without legislation and, and thankfully incoming general manager Phil Wilson at that time made it a priority and started webcasting theirs. Um, since then we've done HHSC and now we're looking at the other state agencies to apply this to. Obviously this is about transparency. Uh, this bill updates access to open meetings by requiring qualifying state agencies and departments to live broadcast and archive public meetings on their websites. Open meetings, of course, are an important part of civic engagement. They increase government transparency and allow for the public to interact with decision makers on policy issues that impact their daily lives. However, public awareness and understanding of these meetings can be difficult for those that are unable to attend in person or who are not already on a mailing list. My Austin constituents here can easily, or at least more easily, take off work to attend Austin hearings where most of these hearings occur. But it's much more difficult for many other Texans. Chair Hunter's constituents have to travel three plus hours, depending on how fast they drive, both ways to be able to get here. And Representative Smithies, I believe it's about eight hours both ways for your constituents to have an opportunity to come here and be in person. In 2023, we've all become, quote, professionals at digital meetings and broadcasting as a result of COVID and Zoom which showed us how easily accessible this technology has become. And as a result, live broadcasts are something that people have come to expect as a reasonable ask from their public institutions. Since I first introduced this bill, the current one that we're looking at today in 2019, 17 agencies 
have already adopted policies to live stream and archive the open meetings they file with the Secretary of State. Another 12 stream some of their meetings. This bill simply ensures that live streaming public meetings is the standard in Texas. In addition to live internet broadcasting, this bill requires that archived video and audio of open meetings be placed on the agency's website no later than seven days after the meeting. This should provide agencies with reasonable time to do that archiving. HB 390 only requires agencies that receive 10 million from the General Revenue Fund and have at least 100 full-time employees to comply with the streaming and archiving requirements. According to my estimates, we worked with LRL to, to get this information. Uh, this would bring the total number of agencies streaming and subsequently archiving to 41. Of those, 29 are already implementing at least some of the requirements of this bill. Agencies below this threshold would be required to upload audio recordings only of their open meetings uh, to either their website or social media channel. So this is simply an open government bill. Transparency engagement would be significantly increased by improving access to online broadcasts of open meetings, both through the use of live internet streaming and archived footage. And members, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions and reserve the right to close. Thank you, Representative. Representative Raymond has a question. And you answered some of what I was, you've said okay. it even before I um, got it recognized. But so there are 41 agencies that would be affected, right? Correct. And about 29 are, are either doing it entirely or part partially. Right. Uh, are there are there any agencies? I'm just curious. Do you know if there are any agencies that you that are that we exclude sort of on purpose um, due to sent? I don't know. I don't know what the reason would be, but are there any agencies uh, above that are 10 million and above in their budget that we're that, excluding? That, yeah. Specifically? Yeah. No, sir. No. No. Okay. It, and uh, you know, it, these have with the number of employees that they have and the GR funds that they have at this point in time with technology as it exists, it shouldn't be an onerous task to right. do this. Um, I, you may hear from some who are still concerned that about some smaller groups that are concerned about having to do this that are a part of a larger agency. And so like what's one of the that. bigger agencies that's doing it right now? That's well, HHSC is. Okay, uh, so have they told you uh, their costs? I'm trying to figure out why we haven't passed this. <laughs> Good question. Um, you know, I think in the past there was a concern about costs and about um, not having the meeting rooms that were uh, capable of live streaming in certain uh, agencies' buildings. But what we specifically allow in this is to use any of the state's rooms that are set up to do this, which we've got quite a few that are. Okay. Plus, because of the way technology is advanced, this is something that you know we all saw we could do with mm -hmm. our own telephones right. and upload it to a YouTube channel. Right. We're, not, we're trying to make this as non-onerous as possible, as simple as possible, but ensure that, that everyone who is Having to file uh, an open meetings request with the Secretary of State, a notice with the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. is required to make sure that the public is aware of that. They're, they're, they're having to make the public aware that they're meeting. Right. The public would like to know what happens in the meeting. Yeah, I would agree. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you. Thank you. No. We don't have any affirmations. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on for or against this bill? Seeing or hearing none, uh, the chair recognizes a representative Howard to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, any more questions? Otherwise, I can close. Well, thank you, Representative Howard. Any other questions? Chair moves to leave HB 390 pending at this time. Thank you, members. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 390 is left pending. Thank you very much. The chair lays out HB 537 and recognizes Representative Wu to explain his bill. And there is a substitute. So members, there's a substitute. So the chair offers a committee substitute to HB 537. Go right ahead, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, keep it as simple as possible. This. Uh, bill is the second time we've kind of run, run at this. Uh, this was resulting from a situation that happened uh, in Houston where um, there was a there was a uh, 
police raid uh, in a house where innocent people were end up being killed. Um, it was very controversial. The police end up doing an internal investigation into what happened, try to figure out, get to the bottom of everything. And then once the, the report was done, they refused to release it to anybody so that we couldn't see what was happening, what the problems were, and whether or not um, their plan to address the situation was adequate. So essentially we have a public organization using public funds to conduct and uh, conduct an analysis of the public function of that organization. And I think those factors being that it's public money, public agency and public interest, that should be the public. The public should have access to those records and be able to see what is going on. Now, um, what we have in the committee substitute, when we filed this bill originally, a lot of like really, um, a lot of accounting folks um, basically were afraid that we were going to rope them all into this. And we, the committee substitute basically just tries to cut out as much as, the, as much of that stuff as possible. So the committee substitute limits it to only, only when an organization is a, is a subject that these, the organization itself is a subject of the audit. Right? Meaning that you either hire somebody externally come to come look at what your organization is doing, or you set up a committee within your own organization to see what's going on and what the problems are. All we're saying that if you do that, redact the confidential information and allow the public to see what it is. That's it. You're doing it with government money about a public interest. Let the public see it. It's their report. That's it. Um, the, the committee substitute really ratchets down who would be subject to this. And again, it only would affect an, uh, a public agency if, it, if they are looking at themselves and if it's stuff that, that would normally be releasable under um, open records anyways. That's it. Thank you, uh, Representative. Any questions for the Representative? Is there any information? Thank you. If there's no further questions, we'll give you the right to close. We've shown no affirmations on this bill, members. So is there anyone else who wishes to speak on for or against the bill? If not, Chair recognizes Representative Wu to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we've been working with all the stakeholders, everyone who's had a concern, we've worked with them, and the committee substitute is the result of that work. Um, the last thing I'll say is just that I... I'm embarrassed that we have to pass this law. Like to say that public information generated with public funds needs to be released to the public. I'm, I'm embarrassed that we have to do this bill, but I think you know it's something that we need to make sure that doesn't have, ever, ever happen again, that we don't ever have that fight. Thank you, Representative, any questions? Thank you, Representative Wood. The chair moves to withdraw the committee substitute to HB 537 and leave the bill pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 537 is left pending. At this time, the chair lays out HB 1500 and recognizes Representative Holland to explain his bill. And is there a committee sum? Okay, the chair offers a committee substitute to HB 1500. Go right ahead, Representative. Good morning. Is it morning? Still it is. Good morning, Chairman Hunter. Members of State Affairs, today I lay out the committee substitute to House Bill 1500, which reflects the Sunset Commission decisions and recommendations related to the continuation and functions of the Public Utilities Commission, PUC, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, ERCOT, and the Office of Public Utility Council, OPUC. PUC and OPUC are subject to abolishment under the Sunset Act on September 1st, 2023, unless continued by the legislature. ERCOT is not subject to abolishment. Following Winter Storm Uri in 2021, the legislature made numerous changes to the electric industry and accelerated the sunset dates for these three agencies to keep close watch on the changes. The substitute is a culmination of the Sunset Agency staff and commissions review over the last year addressing PUC reporting, formalized structures, processes, transparency and decision making, and improved communications with the public. Major provisions in the substitute include a six-year continuance of PUC and OPUC 
including across the board sunset recommendation that only the agencies and not their statutes are subject to abolishment. The substitute, the substitute also extends the PUC's authority to hire any consultant, accountant, auditor, engineer, or attorney to represent it in matters in front of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC to align with the sunset continuation date. This is already a provision that is in the sunset or that is already in the um, statute. We are just aligning it with the sunset dates for, pure, uh, for PUC and ERCOT. In the spirit of transparency and communications across PUC and ERCOT, House, the substitute to House Bill 1500 adds one additional PUC commissioner as a non-voting ex officio member of the ERCOT Board of Directors to a total of two PUC commissioners. For context, two of the five PUC commissioners will now sit on the ERCOT Board of Directors. Presiding officer and a commissioner to be appointed by the presiding officer in the order which the commissioners were first appointed by the governor for a one-year term on the ERCOT Board. There will now be a total of 12 ERCOT Board of Directors, Board members. The substitute establishes a best practices and training manual for PUC commissioners that is consistent with other state agencies. This manual is to be created by the PUC executive director. The bill also adds scope and limitations on rulemaking authority of the commission to the training manual. The manual will be distributed annually. It also adds the requirement that each member of the commission submits to the executive director and adopt a document acknowledging that the member received and has reviewed the training manual. Substitute establishes an agenda policy for the inclusion of public testimony in meetings of the commission on matters that are not related to contested cases. The substitute requires a strategic agency-wide communications plan for improving communications with the public, the industry, and other relevant audiences. This includes, but is not limited to, conservation alerts, emergency messaging, and clarifying the commission's role throughout the process. PUC Director of Communications is tasked with creating this plan by the Commission. Notably, steps have already been taken since the 87th Legislature to increase communication specifically with the public. The Commission created the Office of Public Engagement and the PUC Communications team has recently expanded from one to four, a director, a press officer, a social media off coordinator, and a website officer. The Commission is also currently undergoing efforts to modernize their web presence and ease of use to the public and market participants. The substitute establishes a new electric industry report biennially explaining the state of the electric industry specifically to provide legislators clearer, more comprehensive information about the electric grid and market, market system needs. Currently, the commission submits a biennial report that covers water, electricity, and telecom. This new reporting requirement is specific to the electricity industry. The substitute establishes a protocol for written documentation of verbal directives in urgent and emergency situations that pose threats to public safety, health, and reliability of the power grid. This language is a change from the original filed bill. The substitute clarifies that all verbal directives issued by the commission must be documented in writing within 72 hours of the urgent emergency situation from the commission to ERCOT and vice versa. Substitute makes numerous cleanups, modifications, and cons consolidations to Pura, the Public Utility Regulatory Act, striking provisions and requirements that are no longer necessary, outdated, or can be consolidated for streamlined reporting as sunset legislation routinely does during these agency reviews. Finally, the substitute provides for an extension of time for the PUC to appoint emergency temporary managers to troubled water and wastewater utilities from 180 days to 360 days. We do have the sunset staff PUC, OPUC, and ERCOT resource witnesses available to the committee for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can take questions and would reserve my right to close. Members, do you have any questions for? Yes, yes. Uh, Chair Speaker Guerin. First of all, happy birthday. Thank you, Speaker Guerin. Uh, on page nine of the bill and on the substitute, it, it talks about the uh, commission authorized to consider and close meetings, and it excludes, it will let it, the Excuse me. It will let ERCOT exclude uh, the commissioners that are non-officio members, the PUC members of this. In these closed meetings, they'd be able to discuss HR uh, issues, pay issues, that type of thing. Is my understanding is that right? 
Yes, sir. But the, the reason for this provision in the bill is that the PUC is the regulator over the ERCOT market. And in a matter that the PUC may be needing to rule later in a commission meeting on a matter related to an ERCOT uh, market participant, this would allow the ERCOT board, the ERCOT board of directors to ask the, the two members of the PUC ex officio to step out of the executive session so that they could discuss an item that might be related to a future ruling that the commission might have to take. I've got a little problem with uh, removing them from the meetings, but I appreciate your explanation. Yes, sir. Representative Anchia. Uh, just following up on, on the chairman's questions, um, would they be removed or asked to be removed because they would be ser serving as an appellate body or a, uh, or a deciding body later on, yeah. and it so as to not to, so as to not prejudice uh, their decision making when they when they served as a serve as a finder of fact, or a uh, or or an entity that needs to call balls and strikes on a particular market participant. Yes, sir, Chairman and Chia, that's precisely the. And it would be they would assume assume they would have some sort of a, a items of importance or agenda of for their uh, executive session, and it wouldn't be a situation where they're going to say, you guys need to get up and leave. They, there would be a portion where the, the commissioners sitting on the in, in the executive session would know this is going to be an item that we would potentially have to rule on later, so we probably, this is the time when. Now, it's it's permissive, so it doesn't require them, but ERCOT's board of directors may ask the PUC commissioners to be excluded from certain portions related uh, to items that they may rule on. Yes. And one, one, Rep one more, Mr. Chairman. Speaker Garrow. Can we can we further define the reasons they can pick them out of the meeting? Um, I am going to defer to either the, the, the probably the Sunset staffer Emily on that. Uh, she can probably dig into that, but I but I think the answer is yes. Um, I think it's I think it's it's not spelled out here, but the reason would be. Uh, what we've what we've spoken. Yes. Thank you. Representative, you know, Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Holland, uh, for the explanation. Um, you mentioned in your layout um, some of the recommendations include modernizing the website uh, and uh, improving ease of use to the to the public, I think is how you phrased it. Th does that extend to the power to choose website for our constituents who are in the deregulated market? Um, this would only be in relation to the Public Utility Commission's agency website call. Okay, not the, not the, not the site where we go and select our plans for. It's my understanding that the only the, what we're talking about in this bill is PUC website. Okay, and, and maybe I'll follow up with the uh, agency staff when they testify. But I, I think the. This would be an opportunity to talk about the power to choose website and maybe some improvements that could be made and modernizations we made to make it more uh, easily accessible and understandable to the to the public. Sure, it's I agree with you, and it's my understanding that we're going to have plenty of opportunities to talk about the electric grid this session. <laughs> we're just hoping that this bill stays as a sunset oh, bill. I understand. All right, thank you. Any other questions, members, for this time for representative? Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, representing that chair. And uh, once again, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Uh, appreciate your service on Sunset. Um, and if you want to defer to, to Sunset staff, if, if, if you think these questions are better posed to them, sure. then by all means. Um, based on your uh, works working on Sunset, were there any material recommendations from Sunset staff that were not adopted ultimately by the commission that, that we should know about? No, no. In fact, we uh, we had a pretty rigorous. I mean, these were. This was a. If you look at the the final report and, and uh, the adoptions that we made, it, it's it's very extensive. It's very clean. It it takes the recommendations that the legislature has given um, the uh, the agencies, uh, particularly with PUC and ERCOT governance and public communications to another level, codifying them, making sure that we're. Um, really putting into into the statute what we expect of uh, public communications, transparency, uh, we, we've even added on. So I wouldn't say there's anything that we didn't adopt that, uh, that we should have. And, and do you think it's safe to say that most of the activity um, by Sunset staff on by Sunset were focused more on the energy side of the PUC jurisdiction rather than the telecom side? 
Um, we, we made a lot, we had a lot of focus on the energy side because of, uh, the, we, uh, accelerated their sunset dates for that purpose because of the 2021 events and grid and whatnot. And then uh, particularly the communications between ERCOT and PUC. Yes. Uh, and we, we did make some water and wastewater, um, uh, changes, but I would say that you're, you're correct in that we focused very heavily on, on electricity and the grid. Okay. side of this. And, and I'll just save the, the remainder of the questions for staff. Thank Appreciate you. you. Any other questions, members? Thank you, and we'll call you back up. Thank you. To close. Why don't we do this, members? I'll call up first Emily Johnson. Uh, Emily, state your name and who you're with. Emily Johnson, Sunset Commission staff, and I managed the review. Of Don't be so quiet. Speak Emily in. Johnson with Sunset Commission staff. I was the project manager for the review of PUC. Open. And you're on the bill. We are on the bill. All right. So because she's a resource, I wanted to bring her up because the members had requested. So Representative Anchia, why don't you start? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Emily, thank you for your work on Sunset. I've got a lot of respect for, for the team and the work you all do over there. Um, wanted to ask you uh, about the character of the PUC as a state agency and the character of ERCOT as a dependency of the state and, and our ISO. Um, I heard in the layout by uh, uh, Chairman Holland that ERCOT cannot go away if a bill uh, pa uh, fails to pass, um, but the PUC could go away, although the statutory language would still remain. It's authorizing statutory language would still remain. And, and, you know, I ask this because having served on Sunset, I'm always worried about Sunset bills not passing and what the ramifications are with the plumbers that didn't pass a couple years ago. We, that was, we were able to bring that back um, in the interim. Uh, and I want to, I would want to know if somebody tried to hold the PUC hostage, clearly not in this chamber, uh, but if somebody wanted to hold the PUC hostage, what would, uh, what would the ramifications be to the agency? Currently, the the statute allows for the abolishment of both the agency and its title of the um, regulatory act, and so both of those things would would expire. There are some provisions in the statute um, and other sections that would retain certain provisions. Um, it is not entirely clear which provisions those are. We certainly could have a discussion about those. Um, there's a, kind of some interesting language in the statute. But um, yes, the, the title, most of the title and the agency would cease to exist. Got you. And, and, and what is it that uh, ERCOT um, was placed sort of under the auspices of the, of the PUC um, during the last session? How is it that that would continue with PUC no longer continuing? There is some language because the title would expire again. There is some language that could potentially retain Chapter 39. Okay. And so it's possible that another entity, another agency could name or caught as the independent system operator. Um, so there's just some interesting language there that, that gives the potential for that to continue. Got you. And is there any other sort of savings language and any other um, statute that would permit uh, either the governor or some other entity to name a successor entity, not to ERC ERCOT, but a successor entity to, to the PUC? But that, that language that I mentioned that has some of that, keeps those, those provisions, um, would allow the legislature or the Secretary of State, if the legislature didn't do it, to, to enforce those provisions. But again, it's not entirely clear which provisions would continue on. Gotcha. If you um, come up with some sort of memorandum uh, detailing that, I'd be interested to take a look at it. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I apologize once again. Thank you for for allowing me to, to ask follow up questions. Um, uh, Chairman Holland mentioned that there was a limitation in the scope of some rulemaking uh, for the PUC. He said there was an expansion in some areas and a limitation in others, certainly a mod can you Can you talk about the materiality of, of that scope? He was just talking about there's a training, the updated training requirements for commission members, for PUC commission members, would make it clear that they have to be trained on the scope of their rulemaking. I see. And that's standard for all agencies. I follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
other questions of the resource with Representative Turner. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hard to find the button for this microphone. Uh, thank you for being here. I think you heard my, my question of the bill author with respect to the power to choose website. Can, can you speak to that? Sure. There's not a recommendation in, in, there's not language in the bill, but the Sunset Commission did adopt a management action. So it's something PUC could do within its existing authority that directed the agency to provide um, better information as part of its current, they're currently undergoing a website redesign effort. And that would include all of their websites, including the power to choose. Okay, so, so the agency is currently undertaking that effort to redesign all the websites, including the Power to Choose? See, I, I can't speak to whether or not they're going to redesign Power to Choose, but the Power to Choose website would be included in the overall look at their website. Okay. Um, and, and so the Sunset Commission recommended to the agency that it... That it provide easily accessible information on its website and clean that up. And so we did not specifically say that they need to go make changes to power to choose, but making it clear how people can find that information, making sure that it's usable and, and helpful. Okay. And did you, did you, in the course of doing that, did you identify specific uh, deficiencies in the current website as to what could be improved? For in the homepage we did, not in the Power to Choose. That was actually not something we heard a lot about, which I was a little surprised about. I use Power to Choose. I'm in a deregulated area. Um, and Do so you find it user-friendly? I generally have, and I change providers about every two years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I've heard a number of complaints about it. There's just sure. It's, I've, I've used a lot too, but it's, I think for some people it's and confusing and not, and not as user friendly as I can only speak to my personal experience. Understand. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. Any other questions? Speaker Garrett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Emily, do you mind, I mean, I, in reading this, it's under chapter 551 that they can exclude, uh, they can go in executive session and exclude the uh, PUC commissioners that are serving as ex officio members. Can you go a little bit deeper into what, because it said, you know, it's only to address contracts, competitively sensitive information, and information related to the security of the regional electric network, which some of those I would think that we'd want the PUC commissioners in on that. Yes. And so it's optional whether they kick them out or not. Is that right? So two, two things there. That first provision that you're reading, about what they can go into, what ERCOT can go into executive session for, that would be generally. The next section that speaks to them being allowing to excluding the commissioners, they would have to develop a policy. So it would have to be clear in writing the, the circumstances under which that would, that would happen. I understand that they'd have to develop a policy, but wouldn't we want to develop that policy so we'd know what it is before we pass this wonderful piece of legislation? <laughs> You, you guys certainly could make suggest such a change that the, the it, it just concerns me that we're going to remove the the PUC commissioners from this. And I understand if it's a, a sensitive contract, the PUC is going to have to vote on. But some of this is HR stuff. There's other issues that can come up, and I I, I just would like a little more verbiage to to kind of clear up what they can kick them out for and what they can't. Sure. The, the intent very much is that it's it's not going to be the types of things, like if it's grid-related, if there's something about the grid. I, I, under, I understand intent real well. I've, we've been exposed to it several times, and intent doesn't always follow through with what we think is going to happen. And so if we can clarify that, I would appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Emily. Other questions? Now, again, for the committee, and everybody state your name again. State your name again. Emily Johnson. And your position? Review director. And with whom? The Sunset Advisory Commission. And you're on? You're on the bill. So I'm going to request you and your agency to do a follow-up over the next week with the members of this committee because they may have other questions about this particular bill. So you'll do that, won't you? Yes, sir. There you go. Just make sure that's said in the microphone. Oh, any other questions, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman. Do you, do you have another question? Okay, Representative Raymond. What was her name again? Emily Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank y'all. 
All right, we will now call Cyrus Reed. <laughs> and then Cyrus, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Cyrus Reed, Conservation Director, Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club, very much in support of HB 1500. Um, I have written testimony, which is two pages. I won't read it. Um, I will s highlight a few items that I think are very important. One, the PUC sunset date of 2029. Given that there's going to be a very extensive discussion again this session about the electric grid, uh, allowing you guys to come back in six years as opposed to 12 years makes a whole lot of sense. Second, uh, section three, and this goes a little bit to some of Mr. Turner's uh, questions. Sierra Club brought a big group of folks to a couple of the PUC meetings, and we didn't know how to speak on PUC agenda items because it wasn't clear we could, other than on, you know, you can speak at the beginning of the meeting, making sure that at any PUC meeting, if it's not a contested case hearing, members of the public can speak is very important because it's the Public Utility Commission. That is a great and wonderful change. And there was a management action on making their uh, website more user-friendly. It's not user-friendly unless you're a somewhat sophisticated you know, person who follows rulemaking. It's very hard. I would say that's also for the Power to Choose and the Power to Save website, which is about energy efficiency. So I think that doesn't need legislative statutory change, but hopefully they get the message. They need to improve those things. Uh, that also goes in the strategic communication plan. Um, we appreciate um, Representative Guerin the extra commissioner being a member of the board. I think that's important given you guys expanded from three to five. We also think it's important on some matters that ERCOT maintains some independence and those board members can be invited out the door for a brief time. But in general, all those meetings should be public and available for anybody to watch. So that's important. Um, and it's section nine is incredibly important. There was mass confusion from stakeholders uh, during the blueprint discussion about what PUC commissioners were doing and saying on the record and what was a directive to ERCOT and what was not. So having something in writing that any stakeholder can respond to is extremely important in terms of open records. Uh, we also think the Emergency Water Administration is very important. Um, Representative Holland and others, I put some small amendments that we think could be good on the second page and then some other larger issues uh, but, you know, we're a team player, and to the extent that we want to keep this, this bill um, focused on the issues that the commissioners made, um, you know, made the decisions on where, where we, agree, we agree that let's, let's, not, uh, let's, not this, let's not make this a, um, what's the word, Christmas tree, uh, and let's keep it focused on those issues. So with that, I will close. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Cyrus, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And happy birthday. Next, Michelle Richmond. State your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, I'm Michelle Richmond, Executive Director of the Texas Competitive Power Advocates, and we are here to support House Bill 1500. Um, it is critical that the agencies in the bill continue. Um, one of the things that I think has been a theme throughout much of our testimony over the past couple of years has been regulatory certainty and ensuring that the agencies that uh, oversee the electric grid, uh, the competitive market, and um, who advocate on behalf of residential and small commercial consumers as a class are cl clearly supported and continued by the legislature is a uh, significant piece towards providing regulatory certainty um, for all aspects of the electric industry. We also appreciated the um, 
the inclusion of a requirement to put uh, verbal directives in writing. Um, that's something that provides a great deal of transparency to um, everybody in the market and anybody who might be watching what is happening at the commission and with the, with the market. And so um, we would echo um, what Cyrus said about making sure that this continues to be an actual sunset bill focused on uh, the agency and its processes as opposed to um, getting into policy battles. And we appreciate your work on this. Any questions, members? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, Kenneth Flippen. And Kenneth, again, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Thank you, Chairman. My name is Kenneth Flippen, and I am the Energy Policy Consultant for the U.S. Green Building Council, and we are in favor of the bill. Um, we, I'd agree with the last two people that uh, testified. There are a lot of things that we could do to improve and strengthen uh, the PUC. I think some of the provisions that involve uh, improving the communication uh, that are in the bill are important. I also think that the time frame is correct, um, even though some of the amendments that uh, were recommended by Cyrus, we think would be smart. We also think that uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's very important for us to uh, continue the PUC uh, and, and support this bill. Thank you. Any questions, members? Kenneth, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, money all. Okay, members, that is all the witness affirmations. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on, for, or against the bill? Seeing none, the chair recognizes Representative Holland to close on his bill. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I want to thank um, the Sunset staff and the agencies, as well as my staff. This is a lot of work over the interim, and <clears throat> they uh, do a good job making us look good. And so thank, thank you to the uh, Sunset staff and PUC, ERCOT, and OPUC, and my staff, uh, and I close. Any other questions? Thank you, Representative Holland. The chair moves to withdraw the committee substitute to HB 1500 and leave the bill pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 1500 is left pending. For everybody's schedule, uh, we're going to be doing Representative Guillen's bill, and then we will be calling up uh, Chairman Burroughs. So at this time, the chair lays out HB 2033 and recognizes Chairman Guillen to explain his bill. The chair offers a committee substitute to HB 2033. Chairman Gann, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, during Winter Storm Uri, we saw firsthand how dangerous the lack of communication and coordination between state agencies and critical supply lines can be. In response, last session, the legislature passed SB3, which created the Texas Electricity Supply Chain Security and Mapping Committee that was tasked with creating a map of the state's electricity supply chain to designate priority electricity service needs during extreme weather events. As we saw then, road crews were unable to reach critical infrastructure facilities due to implement, inclement weather and poor visibility to determine which county roads uh, and or other roads were inaccessible. CSHB 2033 would add the would add TxDOT to the Texas Electricity Supply Chain Security and Mapping Committee and grant them access to the electricity supply chain map. The difference between the filed version and the substitute is the addition of water and wastewater treatment facilities to the map. This was added to the bill because during Winter Storm URI, transmission and distribution service providers didn't know where water and wastewater treatment facilities were located and shut off power to over 1,800 public water systems in 199 Texas counties, causing boil water notices and affecting approximately 14.9 million people. Um, I can help answer any questions. Uh, I do believe we have a, a resource witness here to help answer questions as well. Members, any questions of Chairman Guillen? 
saying none. Chairman, thank you, and I'll call you up at, to close. Um, we have no witness affirmations. Um, is there anybody who wishes to speak on, for, or against the bill? Saying none, the chair recognizes Chairman Guillen to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if there's no further questions, uh, I'd ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you, Chairman Guillen. The chair moves to withdraw the committee substitute to HB 2033 and leave the bill pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 2033 is left pending. At this time, the chair lays out HB 2127 and recognizes Chairman Burroughs to explain his bill. The chair offers a committee substitute to HB 2127. Go right ahead, Chairman Burroughs. Thank you, Chairman Hunter, Vice Chair Hernandez, and committee members for hearing this, uh, what I think is a very simple bill. Uh, I'm here today to present House Bill 2127, also known as the Texas Regulatory Consistency Act. Texas' economy relies on business and industries that cross local government boundaries. They often have more than one location, they service customers in many locations, and their employees work at different locations and cross boundaries commuting to work. This bill restores the regulatory authority to the state rather than thousands of local governments, eliminating costly compliance burdens and fueling economic growth. Today, you will hear from a number of witnesses who have personal stories detailing how the current patchwork of regulations that come from operating a state with 254 counties and thousands of municipalities that all have their own ordinances has hurt their businesses. Passage of this bill will create a single set of predictable and consistent regulations and will therefore drive economic growth while enabling local governments to continue to respond to local needs. Tell you a little bit about this bill. Let me start with just making sure everybody understands. Article three, section one of the Texas constitution says, the legislative powers of this state shall be vested in the state and house of representatives, which together shall be styled the legislature of the state of Texas. When allowing for home rule cities, the constitution also says, no city charter, any ordinance passed under said charter shall contain any provision inconsistent with the constitution of this state or the general laws enacted by the legislature of this state. From these, preemption already exists in the state of Texas. It is a somewhat narrow definition that has been applied by the courts that says basically if an ordinance is inconsistent or frustrates the purpose or provision of the code, then preemption exists. And in fact, there's already declaratory judgment relief by a lawsuit available for those aggrieved parties. What I do is I expand that and include the concept of field preemption. To basically say that if a field is occupied by the legislature, then we're the ones and the sole people who are going to regulate this. The concept of field preemption is something that comes from the U.S. Constitution, talking about the Supremacy Clause, and there is hundreds of years of case law that has been built up around the concept of field preemption that we will be able to draw upon so we actually can apply this as we look at the fields that are actually there. As I mentioned, declaratory judgment already exists. What my bill simply does is it codifies the waiver of sovereign immunity. Currently, if you bring a deck action under the current preemption provisions, the court has said sovereign immunity, obviously, by implication, had to have been granted by the legislature in order for you to bring it because of that was what it does. I want to go ahead and put that in statute. It also expands standing to associations. The thing I've heard from several businesses when they've had to challenge these ordinances in the past, they're afraid if they're the named plaintiff in one of these declaratory judgment actions, they may be then retaliated against by their city or county officials. And so they would feel much better if their association, which they're a member of, has the standing and ability to bring that for them so their strength to be there together so they're not going to be ridiculed or prosecuted or uh, have reprisal, you know, in this situation. I also expanded the jurisdiction which they can actually bring this lawsuit. In the committee sub, you'll notice it is not only the county or the city that actually enforced this, but also the neighboring counties. It's no longer statewide, that's in the committee substitute, but making sure that you have some other alternatives so you may not be going through a completely hostile jurisdiction to begin with. 
Committee substitute adds some provisions, adds the property and business code that came from our business community saying this would be very helpful in a lot of ways. I've talked about the changing of standing in form. It's no longer just a standing for any taxpayer, but actually an aggrieved party and associations. But I also had a meeting with stakeholders, including representatives of cities, and they brought up a number of concerns, and we had a very fluid conversation about things they wanted to make sure they could do that obviously I don't think this bill ever intended to touch and does not touch. Um, and I said, why don't I put a savings clause in there? This says, look, that no... No matter what, you're at least going to have the powers that we have granted to a general law city. And so I put that savings provisions in there based on meetings with the stakeholders, and I think that gives them a very good floor. Uh, you're going to hear from several witnesses who can give you examples of the ordinances we're talking about. I'll name a few. We have the paid sick leave ordinances, overtime fairness, fair chance hiring, wage theft ordinances, bag bans, gas-powered lawn equipment bans, uh, things of that nature. But here's what I'll tell you. We cannot predict what is going to happen next. This committee and this session probably has seen more bills having to deal with preemption than we've ever seen in the past. And I think many in the legislature are tired of playing whack-a-mole. And if we do not do a bill or some bill like this in the 89th, whatever number of bills filed to basically deal with preemption today, take a multiplier, what we're going to have to deal with the 89th, and then multiply that again for the 90th if we do not do something that restores the historic powers of the state to oversee the regulation of our business and economy. I'll go ahead and address some of the misconceptions. Local government will still, no matter what, under my bill, and there's plenty more, still have powers of zoning, motor vehicle, motor vehicle part sales, rendering plants, taxi cabs, weights of quality, uh, butchers, uh, unrestrained animals, hawkers, peddlers, theaters, billboards, nuisances and disorderly conduct, vehicle wrecking and salvage, junkyards, recycling business, flea markets, demolition business, outdoor resale bills, daycares, massage parlors, game rooms, firearms, sexually oriented businesses, acquisition, public buildings, historic preservation, public safety, including police, fire and jails, community planning and development, water utilities, parking and transportation. I can go on, but those are the lists that we actually have the code sites for that they retain no matter what under the bill. And there's other and other examples of this. Um, this bill uh, also, I heard this somehow this morning. So when, when this bill was first kind of presented and came into the public, the first thing that somebody brought to me that was maybe, you know, against the bill, they said, oh, my gosh, you're going to stop us from regulating pawn shops. Well, I went and did the research and showed them they clearly still have the regulation of pawn shops. And so, you know, we've been playing a little bit of uh, whack-a-mole, you know, with just the things that are brought up and having to assure people this bill does not address this. But I heard the new one this morning that somehow this is going to prevent local governments from responding to emergencies. That is absolutely patently false. Uh, Government Code Chapter 418 expressly grants cities and counties authority to respond to natural man-made disasters. Uh, and I can go on about all the different case sites, you know, for that. Um, so I tell you all this. This is obviously a bill that I think is very important. I think that often in the media somehow that the state is being portrayed as the aggressor in this situation. I think nothing could be further than the truth. I think what we have seen year over year in legislature after legislature, we have seen city councils decide that they're going to now try and regulate things beyond what we think of the core con competencies and core nature of city government. And uh, we're being responsive to this. And so I feel in a lot of ways uh, it is ripe and appropriate in time for us to, you know, restore the historic powers of the state. Members, I'm happy to answer any specific questions. I uh, reserve the right to close after doing that. And if there's any questions that I do not have, I'm sure I can, on closing, try to answer those if you have any specific concerns and do my best. So with that, I'll answer for, questions. First, for the record, uh, note Chairwoman Thompson is here. Thank you, sir. Any questions of Chairman Burroughs? Uh, yes. Representative Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burroughs, uh, and I, I intended to, to approach you on the floor today, and I apologize for not doing that sooner. But I wanted to ask, uh, I've had people contact me both ways on this. Some of them have said uh, payday lending. Some have said it's it's uh, covered by the bill, you know, a, a municipal payday lending statute would be pre preempted. Others have said it's not. Uh, 
Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, so my understanding is the there are several cities who've done payday lending ordinances. Uh, my understanding is those are likely already preempted under the current uh, provisions of preemption. You know, I'm not a legal expert on that. Um, I think that some people are looking to make sure that cities are brought, they're looking to use my bill as a vehicle to maybe shut down payday lending. And uh, obviously, I think that uh, we went through a sunset uh, provision on uh, the OCCC, which actually looks over this in 2019. Uh, we've had several bills that have gone through the legislative process, and if we need to address, uh, you know, uh, these uh, businesses, I think that we certainly need to take a hard look at it at the state level, but I don't think that currently uh, those provisions and those codes uh, are probably not, I think they're already preempted, and I don't want this bill to be a vehicle to basically change that. Do you think they are already preempted? I do. Okay. And the reason being, I think there's a TML website they put out that said don't actually put fines or levy fines because they didn't want to have state give standing in courts. And so I'll let somebody with more expertise speak to that, but we can certainly have that conversation. Okay. One, uh, one other question, and that is one of the concerns that I've, had, that, that I've heard that have, have arisen is that by referring to these, referencing these various codes and saying that anything inconsistent with those codes uh, anytime we amend a code, we are in fact we're, we are de facto amending the statute to to prohibit more municipal regulation. Um, my question is to you is whether you've considered and if you haven't your your comment on being more specific in the legislation itself because I, I honestly I mean I agree with you that certain things there are certain pre um, areas that we should preempt. My concern is, is two, twofold. One is, is how broad we're going here. But secondly, um, I'm not sure I understand from reading the bill what all is being pre preempted because of its reference to these codes. Well, you, ha you have two different ways of drafting a bill. I mean, we could sit there and try to be prescriptive and identify each and everything that we are preempting. Um, and I think that we will get it wrong and we'll find multiple, multiple holes in there. This bill is designed to be somewhat of a living document and rely upon the case law to basically say, if we occupy a, a field, not just a mere mention of a particular industry, but actually occupying the field, that we are going to be the sole persons who are going to occupy and regulate that. And so I chose the way of not actually being overly prescriptive and making the laundry list of things, knowing that somehow, sometimes that gets us in trouble as people maneuver around the careful wording of that and gives this more of this. But my intention was to be somewhat of a living document. And also, I think it encourages the legislature to do a better job of regulating if we need to regulate industry altogether. Well, one more. I'm sorry, I keep having one more. This is yeah. the last question. But but let, let's say that uh, six or eight years from now, sure. the makeup of the legislature changes and the le legislature of Texas legalizes abortion, which I understand it has the right to do under the Supreme Court decision, where it, it says under these prescribed circumstances, mm -hmm. abortion is legal in the state. And let's say, uh, I think Lubbock was one of the cities mm -hmm. that can, that did, that declared sanctuary for the unborn. a sanctuary city. And so at that point, if the legislature had specifically adopted a policy legalizing abortion, would a municipality within the state have the power to uh, declare itself, declare abortion unlawful within the confines of that city. So what I can tell you is the actual heartbeat bill we passed last session gave the cities the power to pass things like the sanctuary for the unborn, and that would be preserved and protected underneath this bill. Obviously, six to eight years from now, if another political climate comes out, this bill may have some effect on it, but I can at least speak very you know, carefully to that provision because I did research that ahead of time. Thank you for asking. Thanks. Representative Van Chia. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Burroughs, hi. Hi. Uh, I represent a number of different cities that um, are concerned about the bill and uh, the what, what they see as a broad, uh, broad um, prohibition against activity rather than um, your approach, which you said was going to uh, was was designed not to be too prescriptive, depends which side of the equation I think you're you're sitting on. If you if you um, refer to an entire code mm -hmm. and suggest that the state is uh, occupying that field, then a city might say, well, that's fairly prescriptive. 
um, to them. I was talking about the legislation being written out. I certainly no, I, I understand. I understand. But but in in some ways, you could construe this bill as being highly prescriptive vis-a-vis uh, -vis cities, right? What, what I would actually say is you talked about the cities that you've heard from, you know, they've done this. I've also talked to a number of the businesses in those cities who are giving me real examples of why this is a struggle for them to continue to make ends meet and why maybe other, they don't want to expand or maybe why we're not going to be as attractive because they cannot rely upon this. And look, if we're doing a bad job of regulating something, let's regulate it. It's better. And you're going to hear from a number of those cities. I bet some of them are actually in your city as well that come here today. I mean, I could give you a laundry list of things that the state does a really terrible job of regulating, right? Including child protective services and adult protective services and mental health. I mean, uh, we are, we are uh, not doing well at regulating many of these things. So I, I just want us to, to, to have, just really quickly, Mr. Chairman, yeah. just, just the perspective that um, simply because the state is regulating or not regulating something doesn't mean that it is uh, de facto doing doing a great job. And 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 I I'm certain that there are there are businesses who who feel like we're either under or over regulating them from the state level as well. Um, but what I wanted to Can get at. Yeah, go ahead, please. One, one quick comment on that, because I also I think you all just heard from the PUC. Was that right on the. Uh, uh, sunset. Sunset, heard, Phil. sunset. Yeah, you know, we have agencies here and attorneys here and think tanks here talking about the oil and gas and energy sector. And I know there's some great minds at the city of Dallas and the city of Houston, but they don't have the same resources available to them to regulate the oil and gas industry. And I don't think it's a good idea to have a you know, mini railroad you know, commission at every single city level, which is essentially what this bill is trying to protect from happening, which we've seen people try to do. I, I didn't reference uh, oil and gas, but um, um, I'm not sure how we got on that. But uh, what, what I wanted to ask you a little bit about is um, our non-discrimination ordinances, because those are some things that we have at the local level. Now, I, ha I haven't dug into your committee substitute. Um, we just got that uh, with a pretty short window. I wanted to ask you about those, both, both from the perspective of, of cities who uh, like Dallas, who express their values of non-discrimination in a local ordinance, and B, because I know I know in the in the prior version there were references to the property code, uh, communities like mine who express non-discrimination also in their housing codes. I'm, good, I'm how, well, glad you asked. So, so how does how does the committee substitute deal with both of those things? It doesn't have to because it never was done away with. Both of those are protected under here. I can get you the site to the labor code that actually grants cities and continues to give cities the power to have fair hiring practices under all federally protected classes. And then in the property code, I can find you a some a little brief I have dealing with the uh, protection on fair housing. This bill does not do away with discrimination powers uh, of cities to preserve and protect it, and those are specifically authorized and will be maintained under this. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, also want to ask you about um, the ability of, of cities to, for example, regulate something that you mentioned at the outset in your, in your layout, which was um, a motorized um, leaf blowers, yeah. right, for landscaping in Dallas. Um, our city council is being responsive to years and years and years of complaints by um, by residents about a leaf blowers um, being used to simply spray um, um, refuse. Uh, you know the the uh, the 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 leftovers of grass cuttings and leaves and everything into right away and into our our culverts and our drainage system, which is. I, I, I witness it on a regular basis when I drive around town. Mm -hmm. um, also, noise and nuisance, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whether it's you know, um, uh, city a city council members concerned about you know mufflers no longer muffling and in fact amplifying noise and noise pollution in their community or leaf blowers. Um, why why shouldn't um, a local city council be able to, that is closest to the people, be responsive to their community about um, noise uh, and the abatement of noise pollution. Noise and nuisance are protected under here. I think that probably the intent and purpose of what your the ordinance you're talking about would be the one called into question. If it's part of some sort of, you know, 
new green, new, green, is it green new deal, green new deal agenda. I think maybe the purpose of that may actually be, you know, in here. If it's simply, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, I don't. Well, that's what has been described, I think, in some of the popular media. But if it's just about noise, they have the clear uh, rights to regulate noise and nuisance, and that's preserved under this bill. But under your bill, um, someone in Mahia, Texas, could sue Dallas. Call them into the ve a venue in Mahia. Not on the committee substitute. I fixed that. Oh, okay. Okay. So there's no longer a prescriptive venue. So what you have now for the declaratory. Can judgment. you just talk, talk to me how the venue works? Yeah. So well, it's also standing, right? So okay. under. So first off, again, just to make sure it's clear, we're not creating a new cause of action essentially because one already exists. But standing, you have to be an aggrieved party, and I use the common law definition of standing, which means you have to actually be affected or threatened to be affected by the ordinance. So if you live in Mahaya, you're not threatened to be, you know, uh, uh, affected by the ordinance. So but but in the original bill, you, you could do that, right? So I'm not, I wasn't misspeaking earlier. Correct. The committee substitute okay. Okay. narrowed it down to basically make sure you have to have a common law standing to be able to do that, and then you can file your declaratory judgment in the county district court in which it happened or one of the adjacent counties. Or one of the adjacent counties. Yeah. Why one of the adjacent counties? There has been, and look, I think that we can talk to some of the businesses who've actually had to file these lawsuits who've come up. They will tell you that even though facially the courts, and I'll pick on Travis County because I think this is where it really came from. When they adopted paid sick leave ordinances, it was facially against state law. And the courts delayed and delayed and delayed, not because there was any good legal reason, probably for political reasons. At least that's what was been represented to me and how I think many people see this. And so but paid sick never went into into effect in any place it ever passed, right? Dallas, San Antonio, Austin. But, now, it was it's it's to this day blocked and and uh, by courts. But during the period of time, they were threatened to, and you had to wait for the court opinions to actually come out. That there was, was no really, enforcement. That was, well, that's, that's, but it's still on the books and potential enforcement. So what are you supposed to do when a city council completely oversteps its boundaries and passes you know, something that threatens your business completely, and you know, and maybe you've hired lawyers to basically declare it unconstitutional or against the state law, but you still are worried about it potentially being enforced. I mean, this is still real time, and how do you deal with compliance? Paid sick leave was a real problem for businesses, and some are here that will tell you about it. Even though it did not get into effect. Never. You're talking... It was still on the books. They were still threatened by it, and they still conducted their business in accordance with it while they waited for justice. So, so a delay of yeah. so you would agree then laws that are on the books that may not have effectiveness uh, are problematic to people. They can be. Okay. Okay. So that cuts a lot of different ways. Yeah. Okay. And to clarify. NDOs are preserved in yes. the bill. Okay. And I, I would welcome the opportunity. I can give you some of the legal memorandum to make sure everyone knows that. <clears throat> Representative Dean. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, thanks uh, for the bill um, substitution you brought today. I think, you know, made quite a few notes, but you've addressed them. Uh, and just for the record, you and I have had an opportunity to visit several times on your bill. I I'm not sure if anybody else on, on the... Uh, board here that uh, the committee here have served uh, as a city council member or mayor or something like that oh Raphael congratulations thank you, thank you. um I was fortunate to, a I, I don't know if that's con depends on where you live um I was fortunate enough to serve uh from 1998 to 2015 uh, as a as a member of a council, 10 of which I was the mayor, and thank God we have term limits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one, one of the things I want to visit with you on and, and talk about, um, you know, one, one of the things we always tried to do when it came to ordinances was A, the safety of our citizens, uh, and B, to be business friendly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we were recognized by, Ford, by Forbes magazine to be one of the best places in the United States to do business because we had that attitude. Um, I mean, would you agree also that in most cases, the purpose of an ordinance um, is, is sort of a backstop. It's to where some guy's growing, you know, his um, cabbage patch downtown and <laughs> he's got 36 inch cabbage and neighbors next door complain that he's not, you know, managing or mowing or doing what he's supposed to do. 
we don't have a weed control uh, bounty. I mean, we don't ride around looking all around yeah. town to see. We do have a pothole patrol, which is, I think is very effective. But anyway, um, but, but ordinances are there so that a city can say, okay, we've tried, sent you notices, we've done all the things legally we need to do. We're going to go in now and cut, and then we're going to send you a bill. W would you agree that that's typical, I think, for most cities? What I would tell you is I, when I came into the legislature and even the first couple of <coughs> years that I was here, that is what I thought about for most ordinances. What I am starting to see is a different category of ordinances that have emerged. Right. Where, you know, is some of the same uh, advocates that come to the legislature with, you know, their agenda that are not able to get it through here at the state capitol have now gone to some of our uh, cities and maybe more progressive cities and had those adopted, you know, there to try to implement their vision of Texas in a way that we have already rejected. And we're starting to see, whereas we dealt with maybe one preemption ordinance in 2019 and two in 2021, there are a vast number that are now, you know, bills filed dealing with preemption because we've had to because of what is we've seen play out over the state and really has kind of evolved since my time in the legislature. Right. And one of the things uh, you, you point out today within the uh, substitute, one of the things I think we hear is, uh, oh, my God, you know, cities 5,000 more, we're a home rule charter uh, city. We've, we've adopted that uh, by constitutional amendment, et cetera, et cetera. But in some of our conversations, um, I think there's already law, constitutional law, that says, you know, even though you're a home rule charter, if you go overboard or if you go out of bounds, it still falls back to the Constitution, to the state. Is that correct? I, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, if we look at this, this is really just giving full force and effect to our state constitution. Right. And but and, and I'm also, uh, I can assume, and I think we can assume that, again, we're not looking to become big brother. We, we prefer local control. I mean, I've heard from some cities that said, hey, look, if you're all going to do all these things, we're we're trying to cut our budgets because of some of the revenue, some of the other things I have. And I'm saying that's not what we're saying. We're, we're not looking to, like I said, be the weed control people and, and so forth and so on in the various eight different codes that we've, we've pointed out. But I think it's important that we, you know, clarify to make sure that home, home rule charter cities are going to continue to operate just as they always have. Is that is that the right assumption on my part? Yes, privately, I've had some mayors and city council members tell me that, you know, they want something like this to go into force because they're tired of people, you know, coming to them with this agenda, you know, which is hard for them to sometimes say no. Uh, one in particular larger, you know, city has given me some thoughtful ideas that I will continue to look at just to make sure that, you know, we don't, I don't think there's, a, look, there are not the unintended consequences sure. people are in scare tactics we're starting to hear about this bill. Those don't exist. Those are broadly made by groups that don't want this to go in effect because it does stop the other ordinances that we talked about. Right. However, you know, if we need to clarify a few couple of things, I'm always willing to sit down and make sure that, you know, we preserve the dignity and the uh, respect of the core functions of city government. And I think I've already made one substantive change in the committee substitute after a meeting and a good conversation to acknowledge that they'll at least retain the powers of the general law cities. Right. And, and, and that's, I think, you know, what, what in, in the bill you want to do, you, you want to sort of square the playing ground, but we, we want to allow our cities and our local control, the people that are elected in those cities continue moving forward unless they go out of bounds. That's it. Unless they go out of bounds. You, you clarified something earlier. I want to make sure I understand. You know, we talked about the venue and you know, mm -hmm. Joe Blow doesn't like the, the, the judge in Grant County. So I, thought, I think I'll go to, mm, I'll go to Cherokee County. Nothing against anybody here from Cherokee County, but it's more liberal. I go over there and they'll, yeah. they'll hear. But you've, you've made it to where it's contiguous, basically. I mean, you're saying neighboring counties. But like in the example of uh, Chairman and Chia about Dallas versus Mejia, that's, quite a, that's not contiguous. You couldn't go to Mejia because you're mad at Dallas. 
You know, sometimes when you file a bill, you basically know that there may be some things you give away as you talk to you know, people and, and you do that. Surely and, and obviously we've gotten to a point that I think, you know, is, is acceptable talking to all the various stakeholders and constituencies to make sure that it's, you know, reasonable. It reflects the traditional notions of standing. Uh, and I think the forum selection is not as broad as it once was. Right. And so and I'm, gl I'm, I'm glad we're continuing to hear from people to make the necessary revisions. And, and like we've seen before, on, on on large bills such as this, mm -hmm. um, you in particular have been open to hearing from, and I mean, you know, we know that when we file legislation, there's I don't care how hard we work at trying to identify everything, we have unintended consequence, and and I I feel good about the fact that, you know, we're going to have things that are going to come up as we move as we move with the bill, and and your door is open to talk about some things that we might not have thought about in, in, the, in the preparation of the bill. Is that? Always, and I appreciate you saying that it's always open, happy to work with you, any of the members of this committee as we talk about it. But I think, that's, I think it's a fundamental question we've got to decide is, have we finally crossed the Rubicon? You know, has there been so many things that you're gonna hear the examples from the actual witnesses today that we actually have to do something like this to basically rein in some of the things we're seeing going on? And uh, that's the fundamental question. And if so, I believe this is the most thoughtful, decent version to try to get that done. And just as an example, you talked about every session we come back with some preemptive things because something came up and, oh, we have to go address that. I've had Bill back and forth about the use of natural gas and propane appliances. Why should we have to do that? But there's literally, I mean, has anybody ever cooked on an electric stove versus a... Especially if you're making gumbo, man, you got to have a gas stove, right? I mean, it's just an over, it's an overreach, and, and we shouldn't do that to our, to our citizens. Well, and just like if we don't do this, we'll have to come back. The things that you described, I never thought we'd have to actually have a conversation about whether or not someone should be able to use a gas stove. But here we are nonetheless. Good bill, by the way. Um, if we do your bill and we don't do mine, we're going to find three or four new things next session we have to come back. This somewhat flips it on a head. And so if we need to come back and basically say, you know what, we need to basically have our cities and our counties helping us do this, that, you know, we can come back and pass legislation to make sure they have that. It flips who has the burden of proof in getting it done. And I think this is exactly what our forefathers writing the Constitution envisioned. My last point uh, is that if we did it the opposite way, we keep coming back with these preemptive measures or, or statute. Our cities have a really difficult time figuring out, oh, okay, here comes another change from Austin. Let's go try to fix This way, there's a book of codes. I mean, the biggest concern I hear from, from the city is we're not sure how to interpret, okay? Mm -hmm. But at least, you know, as, as it continues to unfold, the bill continues to unfold, we can address how to interpret to make sure that, you know, it's very clear. Because mm -hmm. we don't want, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, you know things that are not clear that are going to, you know, cause problems for our cities, correct? Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you, appreciate it. Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Burroughs, good afternoon. Um, so I have several questions kind of how the bill is structured, and I want to ask sure. you about some specific um, circumstances, I won't call them hypotheticals because I think they're real situations and, and ask you if your, your bill would impact them. But just before I get to that, just to follow up on a couple of things uh, in terms of your colloquy with Representative Anchia, um, you mentioned oil and gas, and that was one of your concerns. I mean, did, didn't we deal with that in House Bill 40 in 2015? I mean, is that, isn't that... We did not, and of? I think Texoga is supporting this bill. I don't know if they're going to provide testimony, but they've given examples of things that we're seeing going on in Louisiana parishes that House Bill 40 would not address that I guarantee are coming in over. In Louisiana? Well, but here's it's the problem is it starts in one place. It's the same groups that they talk to each other. I've also heard about new things being threatened in El Paso, which I think there's people here to talk about. So my understanding is House Bill 40 does not completely deal and provide what we need to deal with on the protection of oil and gas. Okay. Well, I'll look forward to hearing Texoga's point of view on that because I, I thought that House Bill 40 was the, the fix to, and mind you, it was a bill I, I ended up voting against because because of some local control concerns that my city's sure. brought to me. Uh, but my understanding was the industry felt that that had solved their, their problem largely. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know why they, they 
no longer think that's the case. Um, but also following up on the discussion about India's non discrimination ordinances. Mm -hmm. So I, if, if, and I may have misheard you, but I want to make sure I'm more precise on this. Did, did you say that anything that is federally, any class is federally protected? So the way it works is the labor code specifically authorizes cities to, uh, to have their own ordinances related to any federally protected classes. And also in the property code, there's another provision, I think, that's very similar to that. So it would be federally protected classes. Okay. And I think the, the concern there would be that um, while the Supreme Court has upheld federal non-discrimination employment practices with respect to the LGBTQ community, there is not a blanket federally protected class with respect to the LGBT community. And some of these non-discrimination ordinances at the local level in terms of housing uh, and, and other areas are seeking to protect the, the LGBT. I can get you a memo on that. I have one available and happy to share it with you, but they would be protected. The cities would still be able to have those in force. So it, it, is, it is not your intent to tell a city that they cannot have a, a fair housing ordinance that protects a gay and lesbian Texans. We're not getting into that in this bill. Okay, thank you. All right, so stepping back more, just more broadly. So, I mean, the bill seems structured that you just go into several codes and then have kind of identical language in each code uh, as, uh, to, to preempt um, municipalities or counties mm -hmm. from adopting ordinances. Um, regulating conduct, quote, in a field of regulation that is occupied by a provision of this code. I mean, that's the basic construct of the bill. Is that right? I would say yes. Okay. So what, what is a field for purposes of this discussion? So this is the wonderful thing that we talked about earlier, that we have 100 years of case law that actually helps augment what we're doing here under field preemption. Field preemption is not a new or novel concept. So when we're talking about a field we occupy, clearly there are several things that we can act, we actually do occupy related to oil and gas is the example I used before, things we regulate. So that would be the field that we actually regulate. So anything, basically anything in that area of code is a field? Unless it's just a mere mention. And I think that we can, you know, if it, we just merely mention that we do something that is we're not actually occupying the field. Okay. If it's a mere mention, we're not occupying it, but if we are regulating, more than we're mentioning, if we're regulating it, we're occupying mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. So then under this legislation, if it passes, is a city preempted from adopting any regulation in that field? That would be correct. That's the, the statute is constructed. Okay. Or will um, be constructed. Okay. Um, would the bill apply only to future ordinances or would it nullify all existing? It would nullify existing ordinances. Okay. So any existing local ordinance or perspective or perspective in any of these areas of the law that we would, be, would be preempted and nullified. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, does the, does the bill apply this law? identically to general general law cities and home rule cities? It does apply, but there's a, really this probably only affects home rule cities because general law cities and counties, we are explicit what authority they have. And to be helpful to the home rule cities, they asked for a you know baseline that said we at least preserve anything that's been granted under home, uh, general law city status. And the committee substitute uh, addresses that and gives them that baseline floor. Right. Okay. And that's, that makes sense. And that, that's a good segue in my, my next area, which is kind of the history of, of home rule cities. So we're saying we've had home rule cities since I think in 1912, I think that's when uh, the, the constitution was amended to allow for home rule cities. And my understanding of that is that cities as they grew, didn't want to have to come to the legislature for every local decision mm -hmm. uh, that needed to be made. Is that a fair interpretation of the yeah, but when we enacted that in the Constitution, it also said no city ch uh, charter or any ordinance passed under said charter shall contain any provision inconsistent yes. with the Constitution of the state or the general laws enacted by the legislature of this. state. I agree it says that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just but, pointing that out. Uh, un understood. We, we, we weren't, I don't think the objective was to create many cities, many city states. I think the objective was to give some latitude. And I think the question that we 
Jerry Dean and I were talking about, Representative Dean, was have we finally gotten to the point that we have to rethink some of this, at least on the stuff over and above that we already regulate? Absolutely. But, but isn't, wasn't that amendment also a recognition that different cities have different needs? I mean, if, if every city had the exact same need at the exact same time, the legislature could just pass a law and say, you know, we're going to we're going to require you to mow your yard once every two and weeks. in 1912 i think that was definitely the case in 1914 1929 every time we've met we have decided that is the case mm -hmm. what i'm suggesting to you is we have seen such an explosion of ordinances that are far beyond what we ever could have expected that is not the historical roles of cities that it is now time to basically address this prospectively and not continue to have to come back here session after session after session okay okay well so we can talk about a few specific examples. You can tell these are concerns that were brought to me by some of my cities. Um, Non-professional, i.e., backyard fireworks displays. This is a big problem in urban areas where you know every Fourth of July, the fire department has to put out you know admonitions to please don't shoot off fireworks, and we're gonna you know the police are gonna be out in force to because people's buildings get burned down and people's fingers get blown off. Is that going to be, or is going to be able to still do that? Yes, and I can get you some more details on that. I don't know if I have that handy. I know it's <clears throat> not always easy for a pop quiz to be no, able I'm, to and I'm not trying look to, at that, but if, 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 if fireworks is what you want to talk about, I can help. Maybe when I close, get you some more information about fireworks, but they certainly retain fire control standards, which I think would apply, and we can deal with that, and this is not a firework yeah. bill. Okay. So your intent would not be to limit a city's ability to prohibit fireworks in city limits? I'm not looking to get into the firework fight in this bill. Okay. How about short-term rentals? No, I do, this, we do not regulate short-term rentals. This would not actually affect that bill. That is not in the property code. This would not apply to short-term rentals. Cities would still be able to free deal short-term rentals how they want to. Okay. Um, how about watering restrictions? Uh, it would not apply to that either. Uh, water and utilities is under Chapter 551 through 590 of the local government code, and they still get to do that. Drought is also in there somewhere. I just don't have access to that. Okay. What about animals in non-agricultural areas? Yeah, so I can tell you the animal leashes are still allowed. I met with some of the animal groups yesterday. I said I don't intend to have this to be a dog fight. I don't believe that this bill would actually apply to them. However, if they have legitimate concerns, I would sit down and work with them and their lawyers to make sure this bill does not get into the animal issues that we have dealt with in the past. This is like a fireworks bill. This is not a dog bill. Okay. And, and some cities have, you know, beyond the leash issue, um, which is an important one, but some cities have prohibitions on, you know, owning, you know, livestock in, in a residential area. Zoning is still applicable okay. to here. There's full zoning in effect. Okay. Um, what about, so um, under state law, uh, alarm systems are regulated <clears throat> in the occupations code. So and the, the police issue, so police, uh, oh, go ahead. Answer. Well, well, just different cities have different rules with respect to home and business burglary alarms um, or fire alarms. And, but, the, but they are addressed in the code. So because we're in a field in that code, would we be preempting every city's ability to? No, because they're, and I'll try to find the provision. They still have public safety, including police, fire, and jails, the ability to enact, which really is the police answering the fire alarms is what they're concerned about is my understanding. So that the local government code gives them the authority to continue to monitor and have access to the fire alarms that they want. If for some reason, you know, we can, you know, sit down and look through that, but that is uh, in there as well with public safety. So, I mean, you could you could maintain an, an ordinance where, if it's a, I'm just this is truly a hypothetical because I don't know the details of some of these ordinances, but if it's a false alarm, police are dispatched, and it was just you know, someone was careless, let their alarm go off, and didn't didn't That's stop it. They can't you're going to preempt the city's ability to address that through a fine or something like that. Chapter 341 through 370 of the local government code would allow them to maintain that. Okay. How about uh, towing and impounding? Okay, let me see if I can find that one here. Um, vehicle wrecking, salvage yards, junk cars, recycling business, flea markets, demolition business, outdoor resale tails, Chapter 234 of the local government code, they still have that ability. 
even though it's also regulated on the occupations code. We can take a look at that. Uh, you know, it's it's. I, I appreciate you being able to get ready and look at some of these examples. Yeah. I have not given a full legal analysis to each and every one. If you would like me to, happy to do that with you. No, I understand. I, I think but, but you see the point. I mean, th these are some of the concerns because well, some of these issue areas are in appear in different parts of the code, like the occupations sure. code. And, and so if we're preempting city's ability to do anything in that code, if we regulate it in some way. I, I'm a little jaded because for the first couple of days when this bill was filed, I was told pawn shops could not be regulated. And I went and did the analysis and work and showed that you still have the pawn shop authority. And you know then they turned to something else that they were upset about and something else. So I made the concession of, let's make sure general law provisions are still applicable. So what I feel like sometimes, and, and you know how this works, Every time I address one or two specific concerns somebody has in being thoughtful or point out that it's not existent, well, guess what? There's four or five things that, you know, they get addressed because I've already solved this. And some of those aren't actually in existence or real or valid concerns. It's just an attempt to undermine my bill. I understand. Well, and, and to be clear, some of this, this stuff that wasn't brought to me, these are just examples we've been... I don't want you to think that this is all stuff that's... Uh, Fair enough. ...that people are stirring up out there. Um, so, I mean, a, a, and this will be my last question for now, but uh, a city in my district, city of Mansfield, okay. uh, has an ordinance that requires electricians who do work within city limits to have an appropriate electric, electric contractor's license. Mm -hmm. That's in the occupations code. Would they, would they still be able to have that? I don't know the answer to that one. I can get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. What I can tell you is I also heard yesterday there will be no building codes left if my bill passes, part of the hyperbole of the people who do not want this. The builders are here. They can address it. We will still have building codes. We will still have regulations and things of that nature, and cities will have their own building codes. Your specific question about the city of Mansfield, happy to sit down and try to you know, give you an honest answer about how that affects or how it does not. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, Chairman. You. Representative Spiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chair Burroughs, I'm... I just want to say I'm, I love the concept and the and the premise of the bill. When I read the bill initially a few days ago, read over that, had a few concerns, addressed those with you. You've now come up with a committee substitute that that, that deals with with those issues or some of those issues. I've got a question about originally the original bill had six codes I think that were that were contained. You've you've in the committee substitute you now have eight. I think you added. Uh, the business commerce code and the property code were there uh, what's the rationale behind that were there abuses or potential abuses you're trying to address there yeah so you know first we realized especially the business and commerce code there's really no reason for it not to be applicable the things I was concerned about originally uh, you know I did actually have some concerns I wanted to make sure that we were still going to be able to have cities regulate sexual oriented businesses and found out they could so the business and commerce code was added, which I think was important. Property code was certainly something that apartment associations have been dealing with and struggling with and would like that in there for a lot of reasons. I think we can talk about some of the uh, uh, changes that have happened where we have a forcible detainer actions that have historically always existed in the state. And recently, in very recent years, those have been modified to uh, the uh, detriment of property owners. And so the property code is added to address this and I think fits nice and neatly in that. Okay. And previously, you mentioned the, uh, the Constitution and the provision under, I think, under Article 11, Section 5, that, that deals with the, basically the authorization or creation of home rule cities, basically under charters. But even when I look at that, uh, they're technically still uh, prohibited from passing any, char any ordinance or anything that's in violation of the Texas Constitution or state law. So is this... I mean, is your bill basically provide a an enforcement uh, remedy or enforcement action, or at least one that's better than we have now? Yes. It, it, it th yeah. Thank you for pointing that. Out. I mean, it, it essentially is giving power and full force to what the Texas Constitution already does and says that should happen, and we already have a cause of action available. It expands who can bring it to the associations, so they don't have to fear reprisal or retribution or retaliation from the people who actually put the ordinance on, and then just opens up the forms just a little bit to make sure they can get fair treatment in some of the courts as they bring it. So again, they don't have to suffer, you know, reprisal from, you know, their government. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Raymond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I know it's, it's a balance. Uh, I remember 
my dear friend Joe Desatel, and I wish he was still here, but I, he had some legislation. It was either last session or two sessions ago. Um, his city was contemplating or had passed an ordinance that would essentially uh, e either ban or put it very much at a disadvantage that new homes um, would less likely be able to have gas stoves, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I supported that. I, I thought Joe was right on that. And, and I wanted to ask you, for example, if you knew in my city uh, some years ago, recent years, um, they passed an ordinance that, that outlawed uh, T-shirt uh, bags. You know what the T-shirt bags are, the little bags when you go to 7-Eleven and all kinds of stuff, Walmart and everything else, the little bags, they look like a T-shirt before you pull them off and start putting groceries in them. So we outlawed, they, they outlawed them, I shouldn't say we. City Council did by ordinance. And the, the businesses, many of the businesses downtown and downtown Laredo, the historic part, barely get by. Yeah. And, and it became a very big deal because of the bags that they had to use cost so much more, right? The cost was so much more for them. And um, they had to take that all the way to the Supreme Court. It took a lot of, a lot of money a lot, and a lot of lawyers for them to, to get it up there and, and get that ordinance reversed. Uh, more recently, although I, I certainly was during COVID was a proponent of wearing masks and I wore masks, but my city passed a, an ordinance that would fine you $1,000 if you did not wear a mask. $1,000 now. Uh, you know, maybe some members on this committee would be for that. I, I was not. Yeah. And I think most people, I feel like, and by the way, my mayor is a, was a Republican and he led the fight on that. So I just want to put that on there, put that yeah. out there. So I think it's a balance and I think that's where we're trying to get to. And my guess is you may not know the answer, but were your bill to pass um, the substitute, for example, were it to pass, uh, my guess is that 90, 95% or I, I don't know what the percentage is of all the ordinances that exist right now would probably still be legal and still be in place. A thousand percent agree with that statement. And, and also thank you for talking about the small business owners. You know, that's really the face of who this bill is about, because you and I both know that we represent in both of our districts and they have, you know, put everything on the line to start up and have employees. And they are really the driving force of the economy of the state of Texas. And, you know, while the big businesses you know, are supportive of them, too, they can probably deal with and they have, you know, lawyers and people who can address this. Our small businesses truly cannot. And so when we do these types of things, and they have to be subjected even to the threat of an ordinance, even if it's not actually enforced, that's real dollars, that's real compliance costs, that's somebody else's wages, that's something that's going into our local economy that needs to go that direction. And so I'm very sympathetic to them, and I'm hoping that we're going to knock off some of the nonsense and preserve 95% of the ordinances out there so that cities can do their historic traditional functions that we support them and want them to do. Well, and I, again, I'm, I'm willing to bet that the percentage would be very high of the ordinances that would still be um, in place. And I can tell you in downtown Laredo now, the historic part, very few businesses are still open. Almost all of them are shut down and, and it's just, it's, it, it's really bad. But so all these things matter and I appreciate us trying to find that balance uh, that, and I'm trying to work with you on that, you know, and, and work with other members. And I, I appreciate the questions that have been asked uh, and, and thank you for answering them. Thank you. Any other questions for Chairman Burroughs? Mr. Chairman, can I ask you? Yeah, I represent Smithy. Something else that has kind of come up, Chairman Burroughs, that I, that I, was, I was looking at this. Uh, the remedy section in uh, section, um, let me see where it is in the bill. Anyway, the, the, the remedy is a declaratory judgment and then cost and reasonable attorney's fees. The uh, language of the, of the draft does not make it clear whether an award of attorney's fees is mandatory or discretionary with the trial court. And the other question is it, it doesn't expressly make it contingent on the claimant uh, being successful in its uh, 
your, your, your second part probably is we need to address for certain, okay. which is, you know, obviously you need to be the prevailing party yep. in order to cover attorney's fees. That's the traditional notion of this. Um, as far as discretionary mandatory, you know, welcome your thoughts on that as well. I've seen, you know, things both ways. Usually uh, you like to have some sort of mandatory, but they can only be a dollar. It's not even as mandatory. It's just a dollar they award no matter what. Yep. So I don't have strong feelings one way or the other. Now, the other comment that I would have is what... I don't think there's any provision in the bill that says, okay, if I am a business and I, I, I after this passes, okay, assuming it passes, and uh, I see a city ordinance that 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 would be uh, susceptible to to this relief, uh, it looks to me like the best procedure would be to require the claimant in that situation to uh, send a, a notice to the municipality and basically say. It's our it's my opinion this violates and and to give the, the municipality a, an opportunity to repeal the ordinance. So we do in the Texas Tort Claims Act. Yeah. I mean and, and I don't that that is somewhat in line, you know, with that. The only thing that I would be concerned about we could fix it in there is, you know, it's not you don't get penalty or thrown out because you know there's difference in having to give notices to municipalities versus counties. Yeah. And the counties is pretty draconian. If you mess up, you're going to be sanctioned. And what I would hate to do is a small business bring one of these declaratory judgments and, you know, if we just want to abate it until they've complied with yeah. the 60-day notice requirements, I don't think that's too much of a problem yeah. as long as we preserve limitations and things of that nature. My concern is, is you know, there, there's a lot of hungry lawyers in this state, yeah. as, as you're aware, and uh, there will be some lawyers who go out and look for these cases uh, yeah. in mass and file, may, may file against uh, a dozen municipalities at once just, just to try to recover attorney's fees. And so this gives an opportunity to resolve the, the dispute without the necessity of filing a court action. I mean, that's what I, th I think we probably ought to look at. It. Yeah, no, no. That's con like I said, that's consistent with all the tort claims acts that we have elsewhere. Okay. Um, I don't know that that's in the current, because the current declaratory judgment act, you may correct me if I'm wrong, contains a provision for this and allows this. And so I don't know how the current Texas tort claims act compl applies or doesn't apply already with having to give notice, but we can look at it. And for some reason, if it doesn't require the notice under the TTCA, we can, we can make sure it's clear in here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, chairman. Uh, we'll call you up and give you the right to close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. So everybody here, just to let you know, we have several, several witnesses. And so to remind everybody, we have a time clock and I've allocated three minutes and I'll help you along if you hit the red button. And then you please understand the members of the committee may have a question or two. Members, the one thing I do ask you is the old trick of was there anything else you forgot to say so that they get that supplement? I would ask you to get that out of your vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, I've been here a while. I've seen that rerun. So. At this time, our first witness will be Donnie Evans. If Donnie, you'll come to the microphone. And Donnie, if you'll state your name, your title, and where you stand on the bill. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. My name is uh, Donnie Evans. I'm a uh, builder from, a uh, home builder from Rockwell, Texas. I'm also the current president of the Texas Association of Builders. I am here to support uh, House Bill 2127. Uh, has been said numerous times today, the Texas economy is very complex. Many businesses have worked that crosses into multiple local governments every day. Uh, this is especially true with home building. Uh, our company operates in the DFW market and we have projects uh, in multiple cities and, and uh, county jurisdictions at any one time. We understand uh, there are areas where local government regulation is necessary and uh, our industry works with them every day when it comes to the residential land development, construction and remodeling. However, when it comes to employment regulations that the state or federal government has established uniform guide, guidance, rules or laws, those consistent regulations should be what we as builders should follow. Uh, House Bill 2127 ensures that the regu regulatory patchwork 
that could ensue from 254 counties and over a thousand cities uh, all over trying to regulate employment or other areas that are not traditionally regulated by local government does not become a burden to our industry, uh, especially as those regulations could actually affect the ability of our member companies across the state to provide safe, affordable housing for our rep excuse me, a rapidly growing state. Uh, I ask for your support, House Bill 2127, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Alex Burnell. And Alex, state your name, who you're with, and your position on the bill. Sure. One second. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. My name's Alex Burnell. I'm the advocacy director at Move Texas, and I'm against the bill. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Alex Brunell. I'm testifying against House Bill 2127 on behalf of the organization Move Texas. We built power for young people at the state and local level through voter registration and grassroots issue campaigns. HB 2127 is what many are referring to as the local, uh, ending local freedom act because that, it does just that. It is a direct and overt attack by politicians to slash people's freedoms to pass local rules for their own communities. Specifically, the bill prohibits city and county governments from passing or enforcing basic protections and guidelines on a, way, on a wide range of issues, such as safety protections for construction workers, sanitation and pest control, and potentially disaster and public health emergencies, and even fundamental civil rights protections. Sweeping preemption like this is a democracy problem. To make matters worse, the bill also lets any pers private person or business bring a lawsuit against a neighboring county or, or, or local jurisdiction for passing policies related to the ones I just mentioned or many others. The bill also strips local officials of governmental immunity, meaning city leaders can be personally sued for policies their communities have advocated for. This threat comes at a time when Jesse Jackson used to say, cities have more and more responsibility and less and less power. The power to sue so flippantly and freely could have disastrous implications. For example, for how this, from how this bill reads, if a local official passes a law in Hidalgo County banning the use of an environmentally harmful pesticide, a pesticide producer from a different county can sue that person in their personal capacity. If another city repeals a tax on a certain product or service in their respective locality, a person from across the state can sue to prevent that repeal. Simply, it's nonsense. HB 2127 is a direct attack on traditional local control and allows for a one-size-fits-all policy approach. In the end, the person who is hurt is the local taxpayer, the petition signer, the believer in grassroots democratic action. That is why I and so many others encourage you to oppose HB 2127. Texans' freedom to have a say in their local communities should be a cherished and protected right. State lawmakers should do all they can to preserve local governments and acknowledge that statewide decisions are not always best for local communities. I'll finish with this. What's best in Corpus isn't necessarily what's best for Dallas. What's best for Lubbock can't always be what's said for Austin. And the avenues to create examples of good governance shouldn't be closed upon. Please leave our local communities alone and vote against this bill. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. John, thank you for assisting right there. Next, Scott Norman. Scott, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. 
Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Scott Norman. I'm executive director of the Texas Association of Builders. I'm here uh, here very much in support of House Bill 2127. I want to thank uh, Chairman Burroughs and the joint authors for bringing this legislation. Obviously, this concept has been debated for several sessions now and appreciate uh, his new approach in doing so. I will not steal the thunder from our state president, Mr. Evans, I think did a good job. Um, our reasons for this um, from the home building perspective really come down to what we've seen is on the employment side. Um, Chair Chairman Turner, you were mentioning uh, building codes and things like that. Local government code is not touched by this bill and there are explicit grants to local amendments for the electrical code and the plumbing code that are found in the occupations code, the building codes. Um, allow for local amendments, the energy code allow for local amendments, and so this bill doesn't touch that. Our industry more than, you know, or as much as any other interfaces with local governments every day, from the land development, platting, permitting, uh, building codes, inspections, all of those things, um, they're still allowed by city government. We recognize city government engages in that. But when it comes to employment standards, when we have employees and our subcontractors who are actually building the homes, have employees in dozens of cities every day building houses, it's impossible just from an administrative concept to, uh, to comply with varying employment regulations. We need a uniform set of regulations um, on the employment side. And that's why we're supporting this legislation um, and appreciate and your consideration and support. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, members? Representative Anchia. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, yes, sir. A couple of years ago, I passed a bill for Dallas County that permitted the county to um, uh, score uh, any uh, <coughs> RFP responses uh, according to whether or not they offered their employees um, health care, health insurance. Um, would that be impacted by this uh, by this well, bill? We're home builders, so we don't do a lot of government work. Um, so I'm not an expert on that. I think there may be some people from AGC that might can speak better. But the way I understand the concept. Or do you also do commercial building? No. None we do at all? We do res single family residential, okay. some multifamily, private sector. Then, then don't worry about it. I'll ask somebody else. Okay. But I will say globally, anything, it's my understanding, if, the, if there is state law granting authority to a local government, the concept of this legislation is that grant continues if there's state law in the bill or, or in, in statute that gives local government power, even in a preempted field, I would think. But the chairman can answer that better than I can. Any other? Oh, Representative Turner. Thank you, Chairman. Just, just to make sure I understand your, your testimony, you said that you think the bill is needed because it would help you with respect to labor-related ordinances, workforce-related ordinances That's across right. the state? Okay. Can you either, you know, more in the future, who knows what's coming down in the future if we had a patchwork of regulation? Okay. Well, so tell me, about, are, there, are there problematic ordinances right now that you're concerned about, or is this... Well, I think page sick leave was a high-profile example, and y'all talked about the the litigation history of that. Um, but there has been others that you're talking about paid sick leave is that paid sick leave? Yes, sir, was one that we had concerns with, um, and more the concept of these issues, whatever they may be, um, and and a lot of them may have merit. But I think the forum for debate is on the state level, and the state needs to address these issues, whether that be minimum wage whether that be paid sick leave, maternity leave, whatever these things are. It's the varying decisions made by local governments that affect cities operating in multiple jurisdictions. Many of those cities are not constituents in those cities and don't even have a voice in the democratic process at all in that city. Um, so yes, that's an employment. Other is predictive scheduling that uh, some cities in other states have done um, that try to dictate how they handle scheduling of employees. That's one of them. I think some other witnesses coming can probably speak better than this, than I can, Chairman Turner, but uh, those are a couple. Okay. Yeah, I just want to, and I understand your argument. I just want to understand what the specifics are that, that are areas of concern. So I heard three there, paid sick leave, minimum wage, and predictive scheduling. Okay, sir. Thank you. Other questions? Rare, uh, Speaker Garrett. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott, didn't I pass a bill that said we uh, you can't set minimum wage uh, in the cities? That uh, that's the state's purview. Yes, sir, that is we correct. And I think that, there's a bill. That's right. But that is an example of a bill. There's bills filed every session, including this session, trying to undo that and allow local governments to to set a minimum wage. And and that's a debate y'all need to have as legislators. Well, and we would have to because it's a state law that that's they correct. cannot set minimum wage. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes, we were, and we still are. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, Jeff Coyle. Jeff, state your name, your position, and and your where you stand on the bill. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Coyle. I'm an assistant city manager for the city of San Antonio, and we are opposed to HB 2127. I want to first acknowledge that the committee substitute is better and thank Chairman Burroughs. We were concerned when policies was included. We have a policy internally to give down payment assistance to first responders who buy a house within our city limits. We we're afraid that things like that, personnel policies might go away. So we're grateful for the change. Like a lot of people in the room, I think we have spent weeks trying to make sense of this bill. We've literally had a team of attorneys going, combing through every single code, and that was before more codes were added to the committee sub, uh, trying to identify fields that may preempt some of the local ordinances that, is, that our community has asked us to follow. It's just as you were doing, Representative Turner, it's an exercise in exhaustion to go through all the what ifs. Um, we have not, none of that exercise has led to clarity for us. It's led to more questions. Uh, just a few of the questions, for example, is the occupations code addresses heavy commercial vehicles. So does that mean the city will no longer be able to regulate which roads those vehicles travel on or where they park at our airport? Uh, hazardous materials are referenced in several codes. Can we not prohibit the disposal of certain hazardous materials in our municipal sewer system? Uh, the chairman, the author of the bill mentioned that door-to-door -door sales was protected, but it's in the business and commerce code. So does that mean our peddler's ordinance where we require a license to sell door-to-door -door and importantly prohibit a felon from getting that license? Can we no longer do that? Some of these uh, may have authorizations in statute, uh, but the cross-reference is complicated and difficult and anything but clear. And I would think as a, as a state government, state law, we want to be clear so that people understand what it is they need to follow. Uh, the questions then that we're asking ultimately don't get answered here uh, or in our community. They get answered in the court by somebody who sues us and challenges us. The business that's dumping chemicals in our sewer or the felon who wants to sell door to door can sue the city, and even if we're successful and don't have to pay their fees, we still have to go through that expense and difficulty to be able to prove that we have that authority to regulate. So all of that to us leaves two really big overarching questions. The first is if all of these important ordinances to protect public health and safety are in fact preserved, then what does this bill do? We agree with you, the, the paid sick leave and the local employment regulations, that issue's settled. We don't have an ordinance. We don't intend to implement one. Uh, and, and that's just not an issue. We don't have a bag ban, which also the courts have addressed. We don't regulate gas stoves. We're in San Antonio wondering what this actually does and why we can't be more prescriptive about whatever issues we're trying to solve. Thank, thank you, you Chairman. Any questions of the witness, Representative Anchia? Uh, thank you, thank you for your testimony today. You know it. I know that from the author's perspective, it feels like whack-a-mole, but when you put a bill like this out in the world, the fact patterns are endless, right? I mean, you know, when people say oftentimes, well, I don't want to deal with hypotheticals. Well, you have to deal with hypotheticals because everything now, once this bill is out in the world, is going to be litigated ultimately. Exactly right. And the city of San Antonio is going to get dragged into court not even in, in Bear County. You're going to get dragged into court potentially in adjacent counties, right? If, if somebody doesn't like what you're, you're doing in regulation, even, it, even though it doesn't impact the people in an adjacent county, you're still going to get dragged there. And it's going to require resources. It's going to require um, time. I mean, it's hard enough for city attorneys, oftentimes understaffed, to even get to the Bear County Courthouse. I, I can imagine having to take a couple of days to, to, to go to a, 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 a county seat, maybe miles and miles away, uh, to try to defend a, a, an ordinance. Um, so I'm sympathetic to you, candidly, because uh, when, when you put a bill like this, a sweeping, a very broad bill like this, it's not narrow, it's, it, you know, um, you put this out into the world, then you're going to get a lot of litigation. Um, and uh, it's going to cause cities to have to defend litigation all over the place, in multiple counties. How many, how many counties about Bear County? 
Uh, four or five yeah. counties, I think. Yeah, so you could be, you know, in, in the courts in four or five different counties trying to deal with the ordinances that your, um, your residents have asked you to pass and enforce. It always bugs me, too, when people come up here and sort of cite um, you know, these boogeymen, right? Well, we've got this thing over here in Oklahoma or Louisiana. I can't really even describe, but that's a problem. Paid sick leave, which has never, you know, gone into force in this state, or even talking about minimum wage, which Charlie clearly preempted in his bill, or even oil and gas, which HB 40 preempted. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm scared about aliens sometimes, you know? I'm scared about alien abduction. Uh, but I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to legislate something, even though, you know, be, be, even though I'm scared about it. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm have this sort of um, this, this illusory concern. And, you know, so it really just bugs me when people come up here and and offer up these these, you know, boogeymen that don't even exist in Texas to suddenly try to legislate and, and impact local cities. Um, what is, is you, you just confirm for me and I think you did in your testimony. Paid sick leave is done. It's ball game. Right. Not going to happen in Texas, right? And it was brought to us by petition. Our city government didn't even initiate it. Right. We responded to a petition that was brought under the laws of the state. <laughs> under the laws of the state and your home, uh, your your uh, your probably your city charter that has initiative and rep referendum, right. right? Right. Okay. Thank you. And I and I will just add, if I could, Representative. Please. That, um, nothing gets done easily in local government. For those of you, Representative Dean, who have been in that world. When we propose an ordinance, we hear from every stakeholder in our community and they have direct access to our government. It is very difficult to do things. We don't recklessly, haphazardly do things to hurt the economy of the state and certainly of our own city. And I think it's working as it is today with the specific things that the legislature has decided it needs to step in and fix. And what would your incentive be to do that? To kill your own economy, right? What, what, I mean, the city of San Antonio has to compete against every other big city in the state and every other you know city in the union to try to have uh, to try to be a place where 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 businesses want to come you know I'm, I, with respect to local control i'm i'm all about people truly con competing locally to try to create the business environment to attract businesses and guess what if they get it wrong they're going to come to places if san antonio gets it wrong they're going to go to places like dallas or phoenix or somewhere else right and ultimately that marketplace works in my view Anyway, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Jeffrey Thompson. And Jeffrey, if you'll state your name your title and your position on the bill. Um, I am Jeffrey Thompson, a leader with Central Texas Interfaith, which is one of the 10 Industrial Areas Foundation organizations in Texas. Uh, I am opposed to this bill. Um, by the way, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, we are opposed to Bill 2127 because, as written, it has great potential to be harmful to some of the most vulnerable and marginalized folks here in Texas. I'm referring to the fact that uh, if it becomes law, it possibly will do away with some of the protections that counties and municipalities in Texas have put in place concerning payday lending, uh, raising the minimum wage, and workforce development at the local level. Uh, the payday and car title loans prey upon the working poor, uh, charging them hundreds of percents of interest uh, and fees above what is borrowed on those short-term loans. Thousands of Texans lose their cars every year to these kinds of loans. According to uh, Texas Appleseed and the Texas Fair Lending Alliance, payday lending and auto title loans have drained $16 billion from the uh, Texas economy since 2012. $16 billion that could be used by low-income residents uh, to spend on goods and services. As far as the minimum wage goes, uh, it keeps people in poverty. Uh, according to the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, more than half of the 
folks who earn minimum wage are over the age of 24. That's simply not acceptable. People cannot survive in our economy on approximately $15,000 a year. Multiple municipalities and, uh, and counties in Texas have increased their minimum wages to help ensure that their workers will not live in poverty. And on the issue of workforce development, if a county or municipality has rules that differ from those of the labor and occupation code, such as earmarking money for specific workforce related items, then that could be an opening for a lawsuits. Uh, that would adversely affect their ability to fund education or for motivated students. Uh, the Industrial Areas Foundation partners with uh, live workforce projects across the state that could be affected. Um, for example, uh, Capital Idea here in Central Texas. We are aware the needs of our Texas communities are different. It is important for our municipalities and counties to have the ability to represent their constituents. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Jeffrey. Representative Turner. Thank you. Pastor, thank you for your testimony. Uh, and I really appreciate you raising the issue of, of, of payday lending. Uh, there's so many facets to, to potentially to this bill and, and uh, that's one we need to, to focus on some because um, I, I appreciate you bringing this figure. And I think it just bears repeating that, that payday and auto title lending has drained $16 billion from the Texas economy since 2012. That, that is your testimony, right? That's right. Okay. And, and, and that corresponds with anecdotally what I've heard in my community over the years uh, serving in the House is that uh, payday lending and the exorbitant interest and in fees uh, that uh, the borrower uh, is assessed uh, inhibits their ability to pay rent, inhibits their ability to make a car payment, to buy groceries by other goods and services. So am I right in that in a bill talking about or ostensibly about strengthening the Texas economy and, um, and ensuring we have a, have a strong economy, undermining payday lending ordinances, doesn't that in fact serve to weaken our state's economy, at least in many communities around the state? Oh, very definitely, very definitely. Uh, we we uh, pose this for that very reason, uh, or one of the very reasons, um, payday lending is a predatory sort of thing. And uh, people uh, just don't have the money to use for essential things if they have to pay these exorbitant bills. They, they multiply. They multiply time and time again. Yeah. Um, did I answer your question? You, you, you did, and I, and I appreciate you, you you raising it. I just would point out, it, it came up a little bit in the in the bill author's um, layout of the bill, and I, I think he said that he thinks the payday lending ordinances are already un, are already unconstitutional under the law. But I would just point out that many cities, including the two that I represent, or two of the three that I represent, um, have had payday lending ordinances on the books for many years, and, and they have stood. Uh, and, and so I think the um, clearly, the, the courts have not ruled them to be unconstitutional, and, um, and clearly they're having a positive impact uh, from everything I can see in my community. So I appreciate you, you raising this issue. Okay, thank you. Other questions, members? Thank you very much. Next, Martin Gutierrez. And Martin, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Yes, uh, Martin Gutierrez. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is comprised of more than 900 members, mostly small, locally owned minority businesses. And we are here in support of the bill. And I want to thank Chairman Burroughs for his leadership on the bill. Our current belief is there are already state and federal laws related to private employment practices, such as employment leave, hiring practices, employment benefits, or scheduling practices. 
We strongly believe that the state and federal level of governments is where matters related to private employment practices should be handled. Local municipal ordinances regulating employment practices create patchwork regulations and regulatory enforcement powers that are inconsistent with the state of Texas and federal government. Local ordinances regulating private employment practice make it difficult for our small business members to navigate the regulatory landscape, especially in the area of San Antonio where we have 25 or so surrounding suburban cities. Most importantly, like this, ordinances stifle growth and directly impact the bottom line of many of our small businesses. Most important, we believe this bill would make it easier for businesses to operate across the state of Texas, and therefore the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and our more than 900 members uh, ask for your favorable consideration of House Bill 2127. Thank you very much. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Patrick Brophy. Patrick B R O P H E Y. Going, going, Patrick Brophy. We will note for the record Patrick Brophy, North Texas Commission, registered against HB 2127. Again, Patrick Brophy. All right, Ann, and I may be, I may mispronounce Badur, B-A-D-D-O-U-R. And state your name, your position on the bill, and your title. Um, thank you, Chairman. My name is Ann Badur, and I'm the director of the Fair Financial Services Project at Texas Appleseed, and I'm here to testify in opposition to House Bill 2127. And a few people now have mentioned the payday and auto title lending issue, and that's our top level concern with this bill. You know, many members on this committee have these ordinances that have been adopted in your communities that put fair standards into place for payday and auto title loans. As a previous speaker mentioned, they've drained, he mentioned 16 billion. That's actually a, a little bit of an old figure. Um, if we go for the past decade, it's over $18 billion from the pockets of the most vulnerable Texans. In addition, I've included in my handout an economic impact analysis that the Perryman Group conducted that, that in addition to that very personal impact, it has a drain on local economies. So this is a business that is largely not small businesses. They're largely businesses, many of them based out of state, that pull money out of the pockets of vulnerable Texans as well as the businesses in our community. So this means people don't have money to go to their local restaurant because they're struggling in debt. People don't have money to buy from their local hardware store because they can't even afford to make rent because they're stuck in a payday or an auto title loan. Um, these loans have caused over 374,000 Texans to lose their car to lose their ability to go to work. And I wanna tell you about one Texan who contacted me shortly before Christmas. He's a small business owner in North Texas. He owns a truck and he has an electric business. He's an electrician. He needed a little extra cash, so he went to an auto title lender and he went ahead and took out $7,000 because they told him that it was a 10% interest loan. And in fact, the interest on these loans is 10%, but the fees are exorbitant. He ended up in a loan that cost him $2,500 a month in payments just to maintain fees on the loan. And what he thought was a $1,700 finance charge ended up being $17,000. He lost his truck, and with that, he lost his business. So these ordinances support small businesses. There's nothing, as, as um, Representative Turner mentioned, these have stood up. They're in 47 city, 49 cities, from Midland to Amarillo to Bryan College Station, Waco. Every area of the city, San Angelo of the state, has one of these ordinances, and it's working. You know, it's not what we want. It would be great to have a beneficial and meaningful statewide policy, but for the past 15 years, people have come, been coming to this, to this chamber, and bills have been proposed, but nothing moves. 
communities are struggling, charities are struggling, it's draining money. And so it's in the economic and very local economic interest of to have these ordinances. And we'd be extremely concerned if they were overturned by this, by this bill. It's erasing advocacy from faith leaders across Texas. I mean, think, think about it, Midland, Waco, Houston, Dallas, Austin, <laughs> San Angelo, and it's undermining our local communities. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do you all have any questions? Representative Dean. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ma'am, thank you for coming. And I know I'm, I'm, the pastor was here earlier about payday lending. Um, but we have many cities that already have payday lending. Are, are you suggesting that with uh, 2127 that the state's going to go undo a bunch of payday lending ordinances? That's the effect that the... Okay, where, where do you get that from? What, sure. the, who the is field, telling you this? The field preemption of the, of the Texas Finance Code, that provision in the bill, because right now payday and auto title loan businesses have some registration and licensing under Chapter 393 of the Texas Finance Code. And these ordinances and courts have already found in, in judgments that we've seen so far that they exist parallel, so they don't undermine or conflict with state law. Um, and But with that broad field preemption, it would state that the very lax and, and minimal regulations that exist under Chapter 393 would preempt all the work that these 49 municipalities have done to bring some modicum of fairness to the market. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree with that. And, and I think it's already encoded. I think uh, the chairman in his layout mentioned that that was not the intent of the bill, but we will ask those questions. But uh, in my city, we created the bill, uh, the, the payday lending bill, and, and it was for the protection and the safety of our citizens, okay? And, and uh, I wish I had a copy of it I could give you. I can give it to you and, and look at it and see it's not onerous, but it does yeah. protect the citizens. And, you know, that's, in, in my opinion, there's some things of the bill that, uh, that, that we're working with, but I don't see it. And I listened to the Senate, um, you know, and I think you testified at the Senate yesterday, yeah, and that came up over and over and over again. And, and I don't read that to be the intent here, okay? Uh, so, and, and it's really unfortunate. What, what finally got us to the, to the point of having to create an ordinance is because you, you do have loan sharks, okay? And it's important to understand that people that are in a very distressed situation, a tough financial position, they, they don't go to one of these payday lenders, they go to a loan shark. And if you think the interest rates are bad at the payday lender, what do you think it is with the loan sharks they go to? Okay, so no matter what we do, we're not gonna completely solve that problem. We, 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 we may push them to a different source, but it's gonna happen. And the best thing we can do is try to do the best job we can to, to slow it. But are we gonna stop it? Because people that are hard up are going to go. It's just like the drug addict. They're going to find somewhere to go get their drug. They're going to find somewhere else to go get their money, and it's going to cost them a lot more money as well. So thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if I, can I respond? You know, that, that's an issue that's, I mean, in some ways I feel like the whole idea that people will go to some kind of underground place is a little bit of a boogeyman in our experience. So we've been working on this issue for a number of years with communities. And what we found is that when these ordinances are adopted, oftentimes communities step up and they offer better loan products. The local financial institutions step up. At this point in time, six of the eight largest banks in the country are offering affordable small dollar loans. There are loans being offered through credit unions, um, state regulated finance companies. And so, and, and, and in addition, the charitable community steps up because a lot of times people might need money for, for rent or other things. And what the charitable communities were finding is that when someone would come to them for rent assistance and they found that they had a payday loan, any amount of money they gave them was going to nothing. And so I think a beneficial result of these ordinances has been communities coming together and lots of folks stepping up to say, okay, this is not what we want for our community. Let's make it better. Right. And I know we're on a time clock, yeah. so I'm going to make of this course. real quick and short. There is not a boogeyman. 
real world is people that are in a desperate situation, they go until they find the money they need to do whatever it is they're trying to go do. And when you talk about lending institutions and various you know, businesses that are going to loan money to people in a distressed situation, you know, it, it all goes back down to the financial records and a lot of other things. And it's very admirable and great that, chair, you know, my church, you know, we, we have a, an organization that does that, okay? But, you know, it's, it's done in such a way that they know they might not ever get paid back, but it's to help and assist. But I, I think, you know, the, the, uh, the boogeyman about payday lending is just that. I mean, most cities already have an ordinance addressing this. Thank you very much for being yeah. here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you, ma'am. Mont McClendon. Mont, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Mont McClendon. I live and work in Lubbock, Texas, but today I'm here on behalf of the Texas Apartment Association testifying in support of House Bill 2127. First, I want to thank Chairman Burroughs for bringing this bill forward and say that we appreciate his leadership in helping to rein in local regulatory overreach. For several years, TAA has been part of ASSET, or the Alliance for Securing and Strengthening the Economy in Texas. This nonprofit coalition has advocated for the protection of Texas job creators, from some regulations that interfere with the employee and employer relationship and the economic policies that have made Texas the best state in which to do business. House Bill 2027 is a positive step for Texas. It will provide statewide clarity that it's the legislator's responsibility to ensure that Texas regulatory and economic policies are consistent and streamlined. This helps Texas to continue to grow and house more people. TA sports policies like House Bill 2127 that recognize the role of state government to protecting rental housing availability and supporting housing for all Texans. Each cost of regulation adds to the cost of rent. Rent goes towards paying office staff and maintenance staff, housekeepers, exterminators, landscapers, trash removal, and other third party service providers who make rental homes livable. Rent also goes towards local taxes that support education and local community services. TA is almost 12,000 members, the majority of whom are privately held companies, house 7 million Texans, and directly employ 75,000. Small, independent rental property owners who account for about half of all rental properties are most severely impacted by a complicated system of overlapping regulation. The law regarding housing and property ownership has become more complicated due in large part to shifting and often inconsistent policies handed down by state, local, and federal government. Ensuring that we have statewide rules reduces confusion and unintended consequences that impact housing affordability and availability. House Bill 2027, 2127 sets the stage for a fair play on a consistent, predictable field. It defines the proper role of local government, which should be focused on providing primary services like good roads and utilities and responsive police and fire departments to help protect citizens and keep them safe. Thank you for listening, and that concludes my comments unless there are questions. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Judy Gradford. Judy, if you'll state your name, your title, and uh, your position on the bill. My name is Judy Gradford. Um, I am a private citizen and I am opposed to this bill. Um, my main concern about this bill is its attack on our democracy and on the, um, the voice of the people that gets represented in, in the work that's done in our cities and localities. And I think, um, that this bill is so broad in its, in its scope um, and so um, chilling in its impact on, on local governments and on uh, citizen efforts in local go governments. We see all these ordinances um, take place because frankly, you guys are not doing your job. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, 
we, 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 it's, it's true that many of these issues could well be addressed through, through the state, but they're not. And people are suffering, people are, are, are need, in need of uh, environmental protection, they're in need of protection of their, of their civil and economic rights, and all of these are directly threatened by this legislation. So I am, I'm, I'm deeply opposed to it. And I believe that um, most, most citizens of the cities and municipalities that are affected by this um, share my opinion. And um, I don't see that, uh, you know, I don't know when the, the state of Texas became big brother, but um, this, is, this is not democratic and uh, this is anti-American and it should be un-Texan. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you. Carol Olawan, I think I'm saying that O L E W I N. Carol O L E W I N. Here we go, Carol Olawan, O-L-E-W-I-N. Okay, we notice she's not here, but she did register League of Women Voters of Texas against HB 2127. Rick Levy. Rick, if you'll state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Rick Levy. I'm the president of the Texas AFL-CIO, and I'm here testifying in opposition to House Bill 2127. Um, so I have a little bit of a different view than I think the author of the bill about Texas and the patchwork quilt. Um, I think Texas is an amazing place, and one of the reasons why it's amazing is because we are a patchwork quilt. So many different communities. Rick. Yes. Can you talk? I know you're a little taller, but can you put that up? Handsome and tall. Yes, yes, yes. See if that is, you know, make sure we got it. I'm not going to be silent by go. this committee, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Would you continue with your handsome presentation? Thank you, sir. I need 27 seconds back. Don't worry. <laughs> I want you to be beep so I can extend. Okay. <laughs> Get a hold At any rate, I do have a different view uh, that, uh, that the, it's the patchwork of Texas that makes it so special and that we should be preserving the ability of local communities to reflect the nature of their character and not be legislating how their communities need to operate from Austin. My sense is, as a stu studied observer, that I'm not going to convince the author of the bill of my view on that issue during this three minutes, during this two minutes and 17 seconds. So I just want to talk about, like very specifically, a couple of the things that I think the bill may or may not be attempting to do, but does do. Number one, I don't know why it's so difficult that um, workers would be entitled to a rest break in two communities in Texas. I don't know what kind of, uh, for 10 minutes, construction workers who work outside. There's two ordinances in this state that require that, and those would immediately go away. I don't know what kind of burden that places on employers. I know what kind of burden not getting that places on workers, and it's deadly. Um, with respect to the non-discrimination ordinances, I don't think it's at all clear uh, that those measures are protected by this bill that what the local government code says is or what the labor code says is that they are free to adopt anything that is consistent in federal or state law to the extent that those laws change or to the extent that local communities provide explicit protections for lesbian and gay texans or trans texans in employment they would not be um, protected um, subject to the interpretations of, of federal law. So I think that is something that it'd be very easy to clarify, Mr. Chairman, that those things are just not addressed at all uh, by the bill. The other thing that isn't addressed in the bill that I think have been addressed in past things that I think are important is that cities uh, and counties do things through their own proprietary and contracting interests. So if you're a county and you want to say, um, when we give you a contract for work, 
we want you to provide health insurance to those employees because we don't want to pay for this work and then also pay for the health care of your of these employees when they come to our public Damn. go ahead hospital um, there you go um, and so I think we can put in a specific, ex uh, which I don't think is the intent to build, that we can put in something specifically around making sure that those things exist. And then the thing that uh, Chairman Smithy referenced that I think is so important, this is so broad, um, the, the incentive for litigation is so strong, the, un the, the lack of clarity about what really is covered in these things. You know, I heard the chairman talk about, well, yes, it's in this code, but it also says you can do it here. Those are going to be the things that are going to be litigated every step of the way. And we're just going to create this wild west of, of litigation that's going to hamstring cities to be able to, and counties to do anything at all. Look, I, I'm, this is, I'm going to wrap it up, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, you know, we don't like the bill, but I think what the bill is trying to do can be done without all of the collateral damage that I think the way it is structured would do. I thank the chair for his forbearance um, for my tardy nature to my wrapping it up but thank you happy to answer any questions questions for the witness yeah representative turner thank you chairman. Uh, thank you mr levy um with res you kind of honed in on rest breaks uh there's one of your primary concerns so you said two cities have i, I guess adopted an, an ordinance requiring rest breaks in certain uh industries is that is yeah, that in, right in construction so uh, Dallas and Austin say that if you're working construction, then you're entitled to a 10-minute rest break for water um, every, for every four hours that you work. For every four hours. Yes, sir. So, so, so typically those are jobs outside. Um, probably gets up to be pretty pretty hot in, in many months of the year. Uh, yes, sir. And and so it's a opportunity for workers who are doing hard manual labor. To, to get a few minutes of rest and, and get some water. Yeah. That's essentially the, the goal of, of that policy. That's all it does. Okay. And do, do you know, did uh, the cities that adopted those ordinances, was that in response to um, a certain problem? Were they trying to solve a specific problem? I think they're willing. I think you'll hear other witnesses talk about the fact that people are literally dying as a result of not having that. And that these ordinances, um, don't appear to me to be so burdensome to act, to cripple the local economy that a local jurisdiction could res could respond to this problem of people dying without um, running afoul of state law. Okay, and, and and we heard some earlier testimony that it not and I want to be clear it was not specific to the rest break policy. It was in reference to some other policies, but that having a, a patchwork of policies is confusing and is burdensome is it do you, do you agree with that is it confusing to to an employer to allow for rest break within the city of dallas or city of boston um i have been an employer and i don't think i would be i, I don't think i would be confused by that but it's not it's not just that like for example last session we had a really big debate around the crown act um you know which is a discrimination based on hair styles represent bowers bill represented bowers bill and um we talked about, you know, that's not specifically covered by federal or state law. So those le those local ordinances that have been passed in response to that very serious problem would be invalidated by this legislation. I don't know that that's the intent, but I do know that that's, that would be the impact. And so that's the concern. All right, thank you. Any other? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lisa Fullerton. Lisa Fullerton. Sorry, she's not here. Oh, here. We still have to, I have to announce. One more time, Lisa Fullerton. She's been listed and registered president and CEO self for HB 2127. She's registered, but noted not here. Genevieve Collins. Genevieve Collins.
Genevieve Collins. We'll note she's not here, but registered state director, Americans for Prosperity and Self, HB 2127. She's for. Skeeter Miller. Skeeter, uh, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the committee today. Uh, my name is Skeeter Miller. I represent myself and the County Line Restaurants, and I'm here to testify in favor of HB 2127. I've owned and operated the County Line Restaurants for over 47 years across the state of Texas, and I'm proudest of the fact that our average employee tenure is 37 years. We have fixed work schedules with freedom to substitute and shift trade. I've, I have bonus programs, insurance for my employees, employee meals, IRA matching funds for those who qualify. And I've given out over half a million dollars to employees with interest free uh, loans that for those in need. Uh, I believe in my employees. They're the heart. They're the heart and soul of my business. I've survived. I've survived a lot over 47 years in this industry. Two years of COVID and closures in one location cost me $2.7 million a year for two years. Now supply chain issues and shortages, inflation, in just one of my locations, year over year cost increased utilities, 32,000, just beef and pork ribs alone have cost me over 260,000 in additional cost. Our labor costs are up $206,000. Those three items total about $498,000 in increased cost in one year. We've hit the wall on menu price increases. I hear a lot, I hear a lot of people say that, hey, all you have to do is raise your prices. Uh, we've hit the wall on that. It's, there's only so much somebody will pay for a plate of barbecue. So having consistent employ, employment regulations is essential in our efforts to recover. When it comes to benefits and policies, we need to rely on the federal and state policies to be our guidelines. Having local authorities dictate labor policy and regulation creates a patchwork of regulation and is becoming cost prohibitive to administer. Uh, between Austin and San Antonio, I have four county lines and two fly right chickens, and I also operate in Albuquerque and El Paso, which is six feet over the line in New Mexico, and I deal with a bunch of different policies, and sometimes it, in those areas it gets kind of boogered up. With different rules and regulations, it's virtually impossible to administrate and keep up with multiple employment policies, not to mention the cost to administer it. We need consistent employment regulation in order to succeed once again. I appreciate you letting me speak today. Do you have any questions for me? Thank you. Any questions? Representative Metcalf. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. You did have a restaurant in my community, and we miss you. We want you to come back. But you touched on how you have an operation on the border yes. line at Albuquerque and uh, Texas and New Mexico. Is that correct? That's correct. What can you tell us about the way New Mexico has dealt with these issues and the impact that it has on your business? Well, they just passed uh, employment policies on us 45 days out from when it went, in, went into effect. Uh, we have uh, paid sick leave that we have to pay. We also have in Albuquerque itself, I have minimum wage and a tip wage that I have to pay. And just over the line in Bernalillo County, I have a complete different set of rules for uh, for our, our minimum wage and our shift pay. And then also in El Paso, obviously I'm six feet over the line in New Mexico. So I'm dealing with what's happening in El Paso, just working for him, just to get employees. And then I have a separate set of rules in New Mexico in that area is another wage that I have to pay and tip wage. So I've got a lot of a lot of things that I'm working with and administratively it's probably cost me over $150,000 just to set up computer programming to be able to 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 handle that. Uh, it's 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 pretty amazing. That sounds like a nightmare. Um, I understand some cities and counties have adopted predictive scheduling policies. Yes. Uh, which would not be allowed under this bill that we have in front of us today. Can you explain what predictive scheduling policies think, are think, and how they impact your yeah. restaurant? Predictive scheduling is a pretty scary thing. And, and in our industry, you never know in the restaurant business 
how busy you're going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. You have an idea of what it's going to be like, but predictive scheduling in most cases is you have to set your schedule two weeks out. That's when the employee is going to come in and when they're going to leave. And any day of the, of the week, you could have a snowstorm, you could have slow business, you could have it, at my county line on 2222, many times I have a car accident on that road to where we're shut down. If I let those employees go home early, I have to pay them time and a half for the period of time that I said that they were going to work. Wow. If you have a snow day, which we know what that is, uh, I have to, and I've scheduled those employees, I have to pay those employees for that period of time that I scheduled them in that two week period. It just, it just doesn't work. And our employees, I've talked to them about that and they don't want their schedule to be set that way. They wanna be able to <clears throat> substitute, go to ACL, do the things that they wanna do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Mr. Chairman. Speaker Garrett. Thank you for representing yours and my business because it is tough right now. Yes, it is. Thank you. You bet, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Lynn Hendricks. Lynn Hendricks. Lynn Hendricks. Will note, uh, did not testify, but registered for herself against HB 2127. David Stout. David Stout. David Stout will note that he is not present, but registered as county commissioner, El Paso County against. Laura Morrison. And Laura, state your name, your title and position on the bill. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Hunter and members of the committee. My name is Laura Morrison and I'm an assistant city attorney for the city of Dallas. And I'm here to speak um, in opposition to the bill. Uh, while Dallas understands the intent of House Bill 2127, we have many concerns about its un unintended consequences and vagueness. Texas residents depend on local regulation to protect their safety, property, community, and environment. Indeed, the state and its residents largely depend on local efforts to preserve local agriculture, regulate animals, and protect local water supply as local governments can tailor their regulations to benefit their residents and the priorities of their communities. Though the reference Texas codes in this bill broadly touch on a variety of subject matters, under current law, they do not conflict with or preempt local regulations. If this bill passes, Texans will find themselves suddenly deprived of the local protections they rely on, and state legislators such as yourselves would find your, themselves shouldering the, response, the responsibility of filling in the gaps created by this bill. The unintended consequences of the bill are exacerbated further by its vagueness. HB 2127 does not clarify what constitutes a field occupied by the applicable state code. In fact, if this bill is enacted as written, it will upend well-settled preemption law that states that local ordinances of home rule cities are not preempted unless the state legislature acts with unmistakable clarity to preempt them. The Texas Agriculture Code includes state regulation of plants, trees, livestock, animals, and water conservation. By preempting all local ordinances in these fields, Texas residents would be denied local regulations that currently protect their communities from overgrowth of vegetation, invasive species, and regulations that preserve their local water supply. By preempting local regulations uh, in fields within the Natural Resources Code, the bill would prevent local governments from regulating waste storage and disposal, heavy trucks, oil, gas, and propane pipelines, and uncontrolled burns. 
uh, concerning the labor code and occupations code, cities would no longer be able to adopt or enforce ordinances relating to benefits and anti-discrimination, among other things. Um, as written, the bill would jeopardize the city's personnel rules and other internal policies and procedures. In its capacity as an employer, the city should be able to make its own decisions regarding protections afforded its employees, even if such protections ex exceed what the law requires. Uh, the bill would have a drastic fi fiscal impact to taxpayers statewide. If passed, it would require cities to undergo a costly and burdensome review of all its ordinances to ensure they are not enforcing regulations in violation of the bill. Uh, the bill waives governmental immunity and creates a new cause of action against cities and their officials. This bill invites plaintiff's lawyers to sue and recover attorney's fees requiring taxpayers to pay for I'm going to have to ask you to... Thank you, Mr. Chair. There you go. I'm, That's the I'm way. available for questions. Thank you. Any questions, members? Oh, Representative Anchia. Yeah, I defer to the to the dean. <laughs> you can miss your testimony, but you know what that bill is. Let, let me just clarify, the right. Chairman Thompson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can miss your testimony, but that you know what this bill was about. Yes, ma'am. What is it about? It's about preempting. Um, local ordinances that um, the state has occupied the field in um, many state codes, such as the Agricultural Code, the Occupations Code, the Texas Property Code, the, um, the Business and Commerce Code, uh, the Natural Resources Code, and a few others. So you think, you think that uh, if this bill passes, uh it would remove those powers from, from your local government? Yes, ma'am. And you don't think that's not good? I think that's not good. I think, I think that at the local level, um, cities have a unique um, way of governing uh, their, their constituents at the local level. Okay, thank you so much. Representative Angie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you can you work with the cities of Irving, Farmers Branch, and Carrollton and bring me a list of, of things, uh, not based on the, the bill as filed, but um, on the committee substitute? Because I'm hearing two different things. When I ask questions of the author, he's saying, well, no, it doesn't do any of these things. Um, and But you all still have concerns. So I, I, I need to be able to make good decisions up here, separate the weeds from the chaff. So if you all can get together and bring me a list of those things and sort of a reason why um, that would be very, very helpful. Yes, sir. You said Irving, Farmers Branch, and... And Carrollton. Carrollton. Yeah. And if they're non-responsive or don't weigh in, that's fine. I know Irving's concerned about it. I know Farmers Branch is concerned about it. So yes, sir. Um, please, please get me a list as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Thank you. And were you testifying on the uh, committee substitute or on the underlying bill? The committee substitute. Thank you. Just, just so we're clear, you're always testifying on the underlying bill and with the substitute just so we get <laughs> other questions uh, representative Turner. thank you uh, just a quick question so um you're an assistant city attorney so i assume part of you and your colleagues jobs is to advise city management and the city council on uh, the legality of ordinances they may be considering uh, in in how they comply or do not comply with state law. Is that part of what you do? Yes, that's part of our role. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you were in the room when the bill author laid out the bill and he and I had a, went through several different scenarios. Um, and so I asked a specific question about um, burglar alarms. And uh, because they, they are addressed in the occupations code under, mm -hmm. under state law. Um, and uh, Chairman Burroughs said that um, because there's a you know, public safety aspect to that, then that cities would still be able to have their own alarm policies uh, for their cities. Would you, I mean, as, a, as an attorney, as a city attorney, how would you construe that if, if something's in, kind of lives in two different codes uh, would you would you feel comfortable advising your council that no we can continue having our own ordinances with respect to uh, alarm permits and alarm policy, even though it is in the occupations code. The occupations code is preempted. Right. Do you have a 
the so I think that's that. where a lot of the confusion is going to stem from and why there's going to be so much, why we expect there to be so much litigation if this bill passes, because you're right, you know, the occupations code can, you know, talk about these alarms, but then it can be, you know, maybe over here in the fire code, which is completely <coughs> separate. So we'll have two competing state statutes and, you know, we don't know, does that mean that in the occupations code, the state has um, occupied the field there? Or should we look over to the fire code to see, um, you know, if that's what we should be looking at? And we would have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. And because I think, and oftentimes, you know, the argument could be made either way, um, that the field is occupied, or you have to look over here and it's clear that, you know, maybe the state says that you, you can pass local ordinances having to do with that topic. Um, so it'll be a case-by-case -case basis. And I think there'll be a lot of litigation stemming from that. Okay, thank you. You have a question. Yeah. Vice Chair Anna Runner. Hernandez. No, Anna. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Um, did I hear in your testimony that you were concerned with the city's ability to negotiate with their own employees? Yes, that's our employment lawyers do have that concern. Okay. So you're afraid that this bill would preempt the city's ability to negotiate with their employees on pay or benefits or anything else? I think that that concern is there. We haven't gone through every provision with a fine tooth comb as yet, but just on a cursory look, we, yes, we do have that concern. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Dean. Yeah, just this quick, thank you, Chairman. So Chairman and Chi has asked for a list from, from your office. I just wanna make sure I understand, because I think, if I understand, I think it's good. What are the things that in, in, the, in the bill, in the substitute bill that you are really seeing that are causing these problems that you're talking about because so far we're hearing you know some things that i don't know maybe i missed something in the layout and whatnot but it doesn't doesn't seem correct it seems like it's i don't know whack-a-mole but whatever uh it, it's it's like we're, we're creating some things that maybe really aren't there and i, and I understand that's your job as a city attorney or as a city attorney but i think that's a good idea rafael that would I mean, because that'll, that'll help us with some of the other cities as far as answering, you know, some of those those type questions. So I, I appreciate you asking to do that. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Tim Harden. Tim Harden. Tim Harden. We will note that he is not here, but registered for HB 2127. Lisa Fullerton. And members, we had called Lisa, but she was out of the room and is back, so she will be testifying in person. So, Lisa, I state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. My name is Lisa Fullerton. I am a franchisee business owner for Auntie Anne's Pretzels in Cinnabon. We like to say we're in the health food business. Um, and I am testifying today on behalf and for this bill. It's just so we're clear, so they heard for the bill? For the bill. Okay. Yes, thank you. I apologize for the delay. I am actually from San Antonio, and it took me two hours and 45 minutes to get here. Um, I've been in the business since 2000 and have really never become active in advocacy for a small business, except for the last five years. And that was the time a lot of these mandates and these regulations were being established by city ordinances. And this is the third session that I have come to testify on behalf of common sense regulation. I really like the phrase that this is a stay in your lane bill because I think that's how small business finds this. So not only is it we're asking for some predictability in this bill, I think it's because this is not our only pressure. Government is not the only pressure. I have landlords, I have two franchisors, I've got inflation, I've got mandates that are, as I run my business, that are outside the influence of government. 
So when we look at government mandates coming from a variety of different directions, often it feels out of left field. And it's my understanding that the cities are not losing or their authority or this bill is usurping that. This is just to clarify that they're doing things and recommending things that were never in their purview to begin with. So I appreciate as a small business owner, like I said, in business for 23 years, I appreciate the clarification and the codification of that. And probably the last thing I'd like to say is that we hear often that Texas is the number one state to do business and it is the number one state for small business owners. I feel that this is a chance for the state to get this right. I think this is a state, a, a chance for the state to stand behind legislation and sign that as a promise of their commitment to us. I have to be honest, the last two sessions, as hard as we fought to get this passed, it honestly feels like that has been a sound bite up into this moment. So I'm, I'm just asking you, imploring you to please help us get it across the finish line this session. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Patrick Brophy. And members, we had called Patrick. He was also outside the room, so he will be here to testify in person. Patrick, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Yes, Chairman, apologies for being outside of the room. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Patrick Brophy. I am the Chief Operating Officer from the North Texas Commission, and our position is against the bill. The North Texas Commission is a public-private partnership representing stakeholders who advance the economic success of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Our members include mid, mid-sized to large employers, cities, counties, and education institutions throughout our 13 counties. Our North Texas is home to more than 150 municipalities that account for nearly 8 million Texans. We are the third and soon to, or the fourth and soon to be third largest region in the United States, growing by one person every three minutes. North Texas is undoubtedly a popular place to live and, conduct, and conduct business. And our region alone is the 23rd largest economy in the world. Our economic success is due to the relatively low business environment and the rich cultures found in each unique community within our 9,000 square miles. North Texas has mass appeal because of the wide variety of options available in a conveniently connected geographic region. Businesses thrive in North Texas in part because of our ability to attract and maintain a talented and skilled workforce who choose to live in North Texas. The NTC opposes HB 2127 in its current form. We are concerned that the proposed restrictions on local governments would harm their ability to govern and provide adequate services by stripping authority and creating unnecessary confusion for local leaders. We fear the legal liability, entitlement to damages, and waived immunity encourages excessive legal action that would place administrative and financial burdens on local governments and potentially add costs to taxpayers. We understand that HB 2127 is a work in progress and we are grateful that Chairman Burroughs has indicated willingness to negotiate towards a compromised version of the bill. In its current form, the NTC opposes HB 2127, but we welcome the opportunity to gain full and clear understanding of what the bill does and does not regulate and to continue to serve as a resource and improve legislation from our stakeholders' point of view. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Glenn Hammer. Glenn, state your name, <clears throat> your title, and your position on the bill. My name is Glenn Hammer. I'm the president and CEO of the Texas Association of Business. And on behalf of the Texas Association of Business, the State Chamber for Texas, uh, I, we are in favor and support HB 2127. Uh, Chairman Burroughs, in laying out the bill, uh, put it very well. Uh, this bill will provide clarity and consistency for cities to focus on their critical and fundamental duties, like maintaining roads and other types of activities. In turn, this will create certainty for businesses in every county in Texas to thrive without having to navigate a patchwork of costly and inconsistent regulations. We just heard from a small businesswoman about uh, this is her third session testifying in favor of this 
type of bill. The fact is that there are very different uh, regulations and possibilities, almost an unlimited uh, set of combinations because of the size of the state. This is a $2 trillion economy with 254 counties and thousands of localities. For businesses that operate in the state, and I, I believe we would all here agree, we want to see businesses expand in the state and beyond. It can become extremely challenging to deal with all of the different regulations on uh, employment type uh, activities, such as predictive scheduling and other types of things that we've heard. We take great pride in this state that we have more Fortune 500 companies than any other state. Governor Abbott correctly calls us the headquarter of headquarters. And, and in part because of that, it's very important that we have regulatory certainty uh, across this great state. And I, we agree with Chairman Burroughs. It, it can be like playing whack-a-mole when businesses don't have the certainty that they need. We're dealing, uh, even in the great state of Texas, we're still dealing with national issues like a high inflationary environment. The last thing our businesses need is, is to spend their time on regulatory matters that are best under the purview of the state. So uh, Chairman Hunter, uh, we uh, strongly support uh, HB 2127 and appreciate uh, the work of uh, Chairman Burroughs in, in putting this legislation forward. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Please. Chairman Thompson has a question. Thank you for testifying. Thank you. In the uh, background information in this bill, it says that it also encourages compliance by stripping local officials of immunity, be it governmental officials or qualified. You agree with that, don't you? Chairman, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, you didn't hear me? I, I'm sorry. I, no, it's not your fault. No, I'm trying to work with this, but this is my first time getting <laughs> And I apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to try to, to, to uh, elevate my volume. Um, in this um, analysis of this bill, I'm asking if this also is one of your agreements. It encouraged compliances by stripping local officials of immunity, be it governmental, official, or qualified. I said, do you agree with that also? Chairwoman Thompson, we agree with the bill in, in, in the sense that we believe that uh, this bill will create the regulatory certainty that our businesses need. I, I, I will admit I am not familiar with every provision, and I would expect that as the bill moves forward, uh, some of these different items will be, uh, will be discussed. But when we hear from small businesses sure. and, and businesses that are doing uh, their activities all across the state that they need regulatory consistency, uh, we we agree. I'm, I'm sure that there will be uh, revisions and uh, improvements, as would be the case for any major legislation. But I, I, I don't have enough expertise to speak on that particular uh, aspect. Let me ask you one, maybe if I address it this way. If there are governmental entities that have uh, entities within itself with contractual uh, uh, obligations, that has immunity in it, do you believe that those immunities should be removed? If there will this bill remove it? Chairwoman, I, I apologize. I'm not able to answer that. Now, I'm not question. trying to put you on the spot. I, I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm really just asking for information purposes. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask someone else, but I do thank My you. For, I do thank you for attempting. Thank I you. Appreciate your kindness. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, oh, Representative Mancia. Yeah, Glenn, I am trying to put you on the spot. Sure. Um, <laughs> are, you, uh, are you in favor of more lawsuits uh, against municipalities uh, and the waiver of immunity um, in those lawsuits? I'm in favor of protecting business. Answer my question. That's what I'm, I'm... Are you in favor of more lawsuits in the state of Texas that would... Um, that would cause there to be a waiver of sovereign immunity and more judgments against cities? I'm going to respectfully answer it the same way. I'm, I'm in favor of the tools that we need to protect our businesses in the state of Texas that uh, already have a very challenging environment because of the national inflationary environment to deal with a, a state set of rules in these areas that the state has decided to act. 
How does your organization, how, since you didn't answer the question, how does your organization um, decide when to weigh in on a, on a particular issue that may be anti-business? We well, we have supported uh, the regulatory consistency effort in different iterations over the last several sessions. We that wasn't we, my question. How, how does your organization come to decide on whether you're going to be standing right there and speaking for or against a bill? We, we have a board of directors and we set a, a, a slate of policies. And the regulatory consistency one, uh, this is an easy one. This, this, this state is not is, is a $2 trillion economy. We've heard from different businesses, great barbecue businesses and other types of businesses, that they're trying to expand in the state. It's, in, it's more difficult to operate when there's a whole patchwork of rules. And as I understand it, this Do you bill believe this is not already a great state to do business? I agree. I, it is the greatest state in the country to do business. Right. The, the issue is that you have a lot of uh, creative minds all across the country that want to come into the state of Texas and impose different regulatory regimes. We saw that last session, didn't we, with, with what the state had to do in terms of to uh, prohibit lo localities from uh, prohibiting the use of natural gas. There's no end of those types of activities. So well, where did that occur? Where did that occur? That, well, it didn't occur in Texas uh, okay. because there was there was a there was legislation to prevent that. Which we passed a number of sessions ago, correct? Uh, it passed, I believe, uh, two years ago. No, I think HB 40 passed six years ago, if I'm not mistaken. There was that a, was the that was Chris Patty's bill that that preempted locals from um, <coughs> regulating oil and gas. Anyway, Glenn, like. I, I, I will also, I'm trying to get at where, where you, where the Texas Association of Business is, is uh, how you all try to come up with consistent positions. Let me ask this question. If this bill, um, if this bill resulted in there being, um, uh, it, it resulted in the end of, and, and the author says it doesn't, City of Dallas says it does, I want to get to the bottom of that. But if it resulted in non-discrimination ordinances going away at the local level, do you think that's a good or bad result? Well, it won't. The, the <coughs> fact is the bill... So, so we just heard the city of Dallas testify that they're concerned that it will. I, I, let's, let's assume. But if it did, if, if the result... It doesn't. If, if the it, result... It simply doesn't. If the result was that non-discrimination ordinances in housing or at the municipal level went away, do you think that's a good or bad result? Well, it won't. So uh, we, the, those, those ordinances are important ordinances. It's important that those remain in place. And this bill, so I, I hope so that- So TAB is supportive of those ordinances? We would support those ordinances staying in place. That's okay, good, sir. perfect, thank you. Other questions, members? Good, thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Ben Brenneman. Thank you, Ben. Ben, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. I'm a pretty tall guy, too, so I'm going to try to make this work. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. My name is Ben Brenneman. I'm uh, proud to be a union electrician. I also happen to be the business manager of International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 520 in Austin. And I'm also the president of the Texas Association of Building Trades Unions. Uh, I have some concerns about this bill. I am speaking against the bill. And one thing I know the, uh, the author said that this does not affect localities ability to deal with, with crises, but I wanted to talk about what we found during the pandemic, because as you know, most businesses shut down, but we were still working. Uh, during the pandemic, we built the Q2 soccer stadium. We built uh, the Kalahari resort. We built a, lot, a number of large projects and, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we got together the, the business associations, the labor associations, the city and the county to come up with some common sense rules for construction workers to keep them safe. Uh, just, you know, more, more toilets on the job, ability to wash your hands on the job, things that most of us take for granted. When we found the pandemic was over, we found that our local had one third of the cases of similar sized IBW locals in the state. 
we, and we had no deaths, which was not true for, for most of our sister locals. You know, I, I know that issues around COVID are controversial, and I wouldn't say that the things that we did in Austin and Travis County would be right for, you know, San Angelo or Hidalgo County, but it was right for us. And I, was, I feel that we did the right thing to protect my members and all construction workers. And I would like uh, for the offer of the bill to talk about, you know, this was something we did through local ordinance. Would this bill preempt that? Would be, be able to take action in, in a timely manner to protect ourselves in the future? Um, because, you know, my members depend on it. Our lives depend on it. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm speaking against the bill and I, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you, sir. Colin Petty. And Colin, if you'll state your name, your title, and then give us your position on the bill. Chairman, my name is Colleen Petty. I'm a senior assistant city attorney with the city of Houston, and I'm speaking in strong opposition to both the bill and the, com uh, the committee substitute. The over 300 Texas home rural cities, including its largest, my city of Houston, are unquestionably the engines of the state's booming economy. This bill would place their economic stability and vitality in grave danger because the 2020 2127 substitute is terrible for Texas business. First, if there is one thing that businesses hate, it's uncertainty. Because 2127 barely attempts to define the fields it purports to preempt, home rule cities will not know what laws to enforce, and more important, businesses will not know what laws to obey. That's why the Texas Supreme Court has repeatedly reaffirmed that state law can preempt local law only when the intent to preempt that particular law is done with unmistakable clarity. Remember that term, unmistakable clarity. Consequently, 2127 substitute will almost certainly be declared unconstitutionally vague, even by a Supreme Court that has routinely found city ordinances <coughs> preempted by state law. Second, both government and businesses hate the uncertainty of litigation. 2127 essentially abdicates the legislature's responsibility for determining the scope of its preemption by the to the courts. By actively encouraging anybody to file lawsuits against cities, alle cities alleging, uh, al alleging preemption, even awarding fees when a city itself has sought in good faith clarification of 2127's preemptive scope, the substitute ensures that the uncertainty as to what laws must be enforced and obeyed is going to continue for as long as possible. Worse, this ruinous litigation burden may weigh so heavily on Texas' smaller home rule cities that it threatens to bankrupt them, endangering the businesses that previously thrived there. Third, by attempting to create the country's first and only one-size-fits-all state-run regulatory regime, the 2127 substitute will stifle the very local innovation and carefully tailored service and protection the framers of the Texas Constitution themselves codified by adopting home rule in Article 11, Section 5, which grants home rule cities the full power of self-government. For example, Houston recently spent two years working hand in glove with all local sh shareholders to craft a noise ordinance for a city with no no zoning. The state could never match that custom effort, even if it chose to regulate it all, and Houston businesses and residents would be uh, worse off. Because That's your end. Okay. So you want to summarize? I, I can. Real quick. I can. Uh, 2127 creates more uncertainty because the state's not prepared to take over these items and because uh, the Constitution already provides the means to displace conflicting laws. Thank you, Colin. Questions you may have. Questions? Re uh, Chairman Thompson. Yeah, I just want to ask her, to, uh, could she give us the uh, uh, case law uh, title on that uh, that she referred to in the bill? 
What, uh, the Supreme Court holding? The Supreme it, Court. Later, court. later, you know, oh, you don't have to do it today. Absolutely, Your Honor. Okay. It's, it's a city of, the city of Laredo case, which has been referenced, the bag ban case, but I can get them all to you. Would you get that to the city clerk so they could get that to the committee members? Yes. In, in, city of, in city of Laredo, the court reaffirmed that preemption must be done with unmistakable clarity, and in all of their preemption decisions, they have done that. Because the idea on preemption is that it is a surgical enterprise. We, the city of Houston currently has two preemption cases pending before the Supreme Court where we're asking the court to preempt uh, 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 charter amendments that were the result of citizen petitions that really don't work for the city. So we're uh, many times on, on both sides of the issue. But what the court- well, Hold on a second. You've kind of gone beyond the three months right here. <laughs> You're gonna, you're gonna, no, you didn't. She asked for the cases and you gave us a speech. Okay. So I got you. I'm a lawyer too. I I so the bottom line is if you'll get us the cases and make sure uh, Representative Raymond gets that Laredo case. I referenced, <laughs> talked about it. Thank you. Any questions, members? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, Chairman the case, Thompson. The case that you have before the Supreme Court now involved this very topic. Is that very what you're topic. saying? Okay. And would you give us just a little snippet of what that's involved? Uh, one of them is a police and firefighters pay parity uh, charter amendment. And what we're saying is that Chapter 174 of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Texas Local Government Code, and this is a collective bargaining uh, provision, preempts this charter amendment. The, uh, the other case is one in which uh, there were two competing uh, revenue caps. The state has had its own revenue cap, so Houston has now three, uh, and we're saying that we should only have to enforce one, and uh, one of them preempts the other. So I, I've dealt with these issues for seven years. I litigate all these cases for the city, dealt with preemption cases for, for seven years at the city, and then 14 before that in private practice. So all of them bear the same hallmark, and that is they're very surgical, they're looking at words to see if there's a conflict. Now, I, I would add one thing. You've kind of gone beyond the snippet. Okay. <laughs> so, Chairman Thompson, anything okay, else? Okay, what would you add to that? <laughs> oh, Chairman Thompson, when we started the meeting, okay. I asked we not go into the supplement. So, is that okay? Okay, let me just ask one additional question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if this law was passed, would it impact uh, collective bargaining uh, contracts. Uh, Dean, I, I frankly cannot tell you. Okay. Because let me, let me explain why. There are five. You better be quick. <laughs> okay. There are five separate inquiries. No, 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 no. In order to, in order to answer yeah. the question. Uh -huh. um, the, the first well, one. Look, it's going to, I really am going to enforce the well, time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you'll get the information and get it to the member, because in fairness to everybody here, they may want to add on, and we do want to get to everybody. And uh, But anyway, if you'll get her all the information, we appreciate that. Representative Raymond. Chairman, this is a yes or no question, I think. Just the first lawsuit that you said you, that you referenced regarding police and fire, uh, do are the police union and firefighters union supporting you on that or not? Uh, the, the police uh, union is supporting us on it. The firefighters union is on the other side of the case. Thank you. Any other snippet questions? <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. Other? Okay. Chris Mayberry. Chris, give the information, yeah, thank you. And if you'll uh, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. My name is Chris Mayberry. I'm here today alongside member airlines of Airlines for America, an industry group representing many of the nation's airlines advocating in support of House Bill 2127. Joining me today are representatives from American Airlines and United Airlines, while other airlines are participating remotely. I've been an in-house labor and employment lawyer for Southwest Airlines for the past eight years and have been board certified in labor and employment law since 2012. I have written testimony from Airlines for America to provide the committee which is being passed out now and would like to share a few additional comments. 
Airlines support HB 2127 because it would prevent local governments from regulating the relationship between employers and employees. As airlines, we greatly value our partnerships with local governments who are the landlords at the airports where we operate. However, local regulation of the employment relationship is simply unworkable for an industry like airlines that operates in hundreds of jurisdictions. It's extremely difficult for employers to comply with multiple, often inconsistent laws within a single state. Airlines, for example, may have to comply with five different sets of laws at a single airport federal, state, city, county, and airport authorities. On top of that, we have to apply existing company policies. California is a prime example of where local governments will go if not impeded. In California, dozens of local jurisdictions have passed laws on things like sick leave, pay transparency disclosures, criminal background checks, and we have to deal with that all the time. It's very difficult. Airlines in particular are uniquely impacted because we have a highly mobile workforce. Our pilots and flight attendants travel to many cities and states in a single day. Even ground-based employees may travel to multiple locations within a short period of time. That leaves airlines trying to figure out which laws apply and what happens when they conflict with company policy or conflict with each other. Take an example that could have been real had Texas courts not intervened. Assume a flight attendant is based in Austin and regularly travels to San Antonio and Dallas. All three, of those sick, oh, sorry, all three of those cities enacted sick leave laws. Which one applies? What happens if each city argues that their law applies? Now extrapolate that across all the cities in Texas, it is difficult. Not only would it be difficult to administer, but these local laws would prevent airlines from applying attendance policies, which are intended to ensure we have enough employees working to keep flight schedules on time. Another really significant example is predictive scheduling ordinances. There's actually one on the books in Texas. It requires employers post schedules in advance and not make changes. What happens if a flight's delayed, arrives late at night, and the ground crew shift was supposed to end 15 minutes earlier? We're not allowed to extend their shift without risking violating the law, but we still need to get passengers off the plane. These are some of the examples uh, that justify why Texas should not allow local governments to regulate the employment relationship. Thank you. Questions, members? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cyrus Reed. Cyrus again, just state your name, title, and position on the bill. Thanks. Yes, uh, for the record, Cyrus Reed, Lone Star Chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, we are against the initial version of the bill, and I have had a chance to read the committee sub and also against it as well. Um, I think this is a fairly radical bill because what it does is it takes 100 years of how we've done things for home rule cities and reverses it, and it says, unless you all which as a reminder, in case you didn't know, you only meet every other year for 140 days to take action, right? Um, so it basically says, unless you specifically authorize a city to, do, to be able to do things in these eight areas of codes, um, you can't do it, home rule cities. And to me, that fundamentally undermines a lot of the citizens, including many volunteers that volunteer with the Sierra Club. I don't do a lot of city work, but... Uh, we have lots of volunteers in Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth and Corpus Christi uh, who, who do work and work on things. The particular, you know, in our world, the particular codes that we're concerned about are not necessarily the labor code or the occupation code. It's really things like the agro agricultural code and the natural resource code. And within the agricultural code, I think there are um, examples of local ordinances having to do with things like trees, invasive species, uh, community gardens, agriculture, water conservation. And we can argue back and forth whether cities already have that right. But if the, this law is passed, it will create a lot of confusion and potentially lawsuits around that. And then the natural resource codes, there are things like, um, you know, uh, garbage and solid waste facilities and trucking routes and pipeline routes and things like that that are very important. So, and to sum up, uh, I think you know where I stand. Um, we think this would be a radical change, 
and is not good public policy. And we prefer when there are particular issues with gas stoves or HB40 that we all take a look at it and we all have we all provide input into that and come up with good public policy, not having this, this sort of approach. Members, any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Chairman Thompson. And don't you think cities ought to have, have a say in concrete batching plants and where they are located? Certainly. Yeah. Because I live in a ghetto and they're all over my area. They just love us for some reason, but they don't let us breathe. That, that's a good example where local authority and local control is important. Thank you. Other question, members? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Richard A.W.E.S. Richard, I think it's Halls, A.W.E.S. And Richard, if you'll state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Hi, my name's Richard Allis. I'm representing myself, and I'm testifying against the bill. Uh, thank you, Chairman and members, for listening to me today. Um, I'm concerned over the unintended consequences of this bill. It's so general in the way it defines a violation of the bill that it's really hard. Well, you've heard the city attorneys testify how difficult it's going to be to predict which ordinances will be nullified by this bill. And so the courts will be called in to do that duty. Second, um, a lot of our ordinances are developed or negotiated with stakeholders. We have business stakeholders, citizens, community members. They sit down and they hammer out the details of an ordinance. No one group comes away with everything they want, but we make a good compromise that benefits the community and the business interests. So. These are the kind of ordinances that will be nullified by this legislation. And finally, the bill is going to take power away from Texas citizens and taxpayers and hand it to corporations. So people who depend on their local governments to stand up for the interests can't depend on them anymore in you know, instances where this bill is going to nullify the uh, ordinances. So a lot of these corporations will be out of state or global corporations from California, Florida, New York that are going to benefit from this bill. But we'll be taking power away from the taxpayers and citizens who live here in Texas to favor these out of state corporations and global corporations. So that's why I'm against the bill. and. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, members? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anthony Sturgio. And Anthony, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Certainly. Uh, my name is Anthony Sturgio. I am head of the labor and employment section at Andrews Myers a Houston-based uh, construction law firm. Um, I am in favor of Bill 2127. Over the past several years, we've been dealing with an awful lot of municipalities who passed bills, uh, the paid time off bills passed by Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, um, in which my clients have, have had employees throughout the state and some employees actually working within those municipalities within the course of the year. And my clients have been left to try and cobble together a paid time off policy that would comply with all of these all of these uh, statutes. And in most cases, we already had PTO, but now we have to change it simply to not enhance the benefits for an employee, but simply to deal with the administrative framework that was enacted by three separate municipalities. Uh, the commerce in the, is broad in this state. It runs through many cities. We have, I have a number of employers who work in virtually, you know, all areas of the state. And in having, in, in what this bill does essentially is it creates 
a, a singular rule at a state level with regard to wages and benefits. It makes sense. It, it lays down the rules for those working within the state and, and employing employees throughout the state. And that's way basically why I stand in favor of the bill, especially obviously with my field in, in favor of the labor preemption portion of the bill. Thank you. Any questions, members? I, I like this. Chairman guy. Thompson. I like, that. I like this guy. He's in construction and he's employing people. And one of the things I noticed about construction, you know, a lot of times when they negotiate contracts with municipalities, they say that we need X number of employees and we're going to pay them X number of dollars. And then they get the contract, and next thing you know, you got some people with green cards making less money and look like some of these contracts did that. I know you all don't do this kind of stuff, but you know, some people, the shady part of your deal does this. And you know, if this bill passes, we, we hope that you protect us from those kind of things happening. Chairwoman, absolutely. I mean, uh -huh. you know, the, the thing of it is, is that when someone doesn't play by the rules, you know, it affects those that, that, that do. So, yeah. you know, so if someone has a contract with, for instance, a municipality, you know, I advise my clients, obviously, to stay within the parameters yeah. of those contracts and to stay within the parameters of, for example, the, the immigration laws that, yes. that provide that, you know, you, you have to check uh, Certainly uh, appreciate the validity that. of work. I notice they never give that money back. They keep that extra money they get on the side. Thank you so much. Representative Turner. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify a couple things for the record, uh, I'm over here. Um, yeah. uh, I know, it's a, lot, it's a big deal. Uh, you, you referred to paid time off ordinances. That's not a phrase I'm familiar with. Uh, representative, it was basically the sick time regulation. Paid sick leave ordinances? Paid, Is that, yeah. You're talking about paid sick leave. Okay, yes. all right. So in, we heard from previous testimony uh, repeatedly today. Those two or three cities that passed those ordinances, those never actually went into effect. Isn't that correct? That's correct. We were dealing with um, the ordinances preemptively. In other words, we had paid, paid sick leave. You know, how are we going to have to adjust that paid sick leave in Houston, San Antonio, and Austin, assuming that it was going to go into effect? How are we going to comply with each of those ordinances on a going forward basis? But you would agree that's not an issue anymore? Because that is correct. It is not presently an issue. Thank you. Other questions, members? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Joseph Bowie. Joseph, oh, is that Joseph? Come on down. Joseph, if you'll state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Joseph Bowie. I'm here representing Beard Integrated Systems and myself. Um, thank you to the chair and everybody on the committee. We appreciate you allowing us to speak to you today. Um, <clears throat> I'm an operations manager here in Austin, Texas, for Beard Integrated Systems. And Joseph, are you for or against? I'm against. Okay. Um, we we do Austin and all across the state of Texas. Uh, we have about 500 plus or minus employees across the state of Texas, multiple municipalities. Um, <clears throat> this bill would do away with local training, safety requirements in the areas of, that we work in. Construction is a large part of our state economy. These requirements level the playing field for the contractors in Texas <clears throat> to return home safely to them, their families. Uh, that's why I'm against this bill. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you very much. Luis Figueroa. Good to see you. Just state your name, title, and position on the bill. Thank you, Chairman Hunter. My name is uh, Luis Figueroa. I'm the Chief of Legislative Affairs for Every Texan, formerly the Center for Public Policy Priorities. Uh, we are in opposition to HB 2127 uh, for a few reasons. Um, number one, we do think it's a step backwards in terms of uh, undermining local democracy. 
Uh, there has been polling done by Baseless and Associates that found that 87% of Texas voters believe their local officials are better connected to their communities and should be allowed to pass policies that reflect their community's needs and values. And I have some of the uh, additional polling number in, your, in the written testimony there. Um, but fundamentally, we believe that these city officials are trying their best to enact their policies uh, consistent with the views of their voters. Uh, and we should not try to undermine that uh, through the Austin legislative process. Uh, we also believe it's an attack on workers. Um, we already preempt uh, minimum wage, right? That's already in the books. Uh, paid sick has already been preempted. And most of the things we have heard today that were concerns have, have not gone into effect. Uh, but we have heard that this legislation would potentially impact rest breaks, potentially payday lenders, non-discrimination ordinances, the Violet Crown Act, which protects against uh, hair texture. All of these things make our community safer, make it more equitable, and um, address real community needs. And lastly, the attack on safety. We, um, you know, I believe the cities are not trying to play games. They're trying to honestly figure out what this legislation does, trying to figure out which statute applies to where and what code. Uh, and I believe that they are legitimately concerned that it will impact um, many provisions that address safety and the health code and, and different provisions. And the fact that the city attorneys are having difficulty figuring out just shows to me that we're going to be in the courts litigating this over and over and over again. Um, so for those reasons, we are in opposition, and we thank you for this opportunity to testimony and hope we'll work with our city and county officials against, instead of against them. Thank you. Well, Representative Dean. Ms. Figueroa, thanks for being here today. Um, earlier, we heard Chairman and Chia talk to the Dallas Assistant City Attorney you just referred to, and, and I think that's a great exercise for us. What, you know, okay, it's broad, we hear that, but... You know, the things in those various fields that clarification wise or, um, you know, things that we we should look at. Uh, have you all gone through that exercise? We did. We tried. We had some um, attorneys from our um, partners, national organizations who have done it in other states and then compared it. They are still trying to get through it. They said it's very difficult to figure out which codes are preempted because you have to look at the local um code versus the ones that are preempted. Um, so they're still working on it. As we get um, better analysis on it, we will absolutely share that with you. Uh, but I do think it is, um, it, it is not a gamemanship. I think it is legitimately people trying to figure it out. Okay. And I, and I appreciate that, that statement because I think that's what, what everybody is saying. But before we, you know, throw, throw the dart at it, let's, let's talk about what the specifics are in, in which you claim to be a broad a broad uh, bill, if you will, but what are, what are some of the things that you, you you really need clarification or something on would be, would be helpful? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Representative. Okay. Other questions, members? Thank you very Thank much, Louis. Stephen Skurlock. Steve, just state your name, title, and position on the bill. I will do so. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Steve Scarlock I'm with Independent Bankers Association of Texas. Uh, we are for the bill. Uh, as you are all aware, banking is certainly among the most highly regulated uh, of all the industries in this country. And community banks, who I represent, uh, are especially impacted by this dynamic. And we continue to see, as you also know, a tremendous amount of consolidation uh, of our uh, sector, if you will, of the industry. And I think a large part of that is due to what's coming out primarily of Washington and trying to keep up with everything that's going on. Uh, there is a history of uh, additional regulatory burden emanating from cities to add yet more layers of cost and unintended consequences. As you might imagine, we are less than enamored uh, with that particular dynamic. Not surprisingly, and I've heard uh, the state of California mentioned several times uh, today, and it seems like it's mentioned pretty much several times every day in, in some of these hearings that we're in. Uh, they lead the way on additional requirements for our industry, for banks. And several cities have put into place restrictions on ATM fees, 
reporting requirements on investments and loans, and there have also been proposed uh, specific restrictions on overdraft practices. Uh, New York City enacted some very stringent requirements on ATM security uh, several years ago that were ultimately uh, preempted by federal law. An unnamed city in Texas several years ago passed an ordinance limiting criminal background checks on um, employment applications. As you know, the banking business uh, is a bit unique and operates under a variety of federal and state requirements, as well as best practices in this particular area. Uh, this was a very unnecessary distraction uh, for us and for our banks here. And uh, while it, we were able to eventually get out of that requirement, it would have created significant problems uh, and actually <coughs> delayed our vetting and uh, employment activities for some time. However well-intentioned, our community banks have more than enough regulatory requirements as it is, and every new initiative uh, diverts resources from our mission of creating economic activity and prosperity in the communities we serve. Mm -hmm. I would be more than happy to attempt to answer any questions that the committee may have. Any questions, members? Yes, Representative Spiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Scurlock, a few minutes ago we heard from a uh, senior city attorney with the city of Houston testified that in, in her words that this uh, 2127 substitute is terrible for business. Uh, you as a representative of the Independent Banker Association, you're in the business community. Certainly that is your, that is your business. Would you agree with that characterization? Representative Spiller, I, again, I got a, a little bit of practice on this yesterday at the Business and Commerce Committee hearing on the Senate side. Uh, our lane is, is banking. I think that for us, especially in the community banking world, if we know what we're dealing with, if we're dealing with consistent issues across our, our market area, if you will, which may incorporate numerous uh, municipalities and counties and others, uh, that consistency is terribly important. We've, we've had enough. Uh, uh, again, we are, uh, we are seeing a lot of our banks decide they've had enough. There's no one in the family to come up and run the bank. No one wants to come to some of the small towns uh, to run these banks. And when a community bank goes away in a specific community, you can definitely tell in about two or three years. Uh, and it dries up. And it's pretty sad. So. Is it a disaster? No. Is there, just like any other piece of legislation, room for compromise, room for fine tuning, room for negotiation and discussion? That's what you guys get paid the big bucks for, okay? I wondered what it was. That All was right. it, that's it. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, hopefully I answered your question. It does, thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Abigail Milam. Abigail, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Um, so my name is Abigail Milam. I am um, here as an individual. I am a graduate student at Texas State University. Um, and I am in opposition to House Bill 2127. Specifically because, as we've established, home rule cities do have the right to self-governance. This is very well documented within our Texas state laws. And as a taxpayer, we have the right to be able to determine where our tax dollars are fut, where, where our tax dollars are allocated. I say this because this directly impacts ballot initiatives that have been passed across cities. Um, one instance of this is the ballot initiative to decriminalize marijuana in San Marcos. Um, we have the right to say where we want our policing to go, right? We pay taxes into that system for that reason. Um, I overheard earlier one of our representatives say that you do not want to be the weed police, but what else do you call it when um, a ballot initiative that was passed with over 82% of support from the city of San Marcos um, would effectively be nullified. How is that not being Big Brother? How is that not the state of Texas overstepping its boundaries? 
one of the biggest arguments that we've heard today is that it is the cities overstepping boundaries, but a lot of these pieces of legislation like paid sick leave um, and weed decriminalization are massively popular among workers. What I am hearing today is that this law is prioritizing profits over people. We are talking about people's right to get water on the job, to wash their hands, to have basic humane living conditions, and we are here talking about the big impacts of business. House Bill 2127 also takes a one-size-fits-all approach when, as we've talked about before, no city is the same. This is the importance of self-determination. The environmental laws in San Marcos are definitely going to meet different needs to protect our river, our ecosystem, and invasive species. Nobody knows this better than our community members. Yet this bill is trying to override the wants of the community and the local experts who know exactly what they are talking about. Um, this also undermines democracy. If we do not trust our elected officials to make legislation that works for our city, what is the point of an election? If the state of Texas will be responsible for answering angry Texans challenging government overreach if this bill is passed. The state legislator has been failing us. How many times has we decrim been brought to the state of Texas and how many times has it passed? If we had a state legislature that represented the wants of the people, this wouldn't even be on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions, members? Thank you for your position. Next, Alex Eagle. Alex, state your name, title, and your position on the bill. Alex Equal, I'm here on uh, behalf of myself and Freebirds Will Burrito to testify for the uh, House Bill 2127. Scoot that mic a little closer to you. Just kind of pull better? it. But just kind of push it right there. There you go. There you go. Uh, Freebirds Will Burrito is a. I don't think uh, it's on, Jim. Uh, See the red light on? Hold on right there. Is that working now? Okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay, well, you're it. We're going to start you over, man. Go. All right. Freebirds will uh, read out. Yeah, state the name, your oh. title, and your from position. The, from the beginning. Excuse me. <laughs> My name is Alex Eagle. Uh, I'm here on behalf of myself and Freebirds World Burrito to testify for House Bill 2127. Uh, Freebirds World Burrito is a burrito and bowl restaurant concept that started in College Station and currently operates 63 restaurants throughout the state. Our industry remains in a very precarious position with most in our business experience significant reductions in guest traffic. Capacity is also stretched thinner than ever due to the hyper-competitive labor market. And by the way, in the 11 years that I've been in the industry, it's been a very competitive labor market and record high employee turnover. Even if times were less challenging for our industry, I would still support this bill because regulatory consistency and predictability in commerce are at the very foundation of any successful model for governance, and it is particularly important for those who are less capable of nav navigating regulatory co uh, complexity, small businesses. Though I run a larger business, the importance of consistency and predictability became particularly acute for me operating restaurants at the beginning of the pandemic when too many of our resources went towards reacting to various rush to different regulations enacted by different cities instead of taking care of our guests and our people. I've also operated restaurants in California and other states. I had uh, a set of uh, three large telephone sized books. You all look too young to know what a telephone sized book is, but it's a very large book. Um, and these summarized employment law across uh, the country and these were put together by the same author. Two of those books covered every state and federal law outside California, and the third was just for California, same size as the other two. It was necessary to cover everything that the state regulated, as well as municipalities in California, which in spite of California having, I think, the most regulations in employment law, they still add uh, um, municipal regulations on top of that. Um, to avoid the challenge of, op uh, of different operating standards, um, uh, which 
are really difficult to manage when you talk about software programming and maintenance and building training materials and uh, implementing uh, procedures. What we ended up doing was mapping our way to a set of rules that we could apply uh, to as many locations as possible and incurring a great deal of effort to monitor municipal changes uh, to stay up to date. And what that meant, practically speaking, is that these municipal regulations were extended way beyond their jurisdiction uh, because we were adopting uh, laws uh, that only affected one of our locations and uh, uh, applying them to all of our locations. So I've learned that even well-intended uh, regulations can have meaningful consequences. Thank you. I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Raymond. Um, thank you very much for being here and thanks for your testimony. Uh, my son loves free birds. I've always wondered, if you don't mind me getting off topic a little bit, Chairman, did, did, where did the name come from? Was it from the Leonard Skinner song? or It is. Yeah. One of my favorite songs. Appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I didn't know that was called. Thank you for aging the whole panel. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, members? Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's a hard song to Samantha Benavides. And Samantha, state your name and title and position on the bill. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Sam Benavides. I work for Mano Amiga and I am speaking against HB 2127. I was born and raised in Laredo, similar to Representative Richard Raymond, and I currently live in San Marcos, where I work as an organizer with Mano Amiga, which is a criminal justice reform nonprofit based in Hayes County. I have been organizing my community since 2018, and this is my first time ever speaking here at our state capitol because early on into my career, I made the decision to dedicate my time and energy to organizing at the local level, which has allowed me through Mano Amiga to effectively advocate for systemic change that has benefited the lives of my neighbors in San Marcos. I'd like to first address what Representative Richard Raymond uh, was discussing earlier about the plastic bag ban in Laredo. As someone who lived in Laredo during that time, from my recollection, I remember that what eventually happened was everyone, my friends, my family, my neighbors, was eventually bringing their own reusable uh, bags into the grocery stores, which was really great for our environment and especially for the Rio Grande River. And it was really disappointing to see that be overturned. So I just wanted to share my perspective on that as someone who experienced the ramifications of that being overturned. Getting back to what I originally had prepared, already my organization is extremely, extremely limited in the policies we are able to advocate for. And this bill would further limit the work that I'm able to do in my community where every day I connect with my neighbors, learn about issues impacting them locally, and advocate on behalf of them at city council and commissioner's court mainly. This bill would not only prohibit our local lawmakers from utilizing their autonomy to enact policy that benefits our community members, but it would also pr prohibit citizens from engaging in popular ballot initiatives that reflect their best interests when our local lawmakers fail to enact them themselves. I believe that this bill is a counter to groups like Mano Amiga that are effectively advocating for change at the local level and improving the lives of our neighbors every day. However, it isn't just Mano Amiga, but it also aims to inhibit other groups that are pushing for popular initiatives that actually get people excited about getting involved in the democratic pro process and restore their faith in democracy. Local government gives them a voice in policies that impact their everyday lives when their needs are ignored here at the state level. If you believe in this kind of groundwork that is restoring the faith that Texans have in our government and allowing citizens to advocate for policies at the local level that impact them directly, I ask that you vote against House Bill 2127. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Raymond. Thank you, Chairman. Was, tell me your name again. My name is Sam Benavides. Ben I was actually raised in Benavides, but you know. Oh, nice. Of course, yeah. Um, uh, what high school did you go to? I went to Nixon. Nixon, okay. Um, I have good news for your family and your relatives and everyone you know. They can keep using their own bags if they want to when they go to HEB or wherever. So, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. They, and there's still plastic bags there that are ending up in the river? Excuse me? At the same time? Say that again? There's still plastic bag usage there that's ending up in the river at the same time? In the river? So that's I, not great I, news. I don't know. 
probably some of them do. Yeah. You know, and and so, you know, but um, have you been downtown lately? Yeah. The old downtown? Mm -hmm. Have you seen how devastated it is? It is pretty devastating. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you very much. Tom Kenny. Tom, just state your name, title, and position on the bill. Uh, my name is Tom Kenny, and uh, I'm President Chief Busboy of WFK Restaurant Group. I have two restaurants in College Station and one in Tulsa. And I'm, I'm here to support House Bill 2127. And I think there's, you know, I want to really bring unmistakable clarity, as the uh, city representatives have said about what this bill means to us. I found it kind of ironic that the I'm, I'm the R&D department, the analytics department, the real estate department of my company. So you can see it's a one man show. I don't have, when, when these laws are passed, I don't have a group of attorneys that can see how this is gonna impact us, how this is gonna work, the, how the city is saying, these are gonna be burdensome, a law of unintended consequences. Well, we deal with that every day. Every time a law is passed, we feel the unintended consequences of those laws. I was, I was at my restaurant this morning before I left and I saw at one point there was a law that passed that says all restaurants or businesses have on the bottom of their door a sign that says during operating hours these doors must remain open. Now, I wonder how did that law ever come to be? Are we as business people that dumb that we know we, we should lock our door when keep our door locked when we're open for business. I just wonder how these laws get in place. And no better, I thought the best speaker so far was a man representing the airline industry. Think about the rules that they have to have. They fly to one city, they fly to another. You have Austin laws, San Antonio laws, Houston laws, and these are all gonna be labor laws that they're gonna have to kind of figure out how to do. I've had restaurants in multi-cities before, and I and every city has different laws and requirements. And we're employers. I mean, I, I during COVID, I had to close a restaurant here in Austin. It was impossible to do it anymore. And I mean, I had to lay off 60 people. And we tried and we did our best. I think having laws that help us run our business without making them too difficult is good. I get it, we want good government. We want smart laws, but a law where each city council can have their own little um, issue with something. We want a labor law that requires this and um, paid sick leave that requires that and it's different in every city. How do we really operate in that environment? And, it, our, and the, the fact is, as business people, we want to have great employees. We want them to stay. We want to treat them right. That's how you run a business. And it's kind of insulting that we have to have all these city councils creating these laws that you know, kind of tell us we need to keep our doors open, unlocked when we're open for business. Thank you. Any questions, members? Representative Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you, you mentioned one law or I guess ordinance that requires you to post something about keeping your doors open during business hours. Correct. What, what city was that, that? That's in that's in Austin. That's in College Station. It must be. I'm not. I'm not sure. It's. In, um, it's everywhere. I don't know if it's everywhere. It's just my experience. But okay. I feel really safe to know that that law is passed. Okay. Are there other uh, Are there other laws you've run into that have caused you problems in your business? Um, multiple laws. I mean, I, I mean, the pull one off the top of my head would, I probably would not do a good job at that. But I mean, there's requirements we have and very few industries are more regulated than restaurants are. And, you know, we have multiple from city, state, local ordinances and a lot of legislative things from the state level. Okay. But the only specific example you can think of right now is the one on the doors remaining open. Well, that was kind of, I mean, that would, probably was not the best example I could come up with, but I mean, there's, I don't know what, you know what you really want from that, but yeah, there's. Okay. I'm just wondering what the specifics are, because you, you, you. Well, the specifics are, let, let's talk about uh, paid, like when the city of Austin required to have paid time off. So if I had a high school kid that was working for me and they worked like 60 hours, after 60 hours, they, they were, would get, could get 
up to eight hours off or whatever. I, it's the laws three or four years ago. So. You would agree that's never gone into effect and no, I totally will agree. not. And it was, and, and, and yeah, and, okay. you know, thankfully. Yeah. But but I think we want to understand that we want we want to have good health benefits for our staff, but it has to be something that we kind of work it through with how a profit. Sure. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand for the purposes of, of this bill, like what is the specific problem that you're experiencing in your business? Okay, the, the specific solve? problem of the bill, I think, is one is restrictive scheduling, predictive scheduling. I mean, it's, some of these things won't Have you run into us. that? In, I mean, has that directly impacted your business? Well, it hasn't passed yet as a law. Okay. But it, it, so it's a hypothetical it, for you right now. But but we do. But what what we do is we try to do a two week schedule. But it's going to change every time. And you know we have schedules that people have on their phones. They can change them. They trade them. They do that all all the time. So we want to be as you know flexible as we yeah, can. Yeah, and, and understand our industry. the flexible and fluid nature of the of a lot of different industries, including yes. the restaurant industry. But but that I mean just to be precise, that is. Predictive scheduling is not a, a ordinance or law that you have, you and your business have directly run into yet. No, we okay. are not. But that was in the original ordinance here in, in, in the city, and it's in California. There's a lot of right. Right. things. Well, I'm just talking about, about Texas, not California. Well, I'm talking about some things happen out there and somehow roll this way. So I'm sorry? I mean, sometimes things pass in other states, and someone says, that's a great idea. Let's do that here. Yeah. It's, but it hasn't. it hasn't. We know happened. It you have not directly experienced that yet in Texas. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you very much, Tom. Jenny Andrews. Jenny. Again, state your name, title, and position on the bill. Will do. Good afternoon. My name is Jenny Andrews. I'm a policy analyst at the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops. I'm testifying today in opposition to HB 2127. We have not had the opportunity to review the committee substitute uh, after we have had the chance. If it alleviates our concerns, such as striking references to the finance code, we would change our position. And in that case, we would update each member of the committee as well as the author. As introduced, this broad bill would preempt hundreds of local ordinances, but we are most concerned with payday lending ordinances. There are currently 49 cities that have ordinances in effect that establish a baseline of fair market prices for payday and auto title loans, which trap many families in unending debt uh, draining local charitable resources and harming local economies. Scroll down too far. We recognize the legitimate interest in protecting the livelihood of working Texans. And in fact, it's precisely this concern for working families which moves us to oppose the bill. The TCCB has worked for the last 12 years in partnership with local officials, community organizations, and local clergy to curb the abusive practices of payday and auto title lenders. We have many families that come to our Catholic Charities and St. Vincent de Paul societies that have the same problem, outstanding payday loan debt. They ask us for financial assistance as they are really left with few options. When left unchecked, this industry is known to prey on the poor with an average of two to 500% APR, where a $500 loan often costs one to $3,000 to repay. These rates are two to five times higher than the rates charged in other states where these loans are legal but have reasonable limits on the rates they can charge. For these reasons, the bishops throughout the state have all been personally involved in the passage of payday lending ordinances in each of their local dioceses. The passage of HB 2127 would directly undermine their work. These ordinances remain on strong legal ground following the 2015 ruling in Ace Cash Express versus the city of Denton. Despite that, this bill would provide a path by which the payday lending industry could strike down reforms and again pull Texans into a cycle of debt. For these reasons, we respectfully request that Representative Burroughs work with local faith communities to maintain the protections that our pastors have fought for in those communities and we ask the committee not to advance the bill as introduced. 
or to amend it striking section 1.004 in reference to the finance code. Thank you. Any questions, members? Yeah, Representative Dean. Like Ms. T, I got to find this button. Yeah, I got it. Uh, thank you for being here. And um, as, as a Catholic, cradle Catholic, I'm, I'm familiar with St. Vincent de Paul. You, you, you mentioned something about payday lending and uh, someone borrows 500, costs them one to $2,000 to pay it back or something. Is that, did I hear that correctly? I said one to 3,000, but yeah, I think that your statement would also be true. And you think that's, that's um, as, as part of, I don't know, the city, all the various cities. I know in, in Longview we have that, but even with those um, ordinances around, I, we saw how many various cities have those ordinances. You still think they pay that amount on a small loan? I believe that that was in reference to a place where the ordinance is not in place that those are the unrestricted rates mm -hmm. and in as i spoke with someone earlier you do understand that without those ordinances those i know we at saint vincent de paul we we do a lot of different things we pay a rent here and there and we we try to help out and most time we don't expect to be repaid right is that pretty much with uh you know from the conference of bishops they they pretty much see the same thing around the state Certainly we do a lot of charitable work without an expectation to be repaid, but we could do more charitable work if we did not have to pay these exorbitant rates to pay off auto title loans and payday lending loans. If we didn't, so you're saying that y'all or the Catholic Church pays off those, those payday lending or high dollar loans uh, if it's in a city that doesn't have an ordinance? In some cases, or we work with other charities charities or um, credit unions in those areas who are willing to work with people in great need. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, again, you do understand that, that desperate people do desperate things. And if they don't get the money from you or from a payday lending, they're going to find the money elsewhere at much higher or more exorbitant rates than what you're talking about. I would agree that desperate people do desperate things and that it is our obligation to protect them from being preyed upon and um, being taken advantage of in their time of need. But, I mean, they preyed upon, but, I mean, the fact that they're in that situation, and, and look, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't like it. I, I understand. I hate it for, for people. But when people get into that situation, they do some pretty stupid things because of the situation they're in. But um, I appreciate you being here. And uh, I, I've, I've heard, we've heard multiple times about it kind of, when you look at the finance code, it all goes back to the payday lending. Uh, and the majority of communities already have payday lending ordinances that I don't think um, we'll, we'll visit more and as, as the bill unfolds about how that would affect that. But I, I don't see or haven't seen evidence of where that is actually is an actuality. I'll be happy to get back with you uh, in more detail, but just to be brief in honor of uh, Chairman Hunter's request, as long as the finance code portion remains in the bill, we cannot be certain that this will not preempt our hard, hard fought wins in this area protecting the poor from payday, predatory payday lending. Okay, the only argument I would make is that that won't protect them either because if they don't get it there, they're going to get it elsewhere. But that opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Turner. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Andrews, so just to kind of continue this, this conversation, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with the, the fact pattern not as it relates to payday lending. So, Kath Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops and numerous other organizations have worked with cities around the state to enact payday lending ordinances and, and, and auto title lending ordinances. Is that right? That's correct. Over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. And that was done because of a lack of action in the legislature to regulate payday lending statewide. Is that fair to say? I would say yes, that that was the uh, avenue that was available to work on that issue to protect the poor. Right. And it, despite attempts by um, 
your organization and, and members of this body, including myself, to, to try to advance legislation here. That, that's not been successful. But local communities and organizations such as the Catholic Church have recognized that um, this is an insidious problem in many communities and um, has trapped uh, innumerable Texans in a cycle of debt that uh, they, they cannot escape when you factor in interest plus fees that you know, are equivalent to, you know, four or five hundred percent APR. I mean, yes, that, that's the data that's yes, out there, sir. right? And, and we heard earlier from a previous witness that in the last decade um, that uh, $18 billion of Texans' money has been wasted mm -hmm. paying, paying off, attempting to pay off, <laughs> paying the, the fees, basically, on payday and auto title loans. Is that right? That's also correct. Right. So... So 40, 49 cities, is that? Correct. Yeah, 49 cities around the state, including Arlington and Grand Prairie that I represent, have, have adopted ordinances because this was a, a problem in their communities. Uh, and, and I, I gather uh, Longview also uh, did um, from, from what my, my colleague said a few minutes ago. And, and that is in response to concerns from charitable organizations, including many associated with churches, not just the Catholic Church, but the the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, mosques, synagogues, et cetera, uh, where they, people running those charities were finding that they were uh, helping people who were in financial dire straits because they were trapped in this cycle of debt. Is that accurate? That is accurate. And there, I think there will be a witness coming up who can speak about um, the ministry of the Baptist Church and a, and a pastor who experienced meeting with these kind of clients and what they were able to do to help them and what, what the limitations were. And so charitable organizations were expending their hard, uh, hard earned money that they had raised, uh, you know, through charitable contributions to basically subsidize the petty lending industry as opposed to uh, getting that money directly into helping someone get on their feet. They're having to help them sort of just get off the ground uh, from from the cycle of debt that they're they're in, um, and as a result, and, and clear, these ordinances, you know, were some reforms. They didn't outright ban uh, these businesses from operating, but they they capped uh, the combined interest and fees at I think thirty six percent APR. Does that sound right? I don't have the percent on me, um, but I think that there is also a payment cap. Right. That there could only be four uh, reinitiations of the loan. Right, and I think you articulated this well in your testimony, but it bears repeating that uh, this has been tested in court, correct? That's right. And it has been upheld. That's right. Okay. And all of those forty-nine ordinances are in effect. So. Right, and if this bill passes, to your testimony, uh, your concern is is that uh, the sweeping nature of this legislation will preempt. Uh, cities' efforts to uh, what, what cities have done over the last decade and preempt the ordinance in Arlington, in Grand Prairie, in Longview, in Dallas, and cities all around the state, and will once again be sort of the Wild West when it comes to predatory lending. Absolutely, that's our concern. Okay, thank you. Other questions, members? Thank you very much. Rod Bordelon. Rod, come up and state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> my voice is getting a little hoarse uh, after a long day, um, and so I will be brief. Um, I was going to go on uh, on a few other matters, but I thought I'd kind of confine my comments to a couple of points that seem to be of issue. Well, let me help you oh, out. Oh, I'm sorry. Say your name, Rod your Bordelon. title, and your position. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Rod Bordelon, um, I am uh, here on behalf of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I am testifying in support of House Bill 2127. Um, so briefly, um, we support the bill because, like the bill's title, we do support, as others said, the consistency aspect. Uh, I've been around regulation for a long time, as you know, Mr. Chairman, um, and it has always been impressed upon me that regulation should always be fair, transparent, and consistent, and among other things. Um, but, but that consistency really is important for 
both the regulator as well as the regulated, um, as well as the public that is trying to determine whether they're regulated. And so I do think this bill um, does a good job of very clearly, although broadly, identifying the codes that are at issue here. And I will say that it also uh, further defines it in the, um, I, I finally uh, found the, um, uh, the substitute language, and I do think it is, it is made that a little clearer. The, the new language, instead of simply saying that uh, the provisions of the code preclude municipalities and counties from adopting or enforcing an ordinance in a field occupied by the provisions of the code, it now says it precludes adopting or enforcing the ordinance regulating conduct in a field that is occupied by a provision of the code. So in a sense, it's saying that local ordinance cannot regulate an activity that is otherwise already regulated in that state code. So that is some, uh, and I think uh, Representative Burroughs was speaking to that about just because it's mentioned in the code, just because that activity is generally mentioned in the code is not is so much the issue. The issue is whether or not that ordinance is regulating it and whether or not the code is regulating it, in which case now you have that, um, that potential conflict. It could already be a conflict, as Representative Burroughs stated, in which case it should be overthrown. But even without a specific finding of conflict, um, it would be precluded in this act. I would also state that, um, that much was mentioned earlier about the uh, Laredo uh, case, and I too am from Laredo. Apparently we've got several people here, uh, Representative Raymond. Um, uh, but in that Laredo uh, case with the uh, the bag ban, uh, ban that bag ban. Sorry, <clears throat> um, the uh, the language about uh, about the uh, um, you know needing to find. Uh, um, I was just a, a clear and un appear with clear and unmistakable clarity. Um, it was referring to the intent to to uh, preempt by the legislature. The the the, uh, the court was very clear about that and saying that it could even be expressed or implied, but it is the intent that they're looking for that must be clear and unmistakable, not whether the actual action was in fact preempted. And you notice we're getting all the lawyers going past the three minutes here. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. <coughs> Any questions, member? Representative Dean. Well, they do work by the hour, Chair, yeah. I mean. <laughs> Mr. Bordelon, so you're from Laredo? Well, I grew up in like Laredo. I was like born in uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana. Of my dad's you family, are. of course, is from Louisiana. Uh, of and course, my mother you were. is from Laredo. How many people know how to say Bordelon over here? Uh, uh, not very many. That's <laughs> it quite okay. well. Thank you. Hey, we've been talking. You've been here, and I just want to, you know, I know I'm, we've visited before on some other committees and whatnot, and very impressed with your background, especially regulatory. We've been talking about the payday lending. And I don't want to throw you into the into the gumbo pot here, but uh, in, did did we not pass rules or regulations by the state as regards that issue? And I think the commission there was a commission that was sunsetted back in 2019, but did uh, but did it do away with with a state you know code or state rule? So um, let me let me. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, no, no, that's fine. I, I'll 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 accept it. Um, I will say that I'm not an expert in the payday lending area, okay. um, but but I certainly understand that there are some state laws dealing with well with finance in general that apply to payday lending. Okay. Um, I think the issue would would be um, like it would be in some of these a lot of these situations that keep coming up is again to the extent that a specific local ordinance is trying to regulate an activity of payday lending, is that activity that that ordinance regulates, is, is that also regulated in that code, in the finance code in this case? Right. Um, and if it is, then under this bill, that would arguably um, preempt that local ordinance. If it's not, then it's a simply an, an ordinance that's regulating some other activity than the state is regulating in the finance. Code. Yes, sir. So if if there's already statute or there's rules law on the books, and again, since 2018, 2019, whenever commission sunsetted, they're already in place. And then cities started putting 
in their own payday uh, loan ordinances. If, if they ran afoul to Texas state general, general law state, uh, they would have been they would have been nullified or they would have been problems at that point in time, correct? If, if they were in conflict with the state laws on payday lending, they would have been in conflict and could have been overturned at that time. But it, but it would appear to me that 2019, and we've had so many of these payday lending ordinances by cities all around the state put in place, uh, that had that been a problem, we would have been hearing about that um, a lot sooner than now. Uh, is that is that a reasonable assumption that uh, that's the assumption that i would make yes okay all right thank you any other questions members thank you rod thank appreciate you, it members. john litzler john state your name your title and position on the bill yes sir good afternoon chairman committee members thank you my name is John Litzler. I am general counsel for the Baptist General Convention of Texas, the Texas Baptist Christian Life Commission, um, and I'm speaking in opposition to House Bill 2127. Um, we're a convention of more than 5,300 Baptist churches across the state of Texas, and I'm speaking in opposition to the bill because of the cern concerns that it would preempt payday lending ordinances in the 49 cities that have already passed them in Texas. I know that this is a conversation that has already been had and I don't want to retread old ground, but I will say that I think it makes for a really good example of how broad this bill is and the concerns with it because it would it, it's covered under the finance code, but it's covered very generally in the sense that chapter 393 of the finance code addresses credit service organizations. And that's how payday lenders get around this loophole, this lending loophole where that lenders can't lend more than 10% but they register as credit service organizations under Chapter 393. Now, Chapter 393 does not tell the, the uh, payday lenders how much interest they can charge or how much fees they can charge or any of that kind of stuff. And that's why these laws, these local ordinances, have been held to be in compliance and not preempted by state law. The problem with field preemption is it's so broad that just because Chapter 393 addresses how credit service organizations can work, it's gonna preempt all of these local ordinances. So now why have churches gotten involved? Why are you about to hear from a pastor and why have you heard from the Catholics? Because churches are, are, have heard these concerns, they've been brought to them by folks in their community and in response, pastors have led grassroots efforts in their communities to adopt municipal or ordinances that put payday regulation in place. It hasn't put payday lenders out of business. People aren't having to turn to loan sharks because payday lenders are gone, it's just put reasonable regulations on them on those loans. And so our pastors have worked at local levels. They've done a lot of good hard work listening to the needs of their community. They've helped to pay off loans. Some of our churches have um, started their own micro loan groups. Some of our churches have gone and gotten certified. They, they've opened up a new nonprofit that is a federal credit union to be able to do loans to help pe provide alternatives and keep people from having to uh, deal with payday loans. And so we're concerned that this bill would preempt all of that hard work that our pastors and our churches have done. Thank you, sir. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Is it Ellie Cross? Oh. L Cross, please come up. So, Elle, if you'll state your name, title, and position on the bill. You looked at me like you knew it was me already. <laughs> My name is L. Cross. I'm here with Mano Amiga, and I am speaking against HB 2127. Um, I'm the Right to Justice Coordinator with Mano Amiga, a grassroots nonprofit based in Hayes County that works to protect our most vulnerable community members from sweeping immigration and legal policies. I'm here to speak against HB 2127 because I am concerned about the impacts of further encroaching on local players to decide what is best for their community. I live in a small town in one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. Our needs are constantly evolving and we frequently have to reassess the way that policies impact our population. Texas is one of the most diverse states in the United States, and for that reason, the policies that govern us cannot be generalized. 
People have different needs, and when state policy supersedes local decision-making, it strips people of their essential autonomy. This bill has serious impacts on democracy. Local advocates who bring communities together will lose the tool of ballot initiatives to amend policy to be responsive to their needs. Even ordinances adopted with a supermajority of votes would become void within the scope of this bill. This body should be pushing for a bipartisan effort to increase the power of local communities who have the most knowledge on what policies are best for them. I have personally worked in fighting for an ordinance to decriminalize low-level possession of marijuana in our city, and I can tell you right now that bringing a new ordinance to a city is an incredibly difficult process and um, a feat that requires an immense amount of resources, education, and public support. These potential boogeyman ordinances that this bill preempts just silences the voice of the people and stunts change, which is incredibly difficult to reach even in the status quo. There is bipartisan support across Texas for the decriminalization of low-level cannabis possession. Cities and counties are stepping in where the state legislature has made promises and failed, and this bill stops that in its tracks. Especially in fast-growing counties where jail populations are increasing exponentially, it is critical to reassess the way that resources are spent, and the legislature simply has not moved forward at the pace that many Texan communities are prepared for. Ordinances that are brought forward with majority support of the communities who are impacted by them and allows their, their taxpayer dollars to be allocated to what best serves them should not be challenged by a body that is not familiar with their needs. This bill opens a door for endless litigation that will lead to constant wasted resources and time that you, could be used to actually invest in our communities and research and adopt ordinances that serve locales. Almost all of the speakers in favor of this bill are speaking about issues around business owners Ownership, but this bill affects so much more than just that, and the impacts are dangerous. If you want to regulate business, then limit a bill to just that without having such sweeping generalizations that impact so many sectors. Thank you, Al. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert Mayfield. Robert, if you'll state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Okay. I'm Robert Mayfield. I have the Dairy Queens, the Mayfield DQs in the Austin area, and one part in and other places, so we've got a lot of stores. I'm uh, for 21-27, the one to preempt, you know, the, to preempt the cities from doing things that can really, would, would try to hurt us, would hurt us. So, you know, small business like us, we can't, we don't have lobbyists and stuff like that. We need the protection of the state from what some of these cities actually did try to do to us it's just a few years ago, just a couple of years ago. We had, uh, well, they, they say, I'm in Austin, they say about the city of Austin that they don't care what you do just as long as it's mandatory. So, <laughs> but, and, and that's right. Now, they tried, just over oh, the last two years or something like that, they tried to pass and did pass, but it, fortunately it was a kill for now in the courts, a sick leave ordinance. Well, I have stores in Cedar Park. I got stores in you know, Cameron. I got stores in Lockhart and then in Austin. Let's just say you talk about impossible to do. Let's, let's just say that I was going to have a, one of my employees from Cedar Park Dairy Queen come to work in town. Well, are they covered by that ordinance? You know, it, uh, this patchwork, patchwork of, of ordinances in various cities is just not going to work for anybody except maybe somebody in there. But that, that wasn't all that, that, you talk, that you hear about. That they also wanted to have what's called a, um, see, it's predictive scheduling, I believe. So what that would have been had they been able to pass it, if it was on the books, is okay. You have to make your schedules two weeks in advance. It's, uh, man, you, we can't even tell if we're going to be staffed that week, much less two days. I mean, two weeks in advance. So uh, the 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 thing that happened in the in the in the courts was for now it stopped, but we need your help to make sure it can't you know come back and hurt us. You know, we're the, you know, geez. Um, I think sometimes these people believe that they can run their business better than I can. Well, you know, that's not true. I bet none of them can even mix a blizzard to the bottom of the cup. <laughs> so, look, I'm, I'm representative of lots and lots of small businesses. 
you know, we really would appreciate your help uh, so we don't, you know, we don't get in the same situation again. Because it's stopped for now, just in those court cases, doesn't mean it couldn't happen again. And there's a lot of people out there want things like that to happen. So thanks for listening. Thank you. Representative Raymond. Excuse me, hold on a second. Sure. Thank you, and, and thank all the witnesses who've come, really. This is a serious issue, but I, I, I don't know. when. Where was Dairy Queen started? Like, where was the first Dairy Queen? The first Dairy Queen? Not yours, Dairy. not your first one, but the first one. In, in Illinois? That's what I, you know, people think it's Texas. 1940. Yeah, people think it's Texas, but it's not. No. But best ice cream, no doubt about it. Sure Blizzards. I love blizzards, but I have a question for you. Sure. Have, just, have you all never had corn dogs? <laughs> we have had corn dogs. But you don't have them now. We don't have them now, and the reason for that is you just didn't buy enough for us to keep them. <laughs> <laughs> they are good. We can take a special order and get some. I don't know. People tell me all the time that they'd go to Dairy Queen more if you all had corn dogs. <laughs> I'm just telling you. They go over to Sonic, and they're, I'm sorry, but their ice cream, nothing, doesn't even get close to you, but they got corn dogs. Well, that's, well, I would say good for them. <laughs> Just work on that. I'll work on that. When we come back for the next bill, we'll have them in place. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, welcome. Thanks for testifying. Frequent user of your, your products in the Man, Dallas it's got area. good taste. Hey, they're delicious. Uh, my, my daughters ask for them on a regular basis. Just out of curiosity, I'm, a, I'm also a small business owner. We have 40 employees. We offer paid sick leave. It's kind of, you know, our industry standard. Um, do you offer paid sick leave, number one? And number two, do your peers, any of your peers offer paid sick leave? I don't think any of I don't know about that, if they do or not, the other people. We have different ways of taking pe taking care of people like that. We, if, if somebody has to be sick for a while, then we, we, we do take care of them. We just don't have a, a formal thing with an insurance company with paid sick. We've never had an issue with it because of that. You know, if you don't take but care of But you don't of your, dock people pay for, for being sick. But sorry. You, I'm sorry, but you don't dock people pay for if they get sick. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No, no we, we take care of them. Otherwise, Any other questions? I'd be over there mixing blizzards. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you. Andrew? I'm going to let you say the name, so come on up. So, Andrew, come up, uh, say your name and your title and position on the bill. Uh, my name is Andrew Maglich. Um, I'm an organizer with Mano Amiga in San Marcos, um, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Mano Amiga against House Bill 2127. Um, this bill is an extremely dangerous and misguided power grab that would effectively end local governance um, and destroy the democratic process at the local level as we know it. Not only would this bill undo years of work that communities have put into improving their lives, but it would have wide-reaching unintended consequences that would become a legal nightmare for municipalities and for the state. I want to begin by discussing the brutal impact that this bill would have on working-class Texans. The state of labor law and workers' rights in our state is abysmal. Texas remains one of the few states that does not mandate water breaks for construction workers. To prevent the unnecessary deaths of these workers, the cities of Austin and Dallas have mandated 10-minute water breaks for these workers under city law. This bill would not only strip these workers of their hard-fought rights for basic workplace safety, but also would prevent municipalities from taking even the most basic steps. Andrew, yes. bring the mic down just a little bit. I'm so there sorry about Keep that. Keep going. Um, the most basic steps to protect their workers, which we know this legislature will not likely do itself. This bill would also directly undermine the progress that communities have built in recent years. I find it concerning that Representative Burroughs is expressing that this bill is intended to stop ordinances and policies that he does not agree with. Local control is about allowing municipalities the ability to make the decisions that are best for their communities regarding the unique issues that are facing their constituents. It is not about forcing municipalities to work under the strict preferences of the state legislature or to only pass policies and ordinances that members of this committee and the body as a whole agree with. Reigning in local governments because you do not like their policies is a vast overreach of big government in a state that prides itself on small and limited government. Each session, a number of legislators, Republicans and Democrats, make commitments to cannabis reform, from <coughs> decriminalization to legal medical use. And each session, this legislature fails to make good on its commitments. Cities across Texas have stepped up to act where this legislature has failed to do so in large democratic processes. 
In my city of San Marcos, we decriminalized misdemeanor marijuana possession at the city level in the largest and most participatory ballot initiative process in the city's history. We passed our ordinance with over 83% of the vote and with more than 1,400 voters voting in this race than any other citywide race. The mandate from voters, conservatives, and progressives alike is clear, and the author of this bill knows that. However, this bill, this bill clearly has no concern for local democracy or participatory governance. Um, lastly, I would like to point to a couple sections of the bill, but I see that my time um, is running low. Um, but Section 102A002 of the bill reads that remedies a claimant is entitled to recover in an action brought under this chapter, one declaratory and injunctive relief and costs and reasonable attorney's fees is very concerning. I'll be here to answer any questions if you have. And what's the other section? The other section I'm concerned with is 102A005, which reads person. For purposes of the section, person means an individual, corporation, business trust, estate, trust, partnership, limited liability company, association, joint venture, government, governmental subdivision, agency or instrumentality, public corporation or any legal or commercial entity or protected series or registered series of a for-profit entity. I can explain why that concerns me if you'd like, but I understand there's a time. You have the time, but I wanted the author to hear the two sections behind you. Thank you. Sure. Members, you have any questions? Thank you. And uh, again, I had you state that so that he could get the information that you stated. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. Much. Amos Humphreys. And Again, I'd like the other to state the name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Reverend Dr. Amos Humphreys. I'm the senior pastor of Park Lake Drive Baptist Church in Waco, Texas. <clears throat> I'm testifying this morning on behalf of the Texas Baptist Christian Life Commission in opposition to House Bill 2127. David was a special needs senior adult who had outlived his parents and his siblings. As a member of my church, David asked for prayer after a Sunday morning while he declared bankruptcy later on that week. After examining his finances with him, I was shocked to find that his SSI check in the amount of $1,600 was deposited on the first of the month, his rent was immediately taken out, and by the third of the month, David was at a negative balance due to payday loans. Um, Pam, another member of my church who's a widowed grandmother, lost her car due to owing $45 at the end of her loan that she failed to pay on time. This is why seven years ago in Waco, members of the faith community worked with our local government to protect those who are vulnerable among us. I understand predatory, predatory lending is a multi-billion dollar industry in Texas. And I'm not requesting an abolishment of the practice, even though that'd be nice. I merely appeal to you to allow local municipalities their God-given responsibility to protect the most vulnerable among their citizens. And as a representative of pastors in the front lines of dealing with people in crisis, please don't make our job harder as we work with our city governments to protect those. Thank you for con your consideration. Thank you very much. Any questions, members? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for much. your time. Chairman. You have a question? Uh, real quick. Reverend, come right. Reverend. Um, so I, I guess I, maybe I should have asked other witnesses, but I'll ask you. So if, if you were convinced that this legislation did not affect payday lending, then would you be for it? I'd have to be convinced. Anything that comes close to affecting that situation for me is... If you were convinced that it did not affect... You'd have to convince me. I'm not convinced I, I, at this well, point. Well, Pastor, I, I, yeah. I'm asking you. Right. You try to convince us all the time on our faith. So <laughs> right. I'm, I'm asking you, right. if you were convinced then would you support it? If I, if, if I was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that it, it would not affect the vulnerable in our community, I would support it. Okay, shadow of a doubt. Got it. Right. Got it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Mitchell. Okay. Well, Kathy, what we'll do then is we'll note that your present do not want to testify. Put it back on. And you're here against HB 2127. So we'll note that on the record. Daniela Hernandez.
And Danielle, I'd like the others, give us your name, title, and position on the bill. Good afternoon, chair and members of the committee. My name is Daniel Hernandez. I am the state legislative coordinator at Workers Defense, and I'm here to testify against House Bill 2127. Workers Defense is a statewide or member-based organization fighting for better working conditions for low-wage workers and immigrants in Texas. I think it's important for the committee to listen and hear from workers, the folks that keep our businesses running, and how this bill will harm them. I will now share testimony from one of our members, Yvonne Gonzalez, who was gonna be here to testify, but unfortunately she had to leave early. Every human being has a right to dignified and just work, regardless of what kind of job they are in. The person who picks up trash is just as important as the person who cleans the restrooms you use, even more so the person who builds the city you live in and where you find everything that we need to live. We build Texas. It's us who, with our tired hands and feet, raise apartment buildings so that hundreds of families can have a roof to sleep under. We build shopping centers where you can find the things that you need. So then, why take away our right to have a 10-minute rest break or water break after having worked hours under different weather conditions, whether that's extreme heat or cold, just so that we can keep working? House Bill 2127 would take these breaks away from us. Many of us have been victims, victims of unscrupulous people who are placed as our supervisors and don't want to allow you to take even a minute to allow you to breathe. Don't they understand that a worker performing their job under good working conditions is more enthusiastic about making sure their performance is excellent? If the state doesn't want to take care of their labor, of us, then at least allow our cities to do so. Do not allow us to be the victims of wage theft either. This is how we can give a dignified life for our families. I really hope that this committee thinks of Yvonne and the thousands of workers in Texas just like her who would be harmed by the passage of this bill. I urge you to please vote no on House Bill 2127. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Annie Spillman. And Annie, as the others, state your name, title, and position on the bill. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Annie Spillman, and I'm with NFIB Texas. I'm testifying in favor of House Bill 2127. Um, I'd like to let the committee know that um, this is a bill that we have worked on um, for the last five years, the business community, uh, a coalition of businesses, um, and we were happy that Chairman Burroughs uh, decided to um, carry this legislation and many of you that have stood next to him in doing that. Um, you all know what the business community has been through in the last um, three years with the pandemic, supply chain issues, labor shortages, Fed rate hikes, uh, you know, 40 year high inflation. I don't need to tell you that. What I'm gonna do is just get into sort of the nitty gritty. Um, many of these ordinances that we've seen have had hidden subpoena power in them. Um, in the Austin ordinance, Yes, it's not in effect. The paid sick leave ordinance is from Dallas to Austin to San Antonio because the business community spent years fighting those in the court. Um, and it was uh, enjoined by the third court of appeals because they found out that it, fi it violated our Texas Minimum Wage Act, which currently is the only preemption that we've got. Um, but it had subpoena power in there that the cities would have over employers' records and their employees' records. Um, the Workers' Defense Project that is run by the labor unions would have overseen um, that paid sick leave program and administered it. Um, there's a whole bunch of uncertainty. I know that cities, you know, were saying they, they, with this piece of legislation that's come through, they've spent weeks trying to figure out what it's been doing. They've had all their many, many attorneys look at this. Yes. Oh my goodness. I mean, think about what the small businesses have had to do that don't have in-house attorneys that these ordinances have, have passed in the middle of the night and they don't have in-house attorneys. So I'm glad that these cities have, um, are dealing with this legislation through a bicameral process, through the committee process, and their multiple attorneys have had the chance to look at this and we're vetting this through this very process. Um, but you know, I will tell you that the, the business community wants to take care of the people that work with them. They are their family members. They want to provide for them. This is a competitive market. Small business owners are, right now, 60% of small business owners are not able to fill positions. And of those positions that are unfilled, they cannot find skilled workers. So they're doing everything they can to keep those positions. 
and they're gonna they're increasing wages even though they're losing revenue. They're doing everything to provide the benefits. Um, they're gonna provide their safety. And as far as I'm concerned, um, we've done everything to make sure that this is a good piece of legislation that everybody's taking care of and not to take away city power, but to give business owners the tools that they need to make sure that these cities are not going above and beyond their jurisdiction. Um, because with the paid sick leave ordinance as an example, they probably knew it was unconstitutional, but they filed it and passed it anyway. And we spent years litigating it. Thank you. Members, any questions? Oh, Representative Turner. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, Annie. Um, so I want to, to acknowledge, I mean, the, the paid sick leave ordinance never went into effect. It's not going to go into effect yet. Do you still think this legislation is necessary because of the paid sick leave ordinance? No, sir. Uh, not just because. It, it started in 2018 when we did start to see the paid sick leave ordinance um, passed in Austin, thereafter in San Antonio, and then in Dallas. And then after that, we, it was this trend that we really hadn't seen before the business community that we started to see cities um, begin to regulate private employment practices, um, predictive scheduling in ULIS, and um, then we saw criminal background check uh, local ordinances in Austin and DeSoto. We saw some, um, some other ordinances, the Fair Work, Fair Work Week ordinance, the Austin City Council publicly stated that they wanted to pass that. Overtime fairness was the ULIS one. Um, several cities have passed the fair chance hiring. Um, the, the um, oh, I'm sorry, Austin during the, uh, the COVID passed the declawing of the cats, regulating veterinarian practices. Um, oh goodness, what am I mentioning? There's several others. So sure, like and, and, and I'm sure there's, you know, you pull out a lot of, of different examples around the state, but I mean, there's been a lot of focus on paid sick leave today. And, and I just, uh, yeah. not, not, not just from you, but from a lot of no, witnesses. No, I understand. And, uh, and just so everyone's clear, they never went into effect. They're not going to go into effect. Right. Um, but but I want to ask you because I've heard. I don't know if you said it exactly this way, but a number of witnesses in support of the bill have said that one of the problems they had with things like paid sick leave is that I think the the gentleman here who owned a, some Dairy Queens talked mm -hmm. about you know you had this ordinance in Austin, but he has a store in Cedar Park or another community that does not mm -hmm. have that. And so that patchwork is, is a problem. And then you said that you want to make sure your members want to make sure they take care of their employees. Correct. Right. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, would you, I mean, would you support, would your organization support this, a statewide paid sick leave law? Well, we've been before your previous committee, um, and we've talked through these types of statewide, um, paid sick leave uh, proposals. And we've sat at the table as sta stakeholders and talked through that. I'll tell you that typically we don't support statewide mandates okay. that tell employers, um, you know, how to. So it doesn't matter who really who's saying it, it's about the substance of it. I mean, you just, you just don't support paid sick leave. We totally support paid sick leave. We don't support government mandates telling employers how to run their businesses or how to take care of their employees. It's part of the reason that, that keeps them competitive as employers. Small businesses, um, you know, can say, I offer this and I do this and I do that. And it's what, and, and I treat you like a family member. And if you want to go to your choir concert, I'm not going to say this is part of your paid sick leave. Um, pay time off, no questions asked, do what you need to do. And it's, it's the employer employee relationship. And, and, and that's part of being a small business center. And that's great when it works, but sometimes it doesn't work. So, I mean, I just want to get to the, the, the root cause of a lot of the, the opposition here. I mean, it's, it's being directed at, you know, we're talking about a local preemption bill. And so right. it's being directed at cities that have embraced these policies or considered these policies, which I think is two or three in the whole state. But... But in reality, a lot of this opposition is just based on a fundamental disagreement with the policy, that, that we don't think the government, whether it's the local government, the state government, the federal government, should say you got to have paid, offer well, paid sick leave. I'll, I'll, I'm you, being you, totally you, genuine with you, Mr. Chairman. It, that is not the root cause. I, I'm being genuine with you. You just I said say. that you. No, don't no, no. I, I'm telling you that when the city of Austin, we were not part of the conversation and the stakeholders were not because I spoke with the local chambers and they were hiding and it was, you know, 
if you had anybody that worked 40 hours in a calendar year, not in a week, that they would then have to mandate this paid sick leave. And if even you were accused of violating this ordinance, the city had subpoena power over your records and all kinds of crazy stuff. The root is not just because we disagree with the ordinance. It's because if we're gonna have these conversations about these types of mandates on employers, then we need to do it up here. And if it's the will of That's why I asked the question, would you support our efforts to do it and your answer if was we no. Just supported it or not, it's up to you all to decide if that's a, if that's something that if, if you all want to mandate that on employers, if then if my if I make my case up here and I make a good case, then then you'll support the business community. If I don't make a good case, then you're going to say we need to mandate this on employers. I understand, but I just, again, your organization is fundamentally opposed to the role of government in adhering certain, in, in instituting certain workplace yeah, standards. My organization supports the small businesses who want to have control over what they're doing in their private businesses. Okay, yeah, that answers my question. It does. Thank you. Yeah. Chairman Thompson. What organization you represent, Nanny? Yes, ma'am, uh, the National Federation of Independent Business. And I think I'm hearing through, through the course of your testimony that you just don't want government dictating to you all, right? I think there needs to be laws that, you know, keep in place safety standards, um, just like with anything else. Um, but when it comes to the employee-employer relationship in regard to mandating certain, you know, benefits and, and, th and things like that, that that relationship needs to stay within um, the business owner and their uh, employees, especially for a small business owner because the more mandates, the more compliance, the more cost. You know, we're not the, the Walmarts of the world, um, you know, that make it super easy to comply with these sorts of things. So you, 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 none of your uh, people took it in that PPP money, right? Our people did, and it saved them because With they, the mandates? The, our people did take in the PPP money. You know what they did with it? They made payroll. And you know, they did not, they, all that money went directly to their payroll or to pay rent so they could stay I mean, open. but it had, so it had mandates to attached people. to it and y'all took it? That's absolutely right, they did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, and they kept the restaurants open so they continued to employ people. Well, it was more than restaurants that was taking it. I mean, does that... Don't no, I didn't, I didn't say restaurants. I heard restaurants in the audience, yeah. but I, I knew there was, I think there were more than restaurants. Right. That you know, may, what, may one thing I'll always remember... That money. Ms. T, one thing I'll always remember is that, you know, years ago when we were working on legislation, you said that you respected that I needed to represent Damn. the people that I represent, and that's the small business. I, I sure do, and I respect and, the right And I right do, and I'm telling you, these, these are the most And I respect the right of women getting equal pay, too. You remember yes. that? And yes, ma'am, okay, I do. Right. Yes, ma'am, I do. All right. Yes, ma'am. See, uh -huh. good memory. That's the reason why you've been here for so long, because you have good memory. Give my regards to your businesses and don't let them know that I'm still for that position. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good to see you, Annie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. David with Workers' Defense. David, you're going to have to come up here and say it. But thank you, David. David, again, uh, say your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Sounds good. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is David Chinkenshin. I am the policy director with Workers Defense, and I'm speaking in opposition to HB 2127. So, um, good afternoon again. My name is David Chinkenshin. I serve as a policy director for Workers Defense, and Workers Defense is a statewide organization that works alongside construction workers and workers in other low wage industries to advocate for good paying, high quality jobs and for common sense, life saving worker protections in those jobs. And I'm here to testify in opposition to HB 2127. HB 2127 is such an overreaching and devastating bill that it's truly difficult to measure all of the harm it will cause cities and counties throughout Texas and to understand the different ways that it will obstruct them from being able to serve the basic needs of their communities. While we don't know the full extent of the impact as is evidenced by all of the discussion here today, we do know the many ways that it will definitely and negatively impact and punish Texas workers. And I would like to provide some context and to highlight one in particular. Texas has long been one of the most dangerous places for construction workers to do their jobs. As you likely know, Texas is the only state in the nation that doesn't guarantee any kind of workers' compensation. 
workers in construction face wage theft, misclassification, harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. And they are often asked to work in extremely dangerous conditions with inadequate safety training and equipment and with little regard for their health and safety. Because of these conditions, a construction worker dies once every three days in Texas and thousands more are injured every year. Many of those workers experience heat illnesses like heat stroke caused by working in the extreme heat that Texas summers bring. That's why workers in our state, including worker leaders with our organization, have spent years advocating for safer standards and conditions. And because of their advocacy, several cities have vetted policies, they've engaged stakeholders, and ultimately they've approved ordinances with common sense, life-saving protections like guaranteed water breaks. And we're just talking about 10 minute rest breaks that allow workers to drink water and cool off after spending at least four hours working in the heat. HB 2127 would strip that away, would strip away these hard earned rights from the hands of workers and worse, it would restrict them from being able to continue working within their own communities and local elected leaders to advocate for themselves and their neighbors, to develop and implement solutions that work for them. We should be doing more for Texas workers, not less. We should be doing more to care for our fellow Texans, not getting in the way of others who are actually trying to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Any questions, members? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Tim Morstan. Tim, state your name, your title, and your position on the bill. Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Tim Morstead, uh, Senior Associate State Director for AARP Texas. And um, we are here today, I am here to oppose House Bill 2127. Um, you've heard some of the concerns, so I won't go over them, uh, but to state, we are concerned about how this bill would harm older Texans by undoing the municipal ordinances that relate to abusive lending in our state. Um, we've heard in just a minute about why older Texans care about this one. About one in five uh, payday lender, uh, payday loan borrowers in the state are 50 or older and countless other older Texans have helped their kids and grandkids break free from these high cost loans. The action that's been going on across the state for the last 10 to 12 years at the local level is very encouraging. These are very basic protections. These aren't even regulating the interest rates. This is not harsh and severe stuff that's throwing these, these lenders out of our state. Um, a couple comments re really briefly. Uh, Chairman Burroughs suggested that this might not even be an issue, that this type of ordinance might be preempted. I encourage you to be laser focused and make sure that that is not a cloud of uncertainty that lasts very long. Uh, it's, it's our position that the ordinances that are in place are proper and will continue to stand and are in jeopardy by uh, this bill. Uh, what Chairman Burroughs didn't say uh, was that the payday and auto title lending ordinances would not be impacted by this bill. Um, so we really need to get to the bottom of that, but it's our position that it would be. Um, we ask for you to take a close look at this, and if it's true that 95% of the ordinances that are currently out there uh, would be untouched by this bill, we want to make sure that those payday and auto title lending ordinances are in that 95%. Thank you, Tim. Any questions, members? Sure. Representative Raymond. Sure. So then you would support it? We'd so we would support, uh, we would withdraw our opposition to this Thank bill. Thank you. If we felt that older Texans were not harmed. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Chairman Thompson. There has been some testimony today regarding persons, uh, if this legislation were passed, person inability to be able to have water breaks. So if you were satisfied with the payday lending part and knew that this other part would, uh, would make, was there, you would support the bill 
anyway? No, let, let me be clear. Uh, we would Please. withdraw our opposition. If the payday lending piece was taken, we would withdraw our opposition. But I do want to further review the bill to see its broader impact on older Texans before we do that. I have looked at the, the payday and auto title lender provision, and it really concerns me, the reference to the finance code. So let me try that again. I'll be crystal clear. The people clear. who are complaining about that, that they would, it would impede water breaks. Yep. So the payday lending part, if that would become satisfactory to you, the people who's, who's alleging impediment of water breaks, that would matter. It would be something that I'd like to look at. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Any Mr. other? Chairman. Yes, yeah, Chair. Sure. Any other questions, members? Thank you, Tim. Avon Gonzalez. Avon Gonzalez. Okay. We got. We got it. Yvonne Gonzalez will note that she registered but did not testify, but she is against HB 2127. Lauren Johnson. Lauren Johnson. Lauren Johnson. We will note that she registered, did not testify. She's with the ACLU, but registered against HB 2127. Bennett Sandlin. Bennett, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Bennett Sandlin. I'm the executive director of the Texas Municipal League. Thank you for hearing from us today. I am opposed to the bill, but before I tell you why, I want to start out by thanking Chairman Burroughs for taking our input, uh, which he has done in this process. So Representative Dean asked, pointed out earlier that he's heard that Chairman Burroughs' door is open on this bill this session, and I can attest to that. We've been invited to multiple meetings. We've submitted language, and some of those ideas have shown up in this substitute, so we do appreciate that. We're still opposed to this bill for its overall concept. This bill is one of a new trend, not just in Texas, but around the country, of what we at TML call super preemption bills. Super preemption means, unlike the old days, we don't just tackle a topic, be it plastic bags or minimum wage. We say broadly, we're gonna preempt Texas cities in whole categories. This bill does it through different codes. There's a bill in the Senate, I won't get into too much, it does it if it addresses commerce. There was a bill in Florida last year that was much more punitive. It said, any ordinance, we're not gonna name what the ones we don't like, but if it harms business, you have to pay business for their lost profits. That bill was so bad, the governor had to veto it. So the concept of super preemption is risky precisely because we don't know what we're talking about. Think of all the dialogue we've had today here just deciding if this bill covers payday, just deciding if it covers short-term rentals. Why are we spending so much energy? Let's go back to the old days of tackling a topic, debating it, and putting it to rest. We don't always win. I don't like preemption, but I like to know what I'm up against. Uh, so this idea that the legislature shouldn't have to engage in whack-a-mole, I'm here today to tell you I'm an advocate for whack-a-mole. I not only think it was the best game at Chuck E. Cheese, I think it's actually a good concept for this legislature. What y'all do best is take on discrete issues, hear from the stakeholders, and reach a, a, a reasonable decision. That's what we did on House Bill 40. Do y'all remember that? I sure do. Uh, Chairman Darby put me and Todd Staples in a room and says, you guys worked this out. And we came back with a bill, an agreed to bill, that preempted cities on fracking. I wasn't happy about that. My members weren't thrilled. But more importantly, it preserves things from our perspective, such as distance regulations for wells. We had an agreed to bill, it passed, it was on one topic. And how much litigation have we had since House Bill 40? Nothing, because it was clear, it was <coughs> concise, and it was on topic. <coughs> I like the old days of whack-a-mole preemption. I don't like the preemption. I like the approach. Super preemption where you can't even, you can read this bill, and there's not one mention of any of the things in here <coughs> may or may not be preempted. There's nothing about paid sick leave. There's nothing about auto title lending. There's nothing. It's silent. 
It's super preemption, which is a, another way of saying vague, vague <coughs> preemption. I think it's well-intentioned. Like the chairman, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I like the idea of being able to kill 50 birds with one stone, but it's risky. Let's stick with what we know. Let's go topic by topic. There are 8,200 bills filed this session on much more discreet things than payday lending. Let's have a hearing on those issues, tackle them one by one. That's my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ben. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, Chairman Thompson. Would you, I didn't hear the part of super preemption. Would you state that again, please? Super preemption is kind of a new trend in preempting cities where you don't say in the bill what it is you're preempting, but instead you reference a concept. In this case, it's eight different state codes. Mm -hmm. That's good in intention, but in practice, we don't have any idea. We spent all our day today deciding what topics this bill covers rather than talking about those topics. So if this bill passes, and let's say it does preempt payday lending, we will have had a hearing on this bill. We will have never had a hearing on payday lending. It's such an important topic. Why can't we devote three hours to that topic? We're, we're really just talking about whether this bill covers it or not. So that's the problem with super preemption. It's too broad. It's too vague. It's too 30,000 foot view. Let's get into those individual topics. Let me ask you another question. Yes, ma'am. If the city said, a city has an order that says that you can't have chickens on a city limit yes, next to your neighbor, maybe 10 feet, and this bill passes, and somebody decided to put a chicken farm next door to my house, then that order that the city uh, is just out of the window, right? May or may not be. You may be absolutely right. I'm happy to report there's at least four chicken bills filed this session, and we've had some hearings, and they're entertaining. Uh -huh. But that's good government. Let's talk about chickens. Mm -hmm. Let's get down in the weeds. Because I know agriculture was mentioned in here. The ag code covers raising of animals. Mm -hmm. uh, could you have cat? Could you chickens are kind of fun to talk about because they're not that dangerous. You know, Austin. I live in Austin. You know, all the hipsters had chickens about five years ago, and they all got rid of them because you know what chickens do. Oh, did somebody decide to put a, chi uh, a, a cow, a puppy mill next door to puppy me? Puppy mill. That's a different story. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Is that covered by the Ag Code? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, is it also referred to in the local and government? And the city of yes. Houston said no puppy mills inside of city limits, but this bill passes. They can just put one next door to my house, and I can't do anything about it. The answer is maybe, and that's the problem with the bill. We just don't know. Why don't we have a puppy mill bill? And we'll get all the stakeholders together. We'll vote for and against. Somebody's going to lose. It might be me. Well, they put a Martha the house of prostitution next, though. <laughs> City of Houston outlawed no house of prostitution within the city limits. And they say, you ain't got a code. <laughs> next thing I know. <laughs> They got traffic all night long. Oh, Lord. Come on back in here, Burroughs. Well, to the chairman's credit, the criminal code is not mentioned as being preempted, so I don't know that brothels would be legal under this. <laughs> but, yeah, let's, let's talk about the we fight human topics. trafficking. You know, we fight human trafficking. They might, this is, might do away with it. You say, hey, we don't want to bother these people. Thank you. Representative Raymond. Okay. <coughs> I just want to say, you, has, has anyone told you you remind them of Jeb Bush? No, thank you. <laughs> but, but like high energy Jeb Bush. Oh wow! Not low energy Jeb Bush. I should run. Not as tall Jeb Bush, <laughs> but higher energy. But hold on, let me put on it. Yeah, definitely. You know. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> You'll be the <laughs> Lord. Uh, You're the only guy that's taken us from chickens to Jeb Bush. Wanted, yeah, yeah, Representative Dean. You know, I'm trying to figure out, Mr. Raymond, Representative Raymond, corn dogs. Um, yeah. Bags and HEB. Uh, anyway, you know, I saw one of them artists that when we started talking about all this about chickens. Puppy mills, you know, you. No, I was here for that puppy mill deal. I wasn't. Yeah, but your city was in it. Oh, I was. Yeah, I was. I was. Man, we came. Yeah, it was. I came. Um, but I saw an artist talking about those chickens. You can have chickens, but you can't have a rooster. I don't know. It's a bunch of unhappy chickens, but That's anyway. because the bill only allows six chickens. If you have six chickens and a rooster, pretty soon you have okay. more than six chickens. Right? So, Representative Dean, do you have a question for the witness? <laughs> no. Let me tell you, you don't look like Jeb Bush. Just wanted to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. You look like Thank you, like Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Does he look like Jeb Bush? <laughs> Mark Roach. <laughs> hey, you remind you of lap days. And so, Mark, you know, there's three minute time limit. I'm telling you all this because he's from Corpus Christi. And state your name, 
title and position on the bill. My name is Mark Roach. I am on the board of directors of Associated Builders and Contractors of Texas. And my position on the bill is we are in favor of passage of House Bill 2127. May I begin, Mr. Chairman? Good afternoon, Chairman Hunter, Vice Chairwoman Hernandez, and members of the committee. My name is Mark Roach, and as a sitting board member of Associated Builders and Contractors of Texas, I'm here to speak on behalf in favor of uh, 20, House Bill 2127. Our 1,600 member companies are predominantly in the industrial and commercial construction industry throughout the entire state. Our members represent all trades and specialties that make up the Texas construction industry. In addition to ABC of Texas, uh, ABC has been a proud member of, for 10 years of the Alliance for Securing and Strengthening the Economy of Texas, ASSET for short which is a 30 plus member coalition that supports House Bill 2127 as well. And our, it is our firm belief that House Bill 2127 will finally address the hodgepodge of regulations that have been created and enacted by municipalities across Texas. We believe that House Bill 2127 will ensure that every business and its employees will be able to work more successfully when regulations are made consistent throughout our state. Our members work across Texas from big cities to small towns. An example of one of our members is that they work primarily in public education. It is common for, that, for them to have over 30 active job sites in 17 different jurisdictions on any given day. The practice of these uh, jurisdictions adopting their own set of rules for everything from employment procedures to the kinds of tools they may use on the job site is making job performance cost prohibitive. Ironically, this non-essential burden is born ultimately by the taxpayers of the school districts, the very taxpayers for whom the state of Texas is trying to provide relief. In addition, these continued, this continued practice by local jurisdictions significantly limits the companies which can take on cost of carry for projects because of having to unnecessarily hire additional consultants and specialists for each and every job to navigate every jurisdiction's differing regulations. Members of the committee, this reality neither promotes competition, nor does it promote a business-friendly environment. It stifles it. We support House Bill 2127 because we believe it not only will address concerns with existing regulations, but also future regulations that are currently being discussed by local governments, like the city of Dallas discussing banning two cycle engines for city departments, contractors, and other businesses. Our member, our members' craftsmen rely heavily on this type of equipment to do their jobs. We believe that House Bill 2127 will assert the state's authority on policy issues such as this. In closing, I'm done. Mark, thanks. Any questions? Yeah, Chris, uh, Representative. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Roach, so you know, I'm going to ask you kind of what I asked some of the other witnesses, and, and I actually did hear you mention at least one specific policy alluded to a city of Dallas uh, proposed policy that I understand is still at the staff level, right. hasn't, um, hasn't even made it to the council yet. Uh, but in terms of existing policies out there, are there policies that, that you, you and your members find to be problematic that are currently in effect? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Such sir. As? Um, when it, when it, when, when the, Policies developed by the municipalities get down into the weeds of, of how a contractor, and it affects the contracting industry, um, uh, operate their business and, and what they are allowed to do above and beyond what, what regulations are already out there by OSHA and the Department of Labor, Texas Workforce Commission, it becomes essentially non-essential. It, 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 it promotes absolutely nothing in our opinion. Do you have an example of one of those? Well, the mandatory water breaks. We're, we're already required by, the, by OSHA to, to um, provide for sufficient rest periods and, and water breaks. The policies that are, have been adopted by a municipality uh, take them to a, a more ridiculous level. And the problem is, is that with, this, with each city developing in its own, its own policies, our contractors are having to figure out how to navigate from one job to the next. You know, as I stated in my statement, we've got one contractor that's got jobs going on in 17 different places. Uh, yeah, I understand. I think that's not, not unusual. Yes. Uh, so 
So is your testimony that, that existing OSHA standards do require mandatory rest and water breaks in the construction industry? Yes, sir. Safety standards. Yes, sir. What, what, so describe that policy to me. What's the frequency of the break that's required? I'm not exactly sure about the how it defines, how OSHA defines uh, exactly. You know, the, the OSHA does not get down into the specifics of when they have to take their breaks. <laughs> So that's probably the problem that, that's trying to be solved, right? Uh, exactly. if, if it doesn't define <laughs> when or how often right. uh, a worker is entitled to a break, then that's probably the rationale for the policy to require a rest break, say, every four hours. Right. Would you agree that's probably the rationale for the policy, whether you agree with the policy or not? Um, Yes, sir, in a manner of speaking, yes. Yeah, okay. So so your organization opposes rest breaks no, on a four-hour basis? No, did not say that, sir. Did not say that. Okay, well, you said that was a problematic policy. <clears throat> was your, the, one of the reasons you support the bill. I don't, don't, I, I don't want you to confuse my statement with the fact that we are suggesting that that rest breaks and, and paid time off and all that kind of stuff, uh, leave it to us, go away. All right. That's all. I'm sorry. Say, say it again. I don't understand. You, you're suggesting that we are against rest breaks. Is, is that what you just said? I thought that's what you said. No, I did not say that. You're for rest breaks. Right. You might have taken it that way, sir. You're for mandatory rest breaks. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, so you're, so you are for the city. I think it's Austin and Dallas that have enacted mandatory rest breaks every four hours in the construction industry. You support those policies? A clear no, sir. Not okay, from so you don't support those policies? Not for municipalities, no. Okay, so you would support a statewide law instituting those policies? Sure. You would, okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's imparted it's consistently the across the state. You would support a state, uh, a state law that mandates rest breaks in the construction industry? Provided that the United States government, Department of Labor, and OSHA doesn't come in and tell the state of Texas you're overreaching. If it was compliant with state and federal, yeah, with, with existing federal I don't federal think it law. would be. Yeah. Okay, well, you're luck, because I have a bill to do just that. Okay. And so I, it's in the Business and Industry Committee, and I look forward to your organization coming to testify in okay. support of the bill, right. um, because I, uh, I'd have to check. I had it last time. I don't remember how you all testified on it off the top of my head. But you would agree that in Texas, in our extreme heat in the summer months, I mean, heat-related illnesses are a, a real concern for for workers uh, who are working outdoors in the construction. A definite, a definite threat, a definite, uh, definite possibility. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's more than a possibility. I mean, we we know that there. I mean, Department of Insurance has documented heat-related deaths on the job. Sure. Okay. And and that that. You know, numerous studies have shown that dehydration, heat exhaustion uh, are contributors to serious illness, injury, and potentially death, right? Across the board. Well, Anywhere. Well, yeah, sure, but, but happens people the, working... Happens in the construction industry. Yeah, people working, doing heavy labor jobs no. outdoors when it's 100, 105 degrees, high humidity. They're more at risk than, say, you and I sitting in this air-conditioned room, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's okay. outside, yes. Okay. Well, well, I'm glad to hear that you would support a statewide uh, law on mandatory rest breaks and look forward to working with you to pass that. Yeah, the, prob the problem is the inconsistency going from one minister to the other. I think it's... I think okay, Under understood. So we should, yeah. we'll, we'll pass a, yeah. a statewide law and that will solve this problem. Chairman Thompson. Can I just ask for one favor, please? Yes, ma'am. Can y'all not do construction at 5 p.m. during the day when we try to we try to get home from work? Chairman Thompson, if 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 you can tell the owners, the state of Texas, or maybe the city of Austin, not to put us on on unreasonable deadlines, we we can probably cut it off at five o'clock. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank Any you. Anything questions? you can do to support this the supply chain to okay. speed things Good up. Good to see you. Any other questions? Thank you, and say hi to everybody back home. I'll do it, Chairman Hunter. Take care. Lauren Johnson, come on back. Lauren was outside, so she's going to be able to testify. So, Lauren, tell us your name, your uh, title, and position on the bill. Yes, sir. My name is Lauren Johnson. I'm a policy advocacy strategist with the ACLU of Texas. 
and I am here to testify in opposition to the bill. Uh, before I do that, I just want to say that I never, ever thought a state affairs hearing would make me so hungry, but between the gumbo and the chicken and the Dairy Queen, I'm, and I haven't eaten all day, so I'm starving to death. Starving yeah. <laughs> um, so just, just really quickly, I won't keep you long. Um, I think that this bill has a slew of, of both intended and unintended consequences. Um, many of them are, it's just kind of too numerous to dive too deep into, but I want to highlight a few of the concerns. I think as broadly as this bill is written, it's probably going to create more problems than it solves. Um, and then we heard a lot today about the burdensome regulations that businesses have to deal with. And it's not that I'm unsympathetic to that, but when I think about the regulations that, uh, regular individuals have to deal with. And when I think about freedom and liberty, I think it should be prioritized to individual people and not prioritized towards businesses. Um, so the top three concerns that arise for us um, relate to the inability for cities and counties to solve problems that will arise for, from having to wait for the legislature to convene to deal with the issues that come up because of this bill. Um, changes to litigation. Um, we. We worry that this is going to create open the floodgates for a lot of litigation and um, overwhelm our court systems. And then finally, the most personal reason for me is connected to the fair chance hiring ordinance that we passed in Austin. Um, there are 150 cities, counties, and a total of 24 states, including uh, Georgia, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Virginia that have adopted ban the box policies. And I uh, like Representative Turner's idea of uh, dealing with these issues one by one so we can give them the airtime that they deserve to really have the robust conversations that need to be had and negotiate uh, compromises for the, for the best intentions for all of our uh, citizens. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is that um, our attorneys are also very concerned with the uh, committee sub usurping even more local control, especially related to non-discrimination orders. Um, and I remember uh, Chairman Bros earlier had mentioned something about a memo to the effect of that not happening. And um, I would love for any memos like that one to be made publicly available so that we can all understand exactly what is going on in this bill. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. I'm going to go eat now. Adrian Shelley. And Adrian, like the others, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, Adrian Shelley with Public Citizen here to speak against House Bill 2127. Um, just First, want to say that I agree with the concerns about the, the so-called super uh, preemption or, or field preemption approach. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask the legislature to speak uh, with specificity and particularity on, you know, individual matters that it feels are, are deserving of uh, state level regulation. Um, you know, it's been referred to as whack-a-mole, but there's nothing that compels lawmakers to go after those moles in the first place. So I don't think that that's unreasonable. Um, I made some notes about uh, specific areas of law that I'm concerned about. I I'm not going to, you know, re reiterate that list in my comments. I'll just say, uh, Chairman Thompson, to your point about concrete plants, you know, a lot of that is in health and safety code, which unfortunately is, is, isn't touched here. But uh, you know, agriculture code on water conservation and natural resources code on mining and quarries is going to be in that same neighborhood. So have concerns there. Um, finally, I'll say the uh, private right of action is pretty concerning, especially given, uh, you know, the vagueness of the legislation. Um, we heard uh, a really long list of areas of law that are not supposed to be touched. I if this goes into effect, it might be good if that list were put out somewhere publicly so that we could head off uh, those, uh, those suits for areas that are already settled. Um, pretty concerned uh, about that. Uh, the have not seen the substitute, you know, the change in uh, venue seems like a good step. I am concerned about uh, the, uh, you know, attorney's fees uh, and the uh, declaratory and injunctive relief. Um, so on the whole, uh, got to oppose. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Adam Haynes. And Adam, please just state your name, your title, and then your position on the bill. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Adam Haynes of the Conference of Urban Counties, and we're opposed to 2127. Uh, just real quickly, uh, one of, we're a little bit of a fish out of water, as you've all heard today. Uh, most of the testimony has been lined up against uh, cities because, as you all know, counties do exactly what you tell us to do. We don't have ordinance making authority unless you give us ordinance making authority. So in terms of uh, Chairman Burrow, the, some of the specifics in the bill, um, if you grant us those authorities, we'll carry those authorities out. What we're concerned about and what Chairman Burroughs um, has, has cor largely corrected in the uh, committee substitute, and we're thankful for that. And, and uh, we got the committee substitute from his staff, and he's been very open, and we appreciate that, is, was the venue. Uh, narrowing it down from statewide to the county next door uh, is an improvement. We'd like to, to see it go into the county where, where the, the alleged allegation or where the allegation is from. You know, it's the whole, um, you know, on the criminal side, it's the jury of your peers, but on the administrative side, you typically deal with the matter where the matter happens. And so we would like to see it in the county um, uh, where the, the allegation is. But also the, the other concern that we still have uh, that uh, relates to the, uh, the, the indemnity waiver. Uh, what we're worried about is as, as officials, my judges and county commissioners take action as a public, as a, as a public uh, uh, duty uh, when they're elected to, to their office. And now to hold them personally liable uh, for those actions uh, is, is a little concerning. But, but what, what really concerns us is uh, our ability now to go forward with insurance. Uh, we think, uh, you know, all of our, our public officials, just as the state does for y'all, we carry liability insurance and, and uh, indem indemnification insurance for our public officials. Uh, this is gonna, it's gonna cause a lot of consternation and we're concerned about the insurance aspects of that. So I um, appreciate that and I can answer any questions if there are. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Yeah. Molly Cook. And Molly, again, state your name, your title, and position on the bill. Good afternoon, Chairman and committee members. My name is Molly Cook, and I am opposed to the bill, here is myself, um, opposed to the underlying bill and the committee substitute. I am an ER nurse, that's what I do for my full-time job, and nurses have compact licensure, so that makes sense to me. You streamline it across jurisdictions so that you can more easily travel, et cetera. Um, the concept makes sense, but I do think that this is too sweeping um, and should be addressed on a more detail-by-detail -detail basis. Uh, my approach to policy is to save lives and improve the quality of lives. And in my experience, that is what most city ordinances are designed to do. Address a problem that exists to make people's lives easier or make them last longer. Um, and we rely on the cities um, to, to do what we see is lacking from the state. Um, additionally, cities are a seat of innovation. And they're also kind of like the nurse for the patient. They're the last line of defense. And they're the closest to them as well. So they see exactly what's going on. Um, additionally, using ordinances on the city level allows other municipalities that disagree with maybe a really large municipality to continue in their most authentic character and not have to enact the exact same laws. Um, I'm from Houston, Harris County, and I imagine that that would be a place that is referred to as hostile by the chairman um, when he presented the bill by the author. Um, and yet we have the largest GDP in the state by a mile. It still is a good place to do business. So um, I'm also hearing some inconsistencies in the messaging that I just want to reflect. You know, are we the best place to do business or are businesses severely limited by this patchwork? Um, are the businesses, is this about small businesses or is it about large businesses that enact things across the state? Um, and I haven't heard many people be able to speak to the actual enforcement mechanism of this. 
Um, and a lot of people have cited difficulties that were outside of local and state controls. I mean, the, the COVID pandemic was a global phenomenon and it was terrible. And I really do empathize with the people who had um, really, really difficult experiences or closed businesses, but that was a global respiratory virus. Um, it was kind of an outstanding issue. So this is a huge, um, and if this is such a huge multi-session issue, and yet according to the author, 95% of ordinances would remain the same, I just, I just don't understand. Um, it sounds like something that we need to take piece by piece. Uh, the message is inconsistent. Um, so yeah, I sympathize with what everyone is talking about. It sounds like there's a real problem that needs to be addressed. I just don't think this bill, um, either the underlying or the committee substitute is the way to do it. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you, any questions, members? Thank you very much, Molly. Now our last registered is Kelsey Strafer. Would you come up, Kelsey? And again, Kelsey, uh, state your name, title, and position. Yes, sir. My name is Kelsey Erickson Stroyfert. I'm here on behalf of the Texas Restaurant Association in support of House Bill 2127. I just wanna make three clarifying points. I know it's been a long day for everyone. Uh, first, for us, this ordinance really is not about stopping local governments from regulating local concerns. Restaurants are subject to maybe one of the most complicated patchwork um, set of regulations of any industry. We are regulated at a hyper local level by cities and counties that will not change under this bill. We have to pull health permits. We're inspected by the local health departments. All of those health and safety matters. Um, we will continue to work closely with local governments under this bill that does not change. Um, secondly, this bill isn't about stopping employment mandates. Um, we actually were very proud during the pandemic to support a mandated paid sick leave uh, mandate from the federal government because it worked for our business. There was uh, some tax credits to offset it. Um, so just simply put, we're not against all employment mandates, but we do think it's really important when we're talking about issues that impact our entire economy, that cross thousands of local government boundaries, that we have consistency and predictability on those. And lastly, um, just wanna clarify that the lack of consistency does create real costs for our members. I appreciate that the paid sick leave ordinances um, were struck down by the court. That was after a lot of time and money was spent. And there are lots of different proposals and ways that those could be resurrected. Um, so our small businesses are concerned about that. Um, and that's why we're, why we're here today. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Any questions, members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, that's all the registered. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on, for, or against the bill? Did you register? I registered uh, and was called about three hours ago. What's your name? David Stout, County Commissioner from El Paso, Texas. Okay. Yes, you were. I was called about three hours ago. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Yes. Okay, so you are outside the room, and like we've done with the others, you'll be, uh, he'll be the last witness. He was outside the room. So Mr. Stout is a county commissioner from El Paso, so he is present. So state your name, your title, and your position. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Hunter and honorable members. My name is David Stout. I am a county commissioner in El Paso, Texas, and I am here representing my county, my, my uh, constituents, and myself to testify against HB 2127. Local elected leaders like me and my colleagues have to be innovative problem solvers. We're elected to protect our people from natural disasters and other crises, to support our local workforce, provide safe housing, ensure clean drinking water, and many things more. The solutions to all of these issues will and have to look different from city to city and county to county. HB 2127 will tie our hands and make it impossible to respond to certain needs of our people. This bill is an aggressive, special interest driven attempt to strip local elected's ability to respond to a vast array of community needs. The implications of this bill are far reaching and would, not and would essentially destroy the idea of home rule, local control and democracy at a local level and replace it with the will of state officials. In my opinion, it's the very definition of state interference. Furthermore, uh, this bill permits private litigants to legislate through litigation, which is not something that we want. 
According to my county attorney, the most troubling provisions of the bill, of course, is the removal of the government uh, immunity, official uh, immunity and qualified immunity defenses. We use governmental immunity as a defense on most of the litigation that we handle at our county. Uh, when the Civil Practices and Remedies Code waives immunity, it usually requires a condition precedent before immunity is waived. There appears to be no condition precedent in this legislation. Why does this matter? This will be expensive for local governments to defend and handle, and in instances where ex uh, express county authority to regulate is unclear, and proposed statute may chill the county's will to enact a rule or order or fear of liability to the county or county official. It would require El Paso County to potentially litigate and defend these claims in far off stretches of the state. Litigation could be filed in Beaumont. Conversely, we could possibly see increased litigation in El Paso. Section eight labor code would open a slew of plaintiffs litigation for violations of any labor code. It erodes the county's implied authority. It has long been the case that counties have implied authority to do the things that we are especially authorized to do. We are permitted to hire and fire workers, for example. If there is no explicit authority to do something, how do we hire and fire or provide benefits to our employees? The quote unquote venue in any county language is broad and can lead to, to uh, forum shopping in areas of the state that may be favorable to certain outcomes. It seems to me that this bill is aimed at curbing more progressive counties and cities, but mind you, it could also negatively affect more conservative conservative entities as well. In conclusion, I want you to understand that my community is already tax poor. We can only raise about $6 million per penny of ad valorem tax. 80% of our budget goes to fund state mandated programs. And we've been severely hamstrung when it comes to raising revenue by recent legislation. This bill, in addition to all the other negative impacts that would have on my community, would place severe financial burden upon El Paso County and its taxpayers, businesses included. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, member? Representative Spiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, briefly, um, do you know of any existing ordinances, uh, orders, or rules of El Paso County that are currently in effect that would be adversely affected by HB 2127? Well, I, I think uh, it's it's uh, very vague and, and uh, very wide, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's difficult to understand at this point. I know that um, when it comes to uh, counties, HB 2127 will direc directly affect uh, drought conditions, the agricultural code, overgrown lots, insects and bees, raising animals, predatory lending businesses, pawn shops, injuries at special events, employment discrimination, door-to-door -door sales, unsafe outer, outdoor festivals and sporting events, uncontrolled burns, unsafe waste storage, heavy trucks, oil, gas, and propane pipelines, etc. Okay. So do you know of any existing rules, ordinances, orders, of El Paso County that you've already adopted that would be adversely affected by this? I do not at this time. Okay. Any any uh, specific examples, uh, but we can definitely look into that okay. and, and provide you. you with that information. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Thank you very much, sir. Thank Appreciate you. it. Now, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on, for, or against the bill? Saying none. Mr. Chairman, can yeah. I say one thing, ask one thing? Of who? Uh, well, of, of, of you. Uh, well, could we bring the author up and sure. then sure. Let well, me do uh, that? Uh, can, I, can I bring this up? I think it would be helpful to the committee if we could get the, the opponents of the bill to kind of get together and tell us to Mr. Spiller's question, is, is what existing ordinances or right now in, in all these communities would be a do they contend would be uh preempted or uh, by by this and then let uh the proponents of the bill respond and we could kind of see what we're actually talking about in concrete terms do you think do you think yeah let me bring that up after we close okay, i'm sorry I'm let sorry. me just do that and but you've got a good idea okay anybody else who wishes to speak on for or against the bill hearing not none the chair recognizes Chairman Burroughs to close on his bill. And as you're closing, to address Chairman Smithy, because that affects your bill. I um, appreciate that opportunity. I'm going to ask that you coordinate that. Well, you know, it's real funny. When this all started, the only thing they were concerned about was pawn shops. And then I pointed out to them where they would still have the power to regulate pawn shops. So I held a meeting, as we do, and invited 
the proponents and opponents to come in and had this great idea, and they were there and said, well, what if we made sure you still get to have general law uh, powers to take care of all these things? Everyone seemed happy with it. I said, you can still provide me some more language. Well, the language I got would have totally gutted the bill, so they knew it wouldn't work. They thought it was uh, not smart enough to realize it, or you know, maybe that's what they really expected. But the general law city was what I thought we had come to as a standard to make sure we could protect all of the drought conditions and all the things we heard today. But yet, despite that change being made, here we are with people trying to say just the opposite of what I'd heard during these meetings and things like that. I guess it's just a delay tactic and a tactic to deceive and confuse us. Uh, Chairman Turner. You talked about fireworks, uh, local government code section 342. You talked about towing, occupations code 2308. Door-to-door uh, -door sales, local government code 215.031. The alarm systems under the insurance code 6002003. My guess is, guess what? Some of the people in this room who want to deceive and delay this will find other things. They want me to go run down and find the provisions of the code to delay this. I met with the group of city attorneys or somebody who purported to represent them. We have been through this process, but, yes, process, but yet here we are today trying to slow things down, trying to find other things to throw up against the wall to pretend drought conditions will somehow be preempted by this bill. They won't. I can write a legal brief on each and every one of these if need be. I hate to go through the process having had the meetings and talked to them, but I get the game that's going to play out as this bill continues to proceed. Um, El Paso. I'm glad somebody came here. They have something on the ballot that I, I started talking to Chamber of Commerces, and all of a sudden tons of people from El Paso are showing up. They have an ordinance that's about to go on the books. Uh, I think y'all read about it. It's been covered not only statewide, you know, but nationwide. I think it was even in The Guardian. Uh, by 2035, they're going to require 80% of all homes to be in businesses use clean energy. By 2045, 100% clean. That means the electric company would have to be sold with no buyer. The Chamber of Commerce there had told me something like 60, 70% of businesses are all going to be cloned out, closed down. Regardless of how you feel about clean energy, the idea that we're going to have a city trying to close 60% of its businesses through an ordinance or allow that to get on a petition, this is getting insane. Whack-a-mole? It is whack-a-mole. And some of these moles are big and dangerous. Look, it is a big, it is a departure from how we have done this in the past. I get that. But I will also tell you, it is needed and necessary. Um, I've got a list of examples. I've got three pages. I'm happy to provide those. We can go through them each and every time. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions y'all may have about the bill. But if we want to go back through the drought and the cutting the lawn and all the other stuff, I've been through this. I thought they were good with it. But come here today, we're going to find all these different things to throw against the wall and try to deceive, in my opinion. Mr. Chairman, can I ask? Hold on a second, because Representative Smith. Well, and, and to comment on that, I think you're, you've made a good point because most of the testimony we've heard today has been uh, from the opponents has been kind of theoretical of this could stop this in the future. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, like I said, Representative Spiller asked a very good question of what actual ordinances does this, do you contend this would uh, invalidate? And we haven't heard a lot of talk about what actual ordinances those, those were. And so that was the purpose yeah. of my question, just not what it could do, but what it actually does do. Representative Smithy, I certainly understand that. I will just tell you, it's hard sometimes to sit and watch a bill that you care a lot about, that you see the people that are behind it that are getting their businesses potentially that are in real fear of some of these things that are coming. And to hear some of the things that you've been in meetings that you thought you had fixed just to be undone. Um, apartments, I mean, we, we, I don't know if we heard from them. I, I skipped about 20 minutes. 90-day evictions. I mean, we have done forcible detainers you know, the same way for 50, 60, 70 years in the state, but to have 90 days that you have to wait, those, I mean, th those aren't necessarily big apartment owners. Sometimes those are just rentals that somebody has. That that's their life savings and their retirement. And 90 days of not being able to get rent, that's a real deal. We are now dealing with these over and over and over again. And yes, it's a departure. I understand it's something different, but it is very important to me. Yeah. Chairman Thompson. If a case is taken to court, Mm -hmm. to challenge this bill and an ordinance of the city. Is the court supposed to harmonize this or what is the court supposed to do? Absolutely. And so the concept of field preemption is something that's been around for a very, very long time. They will have to take a look at it. Preemption and preemption litigation currently exists under statute. So I do 
create a different standalone cause of action only to codify the need for a waiver of sovereign immunity and to make sure we have a little bit of extra forum conditions because of, I know payday sick, uh, this paid sick leave is not enforced, but the experiences I heard about people trying to go through the challenges of actually enforcing it and find a venue that would take it seriously. Who does the plaintiff sue? The plaintiff would actually sue the city or the person in their official capacity, not in their individual capacity. No individual elected representative would be liable for attorney's fees in this. And unlike the Florida bill, which I did study when they tried to do this, I would not provide for damages you know, for anybody to be awarded. I do think that is a bridge too far, and I certainly understand why we don't want people to have damages you know, in there. This is really just a declaratory judgment action, an injunction, no different in a lot of ways than the deck and injunctive relief action currently available to litigants out there. And my, and my last question is this. How long you say you had been working on this? Uh, I've been I've been thinking I've been thinking about this problem for a s significant period of time. It took some time to get this concept actually the way to approach this because I, I've seen other versions that were bigger and broader than this. I thought this was actually the one that harmonized the best with our state constitution and made the most sense. I filed the bill whenever 2127 was filed before 2126 and before 2128, but it took a while to actually produce the version to get it out there. I know that immunity was brought up today. Mm -hmm. And what happens, in a, if your bill passes, what happens to immunity? The only thing that happens is it allows the plaintiff not to get kicked out of court for actually filing a declaratory judgment action against municipalities and counties who enjoy sovereign immunity. That is the only thing that we're looking at. Because right now, if I bring a lawsuit, you know, against any sort of government agency, I will get tossed out under defense of sovereign immunity. You know, if we're going to allow somebody to have standing to bring a suit for declaratory judgment only, there has to be some waiver of sovereign immunity to allow the lawsuit to go forward. The courts have already said by implication it is waived. I thought it would be a good idea to actually codify it in case courts start to twist it up. So we're essentially codifying what already the existing precedent for waiver of sovereign immunity actually is under case law. And, and my last question is the, the issue of collective bargaining did come up during the course of some of the testimony today. And would this particular bill, in your opinion, uh, impact that kind, those kind of bargaining? Absolutely not. The freedom of contract still exists. We do not take contract and contracting requirements out for municipalities to do how they want in those types of issues. I don't think that it has to be spelled out in the bill that it doesn't, but it does not touch contracts and the ability to contract and have terms and contracts that they want to have, including collective bargaining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Turner. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Burroughs. Um, and I appreciate the, the feedback on the specific examples we went over earlier. Um, and I, I don't know if, I think you were in the room when the assistant city attorney from the city of Dallas testified and I went over a couple of examples with her and I her testimony loosely summarized was because something like alarms, you know, lives in a couple different parts of the statute, there's some, could be some ambiguity, could invite litigation and it would provide some uncertainty to cities on how they um, implement policy going forward. Whether that, whether you agree with that or not, that was, that was her concern. I think it was sincere. Maybe. So my question, my question is, would you be amenable to so some of those examples we went through, whether it's it's alarms or fireworks or et cetera, would you be amenable to just stating clearly in the bill this this section does not affect a city ordinance governing fireworks? Well, I think that clearly by referencing the general laws in the committee substitute with the savings clause, that does it. If there is a more specific way that needs to make sure that that's in there, I am happy to do that. I don't know that we need to articulate out each and every single one when the provisions already granted under the local government code for general law cities spell this out, you know, so well. So I will tell you, I, maybe everyone is sincere about their doubts of this. I have had these meetings. I do think there is some desire to confuse the situations. There is a savings clause in the committee substitute designed to address all of those concerns. It was talked about, it was discussed in an open meeting with both sides of it. It is in there to try to address those. I believe it adequately does. Okay, but you, okay, and, and that's that's fair. I mean, it, if, if there was legitimate concern going forward that maybe it, there's still some ambiguity, you'd be open to that. Legitimate's the key word. Yeah, I understand. I understand. That's Legitimate's fair. the key word. So, so it seems like there's, 
and you, I think addressed pretty clearly um, that you've had conversations with cities and, and groups representing cities. But it seems to me like there's three sort of central buckets of concern about the bill based on what we've heard this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Cities and local government in general, certainly. Also, groups that are uh, involved in uh, payday lending mm -hmm. practices. Uh, and thirdly, uh, groups that are advocating for workers, uh, okay. labor unions and, and other organizations. Um, have you had or would you be willing to have discussions with the latter two groups in, with respect to payday lending and some of the work? Sure. Right. Always. My door is open to anybody to talk to. I invite you to be part of this conversation as well. You, you and I have always had a good working relationship Absolutely. and happy to continue that. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, Chairman I, Thompson. I, I just asked, I want to ask you something else. Uh, and thank you for being so kind to answer the question. Does Chapter 15 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedy Code provide for general uh, venue rules under your bill? So I, what I did is I went back through in the committee substitute and I took the... Uh, <coughs> No, I ended up allowing for contiguous counties in the aggrieved place to actually have an additional venue. Um, I, you know, I assume most of these plaintiffs in here would actually like to, as the people say, shop their forum just a bit. And it does provide, uh, this bill does provide uh, under Chapter 15 uh, of the Texas Civil, Practice, Civil and Practice Remedy Code, a mandatory venue for cases involving suits against governmental entities, does it? That is correct. Okay, and on the chapter 65 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedy Code, uh, does it provide mandatory venue rules for suits seeking injunctive release? I, to be candid with you, I have not looked at the interplay. I think I, I, think I have created my own venue provisions for this particular action that would be different than the general venue provisions under the Civil Practice Remedies Code because we have contiguous counties available to the aggrieved party. So I don't think the mandatory, I think this would be different than any of the mandatory or permissive venue statutes in there in the Civil Practice and Remedies Code. And on Chapter 22 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedy Code, limits the state's court subpoena power to 150 miles from a county mm -hmm. in which the suit is filed. Is that correct? I don't think my bill does addresses or touches that. I mean, that's the standard rule in the civil practice and remedies. Well, could a witness uh, ignore the subpoena issued by a county court over 150 miles away under, under your bill? That would still be part of the civil practice and remedies code, the best I can tell. Okay. And does the county have jurisdiction to order an injunctive relief over a city or a person not within their county? Say that again. Does a county court have jurisdiction over injunctive relief over a city or a person not within located within this county. Does a county have jurisdiction? Are you talking about the court county system? County court. County court. County court at law. Uh huh. So like a county court at law Does versus a, a district court. court. Uh huh. Have jurisdiction to order injunctive relief over a city or a person not located within their county. I'll have to take a look at that. I mean, okay. I. Okay. I'm just checking these questions out. I, I was going to ask you earlier. I think, I think that's just about all of them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Representative Jim. Mr. Chairman, can you, can you walk me through how the savings clause works? Savings clause. Section 4, page 1. This act may not be construed to prohibit a municipality or county from building or maintaining roads or imposing a tax or a home rule municipality from providing the same services as general law municipality is authorized to provide. So essentially all of those codes that I talked about, drought, water, you know, police, fire, uh, alarm systems, door-to-door, -door, cities have the authority granted under there so this would make sure that they actually have that. This would be the controlling language as it applies to those individual uh, codes I articulated. So, and again, I'm just trying to understand it. A general law city would, it provides, I guess, a baseline of regulation, for, for lack of a better term, has, has a baseline of authority mm -hmm. in order to protect the health and welfare of their Correct. Uh, constituency, their residents. And the vast majority of the concerns I heard that were being raised, which is why I was 
frustrated, if you mm -hmm, can't tell, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. general law cities are able and do effectively acquit themselves of providing that. And so they fall under, sorry, I, I didn't yeah. mean to slow your roll, but they fall under this general law basket. Correct. Okay. And so this clause, and I'll look at it more closely, but I, I just wanted to talk through it with you because this is how I learn. So this clause says, if, if you fall into the general law basket, then you're held harmless. You're saved. That's it. Savings clause. I mean, I'm thinking contracts, but I mean, it's a savings provision. Uh -huh. you know, no matter what, you at least get to do all the different things that, you know, people came up here today and tried to tell you that we're taking away from them. Not true. You can still do it. You can still do it. And then, and then if, and then the, the, a home rule city is distinguished from a general law city because you have extra stuff that you can do. It is, and, and what you are saying in your bill, it is only in this band of extra stuff that you may be preempted. So anything over and above that's going to deal with something we regulate, then, you know, we basically are going to do this. So we're still going to, guess what? We're still going to get to play whack-a-mole. But instead of us coming and playing whack-a-mole where we say, no, you did something that we don't think is right, we need to preempt it, it's going to be, hey, guys, you need to actually come here and give us a little more authority over here. So it does shift, I think, the burden of proof from my uh, thoughts from being a lawyer. Okay. And but not everything. I mean, I don't, it doesn't take away all home rule city ability to go off and do stuff. It's only when we actually have decided to make our mark and regulate the field. And, and that, that applies both retrospectively, if we make our mark retrospectively, so we can wipe stuff off the books in that band of things that home rule cities can do. Yes. And that, and that could change over time. Yes. Right. And likely will. Right. Um, uh, let me shift to uh, just another question really quickly. Because cities compete against each other and counties compete against sure. each other, I, I just want you to think about this, and I'll do some thinking about it as well, and we'll, we'll, we can talk further if we can think of examples. But, but can you think of examples, or will you at least spend some time trying to think of examples of how this bill could be used offensively as between counties or cities that compete? Yes, I, and, and, and I don't have an example right now. Mm -hmm. I would just say that's something we may want to think about because in setting venue outside, you could have a competitive city that wants to hometown another county that it is competing with. And I, again, I don't have a fact pattern, but let's just think about that and, and see if there are, are not some unintended consequences. Happy to have that conversation. I will tell you the only thing that was asked was related to the paid sick leave being overturned in the feeling that perhaps the district courts here were slow for political reasons and not for what actually it said. And so the businesses had cried for at least some option to have their, you know, aggrieved uh, status, you know, go somewhere where maybe their same political pressures did not lie. That is, that is the only thing I'm trying to be responsive for is what we have. But I will certainly work with you and think of examples where perhaps it could be weaponized unintentionally. Thank you. I want to visit with him at the, the Okay, meeting. I just saw the light on. Any, any other questions? And then for the, um, in respect to the author of the bill, um, the groups that some of the members asked for some specifics, I charge you all out there that were here today to provide the specifics where things were being abrogated. And I'd like that information provided to the clerk, which will be shared with the author of the bill. I also, if you have problems, you should be talking to the author of the bill. And I just suggest that to everybody. And we respect your view. Don't use this as a delay. Get the information in if it's real and serious. So I'll be making that request. All right, is there anyone else? Uh, thank you, Chairman Burroughs. And the chair moves to withdraw the committee substitute to HB 2127. Leave the bill pending at this time. Is there any objection? Hearing none, HB 2127 is left pending. I want to thank uh, all our witnesses for their participation in today's hearing. Is there any business left to be discussed? Hearing none, that concludes our business for today. There's no objection. The Committee on State Affairs will stand adjourned, subject to call of the chair. No objection. We now are adjourned.